Hello, everyone, Hello. and welcome to Picture This, um, our longest episode uh, that we do every single year. Um, we don't even know how long this is going to be because we're recording it now, uh, so we're not going to know exactly how long it's going to go. But we have a feeling it's going to go pretty long because not only do we have 10 movies to talk about, we have an Oscars to talk about, we have actors and actresses to talk about, we have history to talk about, and we have 10 films that I know we both have been dying to like talk about, but because throughout the year we're like, oh, that's probably going to get nominated. We really haven't talked in depth about these movies, which is so crazy considering everyone has talked about these movies to death because they have been so recent and so hot. Some as far as like the last year's Sundance. So um, it's going to be really interesting to talk about. So strap in. It's a long one. Plan out your bathroom breaks. Uh, this is going to pass killers of the flower moonlight. I'm so excited. Uh, Chad, how are you doing? Welcome to the year 2023 pretty recent yeah. But. yeah i'm i'm doing great uh first off i do want to uh maybe we can if we remember uh synchronize our poses every every time now uh, when, <laughs> I'll, when well, we I'll just watch you and then i'll sync up with that's the easiest way to do it because chad was exactly. getting in his little position before the theme song ended i was like i'm gonna i'm gonna copy but yeah. I won't. I won't steal your thunder without your approval of the future. I'm sorry for <laughs> asking consent. I loved it. I loved it. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah. So uh, I like improv. So there you go. It's great. Um, this year, or not last year of 2023, right. I think ended up being a phenomenal year for movies. Um, I remember 2022 was so good, but it was kind of like good like throughout and then i remember 2023 got off to like a rocky start and a lot of people were like it's not as good as 2022 and then i think it started to hit when you got to barbenheimer mm -hmm. so i have that stuff behind <laughs> me um yeah. and it's very interesting because one i think this may be i might be crazy but i think this might be the greatest slate of at least nine, but 10 overall okay. um, that we've gotten when we've gotten a slate of like a full 10. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It might just be, I'm really I, high on these. I'm going to, I'm going to us usurp you, my friend. I don't know if that's still a word. Um, yeah. I think all 10 of these, this is the most consistent best picture lineup of 10 that I've ever seen because Every year, going back to, I think, 2007 is the last year when I like looked at all the nominees, and that was only five movies, but the last time where I looked at a slate and said, I like all five of these. Every slate since 2007, there's been at least one that I'm either eh or not a fan of. This is the first slate in since 2007 where I have fully enjoyed every single movie, so much so to where I'm not even giving, because like the way I do like Letterbox, it's like a positive rating is uh, six out of 10 or more, which is three stars or more. I didn't even give any of these three stars. The lowest I gave was three and a half. And I still consider the movie that I think is the worst of these 10 to be like a really good movie that I would watch again happily. So I think mm. this is one of those rare occasions. It seems like there's one maybe that you aren't as high on. But like for me, like this is the first time I've ever been like, if any of these win, I'll be happy. And if all of the nine other ones lose, I'll be sad for them. You know, like it's one of those things where even though, spoiler alert, the movie I've been championing all year did end up winning, it's still... Like, I, I still love all these movies, and I would have been happy with any of them winning. So that's really crazy, and I, that never happens for me. Even the years that yeah. people kind of have said are consensus great years, like 2019. There's a movie in 2019 that I think is an absolute piece of garbage that a lot of people like, but, like, that's the last slate that I think a lot of people are like, oh, my God, 2019. I don't even feel that way about 2019. This year, I feel like that for every single film across the board. Like last year, All Quiet on the Western Front was like the one where I was like, eh. And then there were still a few other ones like Triangle of Sadness that I might not like want to watch again all the time. Here, I think all the 10 of these are going to be movies I've watched, save for maybe one because of the subject matter, but movies I'm going to watch frequently. Okay. You know, and even that movie I think is one of the greatest movies yeah. of that genre ever so it's one of those things where i think this is the best slate we've gotten especially since the expansion to 10 but since 2007 where i don't think there's a bad film here yeah like and i know for you like there's one movie that's like that's the movie but like if you like take that away and put that over to the side like the rest of the slate like you're saying i think um you could look at each of those movies and go whoa that's the movie kind of a deal so that's kind of how i look at it too like i can see a little bit of greatness in pretty much each of these um to varying degrees of course you yeah. know you have to you have to rank them yeah um but this uh this uh slate i did something that i haven't done with any slate uh in the show before mm -hmm. 
And I really, really engaged with these movies. There's one movie that I haven't, well, I guess I should say technically two movies that I haven't seen twice at least. Um, and some I've seen more than that. Um, yeah. And not only that, but I made it an effort to go through on Audible and try mm. to read a lot of the novels that the films were adapted by. I didn't tell cool. Dylan that because I, I didn't no, that's cool. to tell you that now in yeah, the show. Yeah. But that would be really fun. And not only that, but I, I took a, a page out of your book. And I started to read a lot of the screenplays. I see them behind you, yeah. Yeah, so I have, I couldn't find any of the other ones in print, mm -hmm. um, but I did find Barbenheimer in print. Um, but I would go on, and most of these are just available yeah. online. The only one that I didn't mm -hmm. read any of it, screenplay-wise, was Anatomy of a Fall, because part of it was in French. Right. So, and I was like, is there a translated version? And I couldn't find one. That's fair, that's, that's fair, that's yeah. Fair. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a great slate and I'm really excited for it. And it's one of those things where I think there are other slates that I think have more like heavy hitters for me where it's like, if I'm looking at the greatest slates of all time, some of these movies I wouldn't say are like masterpieces, but there's no bad one, which is just so rare, I think, because every year we're like, well, that's the obvious number 10 or the obvious number five. And I don't think there is one for this this year. Like, I genuinely think your number 10 could be my number five, could be my number two. Your number awesome. one could be my number eight. You know, we, we don't know. Um, you know, and, and we each know each other's favorite movie of the year, but I don't even know if that's changed considering we both rewatched a lot of these. Like there are movies that I nominated for pickle awards that I have put other movies that I didn't nominate for pickle awards above on my ranking now having rewatched. Wow. So there's a lot of films that have gotten better or worse, but all of them are still good. So I'm very excited. Um, I, I can see your brains thinking away. So what, what do you think of Chad? <laughs> well, I just also just kind of wanted to say to kind of, sometimes we do this, sometimes we don't, but like teasing kind of like where the ranking kind of stands like i'm not going to name movies but like my i believe it's my top four or my top five are set yeah and those are like my like top five and then the rest it goes from six to eight those ones all i'm like you know i could like tinker yeah. around a little bit mm -hmm. and then my 10 is my 10 right. i think it's a little different for you i know your it number is. one is like mm. yeah for me it's the number, opposite it's, i would say yeah. I would say my number one is still mm, is right. my number one, mm -hmm. but you know, the, my top five, I'm just like those movies. Yeah. For me, it's, it's my number one is like the one I, when I wrote this list down, I wrote my number one. And then yeah. like, I knew which, which next four were competing for two through five. Like if I had to nominate five of these 10, half of them as like a traditional five picture slate, these would be my five, but I didn't know how to rank those. Like I was like, which is number two, which is three, which is four, which is five. And then the bottom five are not like the bottom five, but were the ones that I'm like, these are the ones I didn't give a nine out of 10 to. Um, they're all eight out of tens or below which is just eight out of 10 or seven out of 10. And, and then from there, I just kind of went with my heart, which one I would really rewatch over the others pretty much is how I came about a ranking. But even then, like the ones I wouldn't rewatch as much, maybe you're still like ones that linger in my mind. So I really don't know where you're going to go, where I'm going to go. But I think regardless of who wins and what wins and where we place things, like my number 10 is a movie I love and I'm sure Chad likes it too. So I, I think that's one of those things that I, I think before people go on Facebook and just see our rankings, you know, come watch this video and hear us talk about them because the movie i'm gonna put at number 10 is a movie that i'm gonna have a lot of good things to say about so it's like i really hope people don't just see the rankings and go oh dylan hated this i'm like no it's it's i i liked it it's just i like the other nine more yeah. now if there were some movies in the slate um that almost made the cut that didn't make it that you know like it could be a different scenario but i think they really got a great slate out of this um but we're almost 10 minutes in let's let's get into the year itself let's start with the history it's so fresh so we don't need to go too in depth but it's important for years from now if people are listening to like just get a recap of what is going on in our world considering these are the movies of last year so like yes we're still kind of dealing with a lot of it now but um just kind of putting the context of what's going on today that could inform our viewing because a lot of these movies have very political messages for sure so yeah. Uh, Chad, tell us about the history of 2023. Let's do it. Yeah, and um, going through this, I actually uh, prepared my notes uh, a little bit in advance. So I don't even remember what I wrote. So let's go. Here we go. <laughs> um, the history. 2023 saw a decline in severity of the COVID-19 pandemic. That's true. The Russian invasion of Ukraine continued. Mm. An escalation of the Is Israel-Palestine co conflict occurred. Sometimes I put all the terrible stuff at the beginning right. so I can end better. Um, 
2023 saw the cont continued rise of gener generative AI models. The funeral of Pope Benedict the 16th is held. I hope I got that right. Uh, and then some more bad news. Um, World Athletics bans trans women who have gone through male puberty from competing in female events. So a little bit of regression there, apparently. Mm -hmm. um, nuclear power in Germany ends after 50 years. Scientists report the creation of the first synthetic human embryo from stem cells. Uh, the SAG AFTRA strike began in July and ended, I believe, in December. I think you were. Did you take part in that a little bit? Uh, yeah. I mean, I'm not quite a member of SAG, but I have a right. lot of friends who are. And I, I was in New York when all of it was happening. So I was there with the picket lines with the signs and everything. It was, it was a really cool moment to be like in the industry or at least adjacent to it, even as like film fans, like it was a really cool movement to see uh, happen and same with the writer's strike, which I believe maybe started last or 2022 or did it also start 2023? I'm not sure, but uh, both those strikes kind of happening at the same time. I think the writer's yeah. strike was a little earlier, but this was like the, the entertainment story of the year was the strike. So it's important to note, even though those will kind of impact the films for next year, more so than these slates, because the, these films are coming out regardless. Um, but it's important to note just in terms of the climate. And that's also why I think we get such interesting winners and nominees for writing, especially um, and acting because they really want to celebrate the craft the best way they can. So. Yeah, and and I might be totally wrong on this, but did you or did you not fist bump or something, Brian Cranston? I did see Brian Cranston. He gave a speech at the rally I was at for the SAG uh, strike, which is pretty damn cool. He does. He wouldn't remember, um, and if he does, that's a pretty <laughs> photographic memory because it was very brief in passing. It wasn't like I went up and talked to him and like got. Uh, no, it was more like he walked through the crowd. I gave him a little one, but but I got to watch him speak. He was he was there. He was cool. Um, you know, it's it's New York, so like there's a lot of like surprising people showing. Ali Rachel yeah. Zegler was there, and um, you know, a lot of the actors from The Sopranos, like all these people who are like local New Jersey, New York talents a lot of the actors in the broadway world too were there so just a really cool time really cool time to be just an actor and, and take pride in what we do which is really cool yeah for sure i'm glad it it, it went well uh <laughs> with the strike and it actually you know made some change um and i will say but and i'll continue but when i was at new york one time i saw martin short i think he was probably filming oh. uh only murders yeah that so. makes sense oh that's so cool yeah um barbenheimer happened of course that was huge <laughs> yeah. Um, lots of other good movies came out too, though. Um, global warming, the world's cons uh, the world's oceans hit a new record high temperature of 69.73 degrees Fahrenheit. That's more, I guess, bad news. Yeah. Um, United Auto Workers began a strike too against the largest automakers. A lot of strikes happening. Uh, archaeologists in Zambia find, or sorry, Zambia find the world's oldest wooden structure from 476,000 years ago. Holy crap. Microsoft buys the video game company Activision Blizzard. That's all I got. <laughs> cool. I mean, hey, yeah. I mean, and a lot of this history is still unfolding. Obviously, the wars in like Ukraine and, and then the uh, Palestine Israel thing like that. Sure. Those are stuff that we'll see probably in the next year or two um, or hopefully not more, but maybe more. Um, but uh, those are going to also impact. I bet a lot of the films that we see in the next few years and the strikes as well. We'll have to talk about those when we talk about the films coming out in the next few years. Um, and I just think it's it's a very interesting time of history. Um, but yeah, Barbenheimer was a big thing for like the box office and also for you know the Oscars. Um, um, which we can transition now uh, very quickly, um, though, before we get to the Oscars, let's talk really quickly about some births, some deaths, some albums, because I'm sure you have those. And then we can talk yeah. about the Oscars themselves. Absolutely. So for births this time, I, I sometimes I would try to find like the prince of something yeah. from a foreign country where they have princes and, and a little baby was born. Um, but I just did the babies of and then I named uh, women who gave or not just women, but like famous people who gave birth or had, I guess, a spouse that gave birth or a yeah. girlfriend or whoever. Um, so I said the babies of Paris Hilton, Rihanna and Aesop Rocky, mm -hmm. uh, Terry Mulligan, Lindsay Lohan, Constance Wu, Robert De Niro, apparently. Yep. <laughs> Getting up there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he is, but you know what they he say. He doesn't have to have the baby, I guess. <laughs> um, Derek Jeter. There you go, Dill. Um, he finally did it. I don't know. Does he have other kids? Um, Kate Chastain. Oh, that's the Traders and Below Decks. Mm -hmm. uh, Below Deck, yeah. Yeah, and was she was like, pregnant wait. at the reunion of the first Trader season, U.S. season, and then she gave birth by the time she was on the second one, which is pretty cool. 
the name didn't look familiar. And then I was like, oh, okay, okay. <laughs> I didn't know her name, last name. Uh, Daniel Radcliffe and Hillary Swank. There you go. Uh, and yeah, those are separate, right. right? They didn't They didn't have a baby together. No, right? not together. Okay. Separately. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> Sorry. That's, my brain was like, like Daniel Radcliffe and Hillary Swank. I'm not dropping news here that you're no, like, no. whoa. Um, well, and uh, <laughs> an, another one, Chad, there was another birth of 2023. There was. Why don't you tell Elliot, us? Elliot Webb. That's right. My son. Thank you. Yep. Yes. Thank I don't know why. I was probably tired when I made the list. I did not. Normally, I would include that. You know, yeah. like, yeah, it is what it is. Um, the, um, one of the highlights of of my life. So oh, there you absolutely. go. One of the highlights I, of my life. I mean, it's so fun seeing my co-host be happy. So if you're ever watching this, Elliot, I love you so much, and I'm proud oh, of you. Very cute. Um, and now we have to transition to death. So it was sweet for a second. <laughs> I know, now right? Sad. It's never never uh, easy. But uh, <laughs> and this one, this one's really not easy because, as I say, every year that we get older and we grow up with more legends and icons of the 60s, 70s or whatever. It, it's tougher every year, but take it away, Chad. And look, um, I probably didn't have, uh, I did, probably didn't include everyone that should be on here. I tried my best to c do a list. Um, I'm sure Dylan did a better job over on the Pickle Awards with his montage singing Friends. So um, <laughs> if you want to sing, uh, sing Friends right now. I'm okay. Uh, go ahead. <laughs> I'll sing it in um, my head. Everyone at home, sing it in your heads while you listen to this. Mm, tape, um, Tom Wilkinson, Lee mm. Sun Kyun, Andre Bra 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 Brager, Ryan O'Neill, Matthew Perry, Richard Roundtree, Burt Young, Suzanne Summers, Piper Laurie, Michael Gambin, uh, Jimmy, Jimmy Buffett, Bob Barker, uh, Ron Cephas Jones, uh, William Friedkin, Paul Rubens, Sinead O'Connor, Alan Arkin, Glenda Jackson, Tina Turner, Gordon Lightfoot, Jerry Springer, Harry Belafonte, Lance Reddick, Tom Sizemore, David Crosby, and Lisa Marie Presley. So I'm pretty sure I left somebody off there, but. Yeah, which is natural considering how many more deaths there are every year, you know, with pe yeah. people who are famous. You know, it's not like the 20s where it's like there's like two movie stars who die. You know, like it's it's harder every year because there are more stars every year that emerge. Um, Very sad, but yeah. uh, you're all in our memories. Uh, and Chad, now I see you got some albums and I know what that album is right in front of me. Yeah, um, <laughs> let me see it. <laughs> okay, so I have a few albums that came out in 2023 that I think are really good um, or some other people think are good because I haven't heard all of them. Um, but we do have um, the record by Boy Genius. Oh, you're going to go we back. Have, um, <laughs> Speak Now, Taylor's version by Taylor Swift. There she is. And then we have 1989 Taylor's version by Taylor Swift. There you um, go. Other albums that I don't own, apparently. Uh, my favorite album of last year, Javelin by Sufjan Stevens. Uh, we have also have First Two Pages of Frankenstein by The National. Scaring, scaring the hose by J, JPEG Mafia and Danny Brown. Did you know that there's a tunnel under by Lana Del Rey? Desire, I want to turn into you by Caroline Polachek. Everything is alive by Slow Dive and Guts by Olivia Rodrigo. Love that one too. Uh, yeah, great year for music as well, um, and the, the great music in these these uh, films and and these slates as well. So now that we've gone over the history, it's time to talk about the Oscars themselves. Obviously, Oscar nomination morning brings a lot of joy, but it also brings a lot of sadness because there's some films that just don't make the cut. And with only 10 films in 10 spots, um, there are plenty that are left on the cutting room floor. Uh, Chad, why don't you talk about all the films, uh, notable films of the year 2023? There are a lot of them uh, that did not quite make the best picture sleep, but might have been nominated in other categories or just notable films in general for the year. There's so many, and I probably... Um... I probably is le are, am leaving some some stuff out, but the thing movies I have and um, yeah uh, are the Taste of Things, Missing, oh. uh, Knock at the Cabin, Megan, Sick, Cocaine Bear, Scream Six, Dungeons and Dragons, Honor Among Thieves, Tetris, A Thousand and One, The Super Mario Bros. Movie, Evil Dead Rise, Sisu, The Little Mermaid, You Hurt My Feelings. Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, The Flash, Asteroid City, No Hard Feelings, Nimona, They Cloned Tyrone, Theater Camp, TMNT Mutant Mayhem, You Are So Not Invited to My Bat Mitzvah, uh, Dumb Money, Flora and Son, No One Will Save You, Saw X, Fair Play, The Killer, Priscilla, 
Quiz Lady, The Marvels, Dream Scenario, Thanksgiving, Good Burger 2, Leave the World Behind, Wonka, Chicken Run 2, The Color Purple, and Ferrari. Uh, that was Chicken Run 2, The Dawn of the Nugget, by the way. Yeah, The Dawn um, of the Nugget. Important to get that subtitle there. Yeah. And then I have my Best Picture Worthy, and mm. I wanted to throw one that I just saw into this. Okay. The Iron Claw. I, mm, I, love, okay. I, love, I love that movie. Nice. Um, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, mm. May, December, mm. John, John Wick Chapter 4, Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1 or not, um, <laughs> Creed 3, mm-hmm. Air. It's a movie to me. Taylor Swift, The Eras Tour. <laughs> okay. Um, Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret, Robot Dreams, and All of Us Strangers. There you go. Great slate. I mean, you mentioned pretty much all the notable films. Um, I don't know if you did. You mention Godzilla. It's Godzilla's one. I, I didn't. Didn't sure. I don't think um, I did. Yeah, and that no, was I, a mistake. Well, no, because when I go through notable films looking, I always look at the U.S. ones. I forget to look at the international ones. But you yeah, said Taste yeah. of Things, so I wasn't sure if you also said Godzilla. But a uh, great year for international film as well. Taste of Things was my second favorite film of the year behind Oppenheimer. So I'm very excited um, that you mentioned that. First, it was really cool. You started with that. Um, yeah, it's such a great year for film. It's so hard uh, when so many films don't make the cut. So much so to way where I uh, I put up a next one in graphic, and these were kind of the four films that were like closest to a Best Picture nomination. But even then, like they really didn't have a ton of precursors. May December had the screenplay play nom which helps uh color purple and saltburn both got into critics choice all of the strangers was a big thing at the bathtub but this is one of those rare years where i think all 10 of the nominees that got in were the 10 that were predicted there were really no surprises because it really is the pga 10 uh and the golden globes 10 and then um you know, BAFTA only nominates five, so there's a lot of snubs there. And then Critics' Choice, all they snubbed were Anatomy of a Fall and Zone of Interest, but those are the two international ones. So really, this is, if you were like a betting man, this is probably the easiest 10 to call to where even if you think about the next one in, I don't even think May, December, and Color Purple were particularly close to getting in. I really think this is the 10, and there was really no suspense going into Oscar uh, morning. And even in terms of the win, it, it's pretty obvious who was going to win too because Oppenheimer swept all four. So it's one of those years where the suspense of the Best Picture race is probably the least suspenseful of all of them. Uh, the more suspenseful races were all like the actors and, um, you know, with Lily Gladstone versus Emma Stone and then um, Killian Murphy versus uh, Paul Giamatti and Bradley Cooper design. for a little while and costume produ- production design, makeup, all those things. Um, but yeah, just looking at this, I mean, obviously you know, there really are no surprises here um, for anything that got in. I mean, number 10 might have been the zone of interest that got in, but even by Oscar morning, I mean, that was up for best director. So really uh, this was a pretty foregone 10 to nominate, but um, were you happy to see a pretty straightforward forward 10 would you like to see a surprise obviously you listed off a lot that were like you know notable films but are you happy i mean we've talked about how happy we are with the slate but um would you have liked to see maybe some shockers get in there and, and who do you think was like the next one in if we had to guess uh what was like the 11th spot what, what would you say yeah, well i probably would have looked close uh, like at like of those four that you said uh showed um i probably would have said the color purple i yeah. thought that might get one just because it's a big like musical and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, Hollywood normally probably would want uh, that n- nominated. Um, as far as like be- it being straightforward, honestly, I think like those kind of were the nine. Um, so I, I would, I would have liked to maybe see the one that I do. I don't really care for swapped out for something else, but you know, it's also one of those where it's not a movie that I like despise or anything. Right. It's a movie that, I I could be swayed on potentially, but I don't think I could be swayed on it to where I think it's like great. So I probably would have preferred something else get in there over that one. But we'll talk about it when we get to yeah. that film. Um, well, which brings me to my next question: the Oscars themselves. I mean, it was a very notable Oscar ceremony. I did talk about it in my own video, so I won't go on too long. But uh, one of the things I really appreciate about the Oscars is that of these ten nominees, really there were only a few films that like dominated, quote unquote, like. Uh, Oppenheimer won a bunch, Poor Things won some, Zone of Interest won some, but everything else got either one award or no awards. But I did feel like this was a really good year in making sure everything felt present. Like Killers of the Flower Moon didn't get any awards, but it had that really great musical number with all the Native American indigenous oh, people. Yeah. Um, you know, Divine Joy Wand- Randolph winning for The Holdovers brought a spotlight to that film. Anatomy of a Fall in American Fiction picking up screenplays got brought attention to that film. Um, you know, uh, obviously Barbie had a huge moment with two big musical numbers. So mm-hmm. what were your thoughts on the overall Oscars this year? Just br- briefly, um, you know, were yeah. you a fan of these? Because I, I definitely was. Yeah, I, I really liked it. Um, I mean, you know, I think it was improvement over um, the, the last uh, year. Was the last year the slap? 
No, so the slap was uh, the year of Coda. Year um, oh, and then last cool. year, last year was the Everything Everywhere All at Once sweep, which I've heard a lot of people say, like, I'm glad the same film didn't sweep this year. And it's funny because Oppenheimer won the same amount of awards as Everything Everywhere yeah. All at Once. But I think because the show did a good job in presenting the right categories at the right time, yeah. but also making sure to highlight the other films. Like Barbie only wins one Oscar, but Barbie was probably the second most present film that day next to Oppenheimer in terms of if you watch the awards, Barbie's going to stick in your brain, even though it only wins one. So I think they did just a better job showcasing other films. Whereas last year, if you watch those Oscars, it doesn't feel like Elvis or Banshees or Tar or the Fablemans really have much of a presence at the Oscars, which is very rare um, in terms of just yeah. highlighting them. So, yeah. Yeah, no, I, mean, I think you explained it pretty well about why it felt like a little bit like, you know, more like it didn't feel like it was like Oppenheimer, 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 like right like in a row, like it was with, you know, everything everywhere. And with everything everywhere, too, I was kind of like myself, I was very divisive on it where I'm like, I don't think it's great, but, you know, kind of a deal. We've had this discussion, but I feel like for like my personal take on the Oscars, that had a lot of like, you know, if you just have like a movie that is winning or if you have like you think Bohemian Rhapsody might win Best Picture, you're like, <laughs> can we not? be So right then, you know, I had I had I had um, basically given given up to the fact that Oppenheimer was go probably going to win Best Picture and director and stuff like that. So I had like started trying to watch it more like Oppenheimer and try to figure out if I thought the movie was great. So it's like one of those where I was fine with that one winning awards. It like, it made sense. So with that, I could get in more into the um, ceremony and not be just so massively disappointed by stuff yeah. that like, it just affects my whole mood. So I was actually <laughs> really able to enjoy the show. And I like, like you said, I think even though like, a, like poor things and Oppenheimer won a lot, um, I think they did spread spread the wealth a little bit, and I liked a lot of the fun moments of the show. I think Jimmy Kimmel did a great job. I think um, a lot of the musical stuff and just the little fun things, <laughs> even the way um, Oppenheimer was presented as Best Picture, I thought was really funny. <laughs> my eyes see Oppenheimer. <laughs> like, okay. See, what? My, my, my eyes. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, but, hey, uh, his eyes Take saw it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Al Pacino should present every. I mean, imagine if they had Al Pacino for the Moonlight year. Oh my God, my eyes see Emma Stone. <laughs> like what? Um, and, and that was the funniest thing too is Emma Stone had won the last award before Best Picture, and everyone's like, "Here we go again," um, which was really scary for a lot of us because also Poor Things was probably the runner-up given how many other awards it won. So I wouldn't be surprised if they announced Poor Things if everyone was like, "Oh my God, Poor Things won!" Like it wouldn't have been like if they had announced like one of the ones that didn't have a shot, like Killers of the Flower Moon or Maestro, where everyone would have been like, "Oh, okay, I think they read the wrong." one um which is kind of what happened in 2016 so i think a lot of people were, were holding their breath and were happy when it wasn't poor things not because it was not poor things but because yeah. you know we didn't want another moment like that i think al pacino they gotta be careful with their best picture presenters because they like to go for the yeah. old, like classic legends um but sometimes you get moments like that you know? or at least at least practice it with them beforehand did yeah, well, you um they couldn't give the envelopes or anything but but at least give them a fake one like have them read like yeah, my read, eyes I mean, see the color purple. Like, give him a fake title or something. Or, yeah, the the you know uh, what what's my eyes one? see Winnie uh, the Pooh, blood and I honey. See, you know? <laughs> I see Coda, something that actually won. Like yeah. you know, um, my eyes see Crash. Were you were you like sitting there like, did Oppenheimer win for real or? No, well, because I knew it was going to just by then. Right, like, right. how do you, how does it not win after winning directing, editing, actor, sporting? You know, it's one of those things where it's like, wouldn't it be hard to believe if it didn't? Whereas, but like, did... La La Land was losing steam that night. So I, I wasn't even okay. worried when, once he said Oppenheimer, I was like, all right, it won. And I think a lot of people were like, why didn't he read off all the nominees? But for best yeah. song and best picture, they had presented them throughout the night. So they didn't recap. Um, So I think that was kind of where a lot of people were like, wait, he's announcing the winner now rather than the nominees. But I, as soon as he said Oppenheimer, I was like, yeah, no, it, it won. Like, I'm not like, yeah. <laughs> you know, if he had said any other title, it would have been like, wait, same, what? Same. You know? Um, so I think it was because it was Oppenheimer. If this was a year though, where it was up in the air, kind of like um like I'm trying to think of a year in the past. Power of the like, power of the dog and coda. Yeah, like if he had if yeah, if, if he had said like my I see coda, we would have been like, wait, what? Um, I think that would have been a more prime example. But it, it, he was just lucky that the film that won was one that was like, you know, the the most easy to predict award since Lord of the Rings, you know. So I, yeah. I, I think that's you know 
a, a benefit to that moment, but a funny moment nonetheless. But any other thoughts on the Oscars before we head into nope. this slate? We're already a half hour in, we but we got to get, get into sleep. the movies. Now. Yeah, I was going to say, um, <laughs> we're here, we're, we're ready. Uh, like I said, it's going to be a long one just because we have so much to talk about with these films. Um, that's just how, how it goes here in America. Speaking of America... <laughs> I don't know. Let's talk about American fiction. The first film nominated for Best Picture here. We finally made it to our first film a half hour in. Strap in, guys. Uh, you know, watch this over the course of a week. I don't know. Uh, Chad, tell us about American fiction. Absolutely. American fiction, directed by Cord Jefferson, written by Cord Jefferson. Cinematography by Christina Dunlap. Music by Laura Cartman. Starring Jeffrey Wright. Tracy Ellis Ross, Issa Rae, Sterling K. Brown, John Ortiz, Erica Alexander, Leslie Uggams, Adam Brody, Keith David, and Okirieti Onodowin. Apologies. You, I, <laughs> you can just call him Hercules Morgan, because uh, that's who we all know yeah. him as. <laughs> from Hamilton. All right, okay. A synopsis. A disgruntled author writes a satire of stereotypical black books but it is perceived as serious literature and becomes acclaimed based on erasure by Percival Everett, which I read. <laughs> there you go. Oh yeah. So you read this book and it obviously wins. I mean, I'm kind of skipping the end here, but it wins best adapted screenplay, which I think, yeah. you know, which I read, kind of, which, yeah, there you go. And <laughs> which was also very interesting just considering like of all, like the sweeping, it was weird that Oppenheimer didn't also get screenplay, but I think it's cool that they spread the wealth. And I think thinking about it now, I'm like, it's a movie about writers, like, and it's the writer yeah. strike. Like, I feel like this made sense to win. But um, having read the book and read the screenplay and having seen the movie, I, I want to ask you first, like, what are your thoughts on this one, um, especially with that win in mind? Um, because this is a very writing forward book like, or movie. It's not really a movie about its style. In fact, I think the style is not that great. But I think, you know, it's all about, like, the actual, like, contents of the messaging and the theming and the humor and the heart through the writing specifically and then obviously the performance is elevating that writing but it's more about that than like being an artistic vision in terms of like spectacle but there's a lot of movies that are that and that that's uh, its own special place uh, in you know cinema uh for that so what are your thoughts on this one i mean because i know there's a lot to dive into here with american fiction yeah um i really liked seeing this one get awarded something um, mm -hmm. I probably would have also like awarded it something else, but honestly, reading through a lot of the adapted, there's another screenplay that I would have given over this one. Mm -hmm. um, but this is it, it. This is by no means a bad award winner uh, for screenplay because this is a great screenplay. I really, really yeah. loved it. I really, really love this movie. I think this movie is. I don't know. I just, I, I think it's so funny. I think this is a great year for comedy. Like, we don't get a lot of comedy in, like, Oppenheimer and uh, some other stuff, but there's all, so many, like, funny movies in the slate. Mm -hmm. And I think this one does it really, really well. I think Jeffrey Wright is really funny. Um, like, he's not, I'm going to tell you, a joke kind of funny, but he's, like, funny in how annoyed he gets at stuff. And how, um, you know, just just like the little stuff, you know, uh, conversations he has with people and, you know, how uh, mean he can be sometimes, too. Mm -hmm. And um, I think uh, that stuff is really funny. And then, of course, you have Sterling K. Brown is really funny in it. Um, and just really everyone is funny in it. And I just love how this is a movie with just like real characters and like a real family that's just going through a bunch of real stuff that you would see any other family that's any other race have go like go through these things and i love how it's about a man who is he's mad at the state of black literature in the way that you know he he sees a lot of it as writers having to write to the like the lowest common denominator basically to um appease white people who are the ones who make the decisions about what gets nominated for awards and what goes to the top of the list for you know bestsellers and and stuff like that or and sometimes uh, 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 black writers' books might get put in Amer African American studies, and they have nothing to do with African American right. studies. It's just because they're black. So he's yeah. really upset about the state of it, and the fact that he writes so many like books that he considers high art, 
and those basically don't sell that well. And then with the one time that he writes something as a joke, as a, look, you like this shit? Here's this shit. It's stupid. Look at this. And then they're like, it's the best thing I've ever read. I've read. <laughs> yeah. You're just yeah. like, he's just like, I can't believe this shit is happening. But now I, I have a lot of these problems with my family. I can use this money to pay for stuff that I need. Mm-hmm. And I just love how you have the the stuff that he's writing about and the opinions that he's writing about and the state of like black art and how, you know, he thinks that, you know, um, there's nothing real in literature, you know, with characters that aren't like black characters that aren't like a drug dealer or, you know, just something like, you know, the, like the, uh, you know, like poor people and stuff like that. And then this movie has a story about a real family going yeah. through real stuff. And that, yeah. that's what I love about it. And for him, like that's him getting in touch with his blackness and his experience. Yeah. It's not through the way that white culture has fetishized it or whatever, or how like, you know, everyone is expected to go about their heritage and their culture. Um, but then that's also why that scene with Issa Rae, when they're at the table during the lunch, when they're actually talking and he says, well, your book's just like that. And she's like, but this is real to me. This is my life. And it's really interesting because you can have have those sides where it's like you don't relate to these things about your culture but they are still present in other people's journeys it just might not be yours um, yeah which is, i think is, is is one of the more interesting elements of it and just how it come it kind of has this conversation about blackness and culture i almost wish this had come out 10 years ago when i feel like this was at its height because i think the thing with this is like i don't know when the book was made necessarily you might know better than i do but i think, I think it was like 10 years ago yeah and i think that's the thing is that was when i think this whole idea of like fetishizing black black culture kind of hit its peak kind of around the time like precious was like a big thing like that that was a big example that a lot of people brought in like reviews of this was like talking about like this time in history and i feel like now in 2024 and like when you saw this 2023 i feel like that's not as much a thing because you've had people breaking down those barriers with the black lives matter movement mm-hmm. and with you know like get out being such a big hit for what it was and jordan peele kind of taking like the black cinema landscape forward i i think that's the one element of it that makes it feel a little dated but again if you're looking at it as a piece of like 2000s culture i think it works i just think in modern lens like I don't see those stereotypes as much, but I'm also a white person. So I don't know necessarily, I, I don't you know consume as much black media to know uh, what is necessarily stereotype and what is not. It's just one of those things where I was like, this feels like it, it was perfect 10 years ago, but now we've kind of moved past it as a society and a culture, which I think is a good thing. It means we've grown and we've been more accepting of all types of stories and not necessarily needing to like cater certain stories to certain demographics. Um, but as a time capsule for the 2000s, I think it's a very interesting look at that type of satire and i think it works really well as a satire i mean you said how funny it was and it was one of those films where i expected the humor because of the trailers and what took me by surprise was the opposite was how dramatic it was because i was expecting like kind of a full-blown comedy based on the trailers and just based on the vibe of like the first five minutes where it's like you know this upbeat kind of fun jazz music which i love i love laura carbon's score um but also you have like the you know the the premise is you know him on the phone you know trying to play this like stereotypical black person with his voice and stuff and when he goes to meet him in the restaurant like those moments are so so funny that when like it goes to this deeper more emotional place like when the sister dies in that first like 20 minutes like that genuinely took me by surprise and obviously i went through something very traumatic in my personal life very similar to what went on that film so i've never really been able to like kind of it's harder for me personally to remove the drama and comedy and take them separately because i feel like they're almost so disjointed at times to where i'm like when it's dramatic, I kind of forget that it's a comedy. And when it's comedic, I forget that there's this dramatic stuff. Um, But then when it does kind of meet that perfect balance, it's so easily digestible and so enjoyable to watch. And I think Sterling K. Brown is kind of that clue that connects the comedy and drama best. Um, And I think his performance is very underrated, so much so to where when he got nominated, I was like, really? Um, Because I love him, but I was also like, I I just don't necessarily see it as an Oscar caliber performance. But then rewatching it, I'm like, no, like he really is doing a lot of the heavy lifting and marrying the two, because I do feel like, at times the comedy and drama is so disjointed to where when you do have Sterling K. Brown having these scenes where he's kind of this perfect, it's like inside out where the sadness and happiness kind of hold hands, you know, you're kind of getting a hybrid. It's not one way or the other. And I feel like that's what a lot of Sterling K. Brown's character functions in the story to do um, to where it's not like this is us where it's this complete sad family drama, but it's not, you know, this kind of, 2000s Wayans Brothers comedy either you know it's somewhere in the middle which I think is really fascinating and and really interesting to watch for sure 
Hey, hey, Randall Pearson can give us some really sad speeches, but he's also very funny. So I can see like yeah. the translation why they cast Sterling K. Brown oh, for yeah. this because you get a lot of humor from him, but then you also get like one of the best speeches of this entire slate, I think, mm. where it's it's not long, but it's basically him just like talking about, you know, coming out of the closet, like, you know, kind of later in life. But then having like this deep like sadness that his father like never knew, and I I love the idea because I'm I'm not a gay man, but I love the idea of you know someone having a, a secret like that that shouldn't ever have to be a secret, but they have the secret nonetheless, and and then you know um, they have someone die like their father so so important to them not ever know like their whole self yeah I mean, and, that's a good point. and then it's just like you know what if what if he rejected you for that well at least he would have known he would have known all of me and i just mm. i thought that was really beautiful yeah um, no, it's a very beautiful sentence, yeah. mm. um but i i i wanted to um talk about because i i I didn't think about it though the way you did as far as you know kind of like not saying the movie's dated but like the kind of attitudes might be a little bit like shifted to the past i can to i can totally see where you're coming from with that um i think my only uh kind of thing that i'm thinking about with that is that i feel like when when we have progress we have to keep digging in the no, that's a good point. we have to keep right you know like a like like you're pounding the you know arrakis mm -hmm. you know keep pounding it in right um call yep. those worms um where it's like you know we, we're still getting like world war ii movies like we get it you know kind of a deal the holocaust was bad it's like yeah i know but we but need like, to keep yeah we'll talk about we that need, in nine, nine I know, films but we now, need but yeah. to keep <laughs> yeah. Yeah. reminding because it's so easy mm -hmm. to forget just how bad things were once yeah when life is going good it's not ever it's not ever going good for for some people but when it is going good for a lot of people um it's easy to forget just how bad slavery was just how bad it was for a black writer to actually get stuff published and get their voices out there and you know i i i like that it's still making people think even if it is maybe mostly white people watching it think like you know mm -hmm. if, if there's a certain demographic you're trying because i love the scene um it's towards the end with the like the the room where they're like judging all the books yeah and then the three white people are like this book is so important and i think it's really important to listen to white black voices right now it's just really important and the and then it like it's just like has like a a pause on that scene where it's like three white people shooting down the voices of two two black um, people who basically said, I think this book is trite and it's not right, right. really saying anything. Mm -hmm. and <laughs> so they're just like so ironic, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, the, the very first scenes like that too, where they're in the classroom and the white girl gets offended that he says the yep. And It's like, it's one of those things where I, I, I think that kind of stuff is the best part of this film. It just, I, it was more so me thinking about it, like how pre yeah. prevalent, it, relevant is it now? But it, and it's not to say it's ever not relevant. And I do think, you know, I, I think this just would have hit even harder 10 years ago than it does now. Mm. Um, though I do think the stuff that hits really well now is more so the dramatic stuff, like I said, which is a surprise. Because mm -hmm. when I watched this film, um, I went to the AMC um, mystery screening. So I didn't know what Ooh. I was seeing. Okay. I thought I might have been seeing anyone but you. And I was like, I can't wait. I'm so excited for this movie. And then it like opens with this really amazing first scene where he's like in the classroom discussing these like, you know, racial stuff. And I'm like, this is so interesting. And then it keeps going. And, and I think that was part of why I really liked it the first time so much was because of the surprise of it, not necessarily knowing if it was comedic or dramatic. And then I think for a lot of these films, it's like once you rewatch it with an expectation, it's like you want it to always yeah. match that greatness that you first remembered. And for this, it was like when I rewatched it, it didn't have that same spark because it was less of a surprise. But I think that goes with most films that aren't like the greatest of all time where like there are going to be things that you notice you're more critical of the next time, uh, mm -hmm. which is the case for movies I love in this slate that I was a little more critical on. But then there are also movies that I liked so much more the second time. So it really just goes it, it really depends on the movie. And I, I think this is still a really, really 
really great movie. I, I think it's really well yeah. done, really fun, just so entertaining. Like I think because it has those comedic elements to keep it entertaining. The one other question I had is the ending. Do you like the ending? Do you not like the ending? Because that's the one part that like I feel like most people I've talked to were all kind of like, I don't know how I feel. <laughs> I get that. I get not knowing, and you're just like, hmm, because mm. it's very like meta. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's kind of like you know, like Stephen King. Like you're you're writing about writers, and you know, it's a guy who's writing, and then now he's like messing around with the writing and doing an yeah. experiment. And so at the end of the movie, like, why wouldn't it be kind of messing around with the writing? Here's the thing I, I want to throw out there, um, and I want to I want to mention. I think you have a lot of great points about, you know, when, it, if it would have come out a little bit earlier, it might have hit harder because it was written in 2001. Yeah. So 20 okay. Years. okay. Wow. Okay. So this is before uh, it, it started becoming even more of a, a big deal. Like with like, yeah, Express, this was what, 2009. Yeah. So it's kind of like, okay. yeah. Yeah. It would have hit really hard back in 2001. I don't even know if it would have been accepted as much as it, it was. Uh, right. So maybe 10 years later, but, uh, but yeah, uh, despite that, um, Erasure, the book, um, has a lot of scenes. So you have like one scene where he's writing and you see like the characters in the, in the, in, uh, uh, my pathology and then fuck, <laughs> you have the characters from that, um, actually acting out a scene and he's writing it. You get to see him doing that in the book. There's an, there's like four or five chapters that are all from, my pathology. Um, so I'm wondering like how the movie could have been had they written in him doing that throughout the movie where he's like writing things and you're seeing scenes and people coming in and then you're like, is this real or, Oh no, he was writing that whole thing. Okay. This is right. interesting. So I wonder if it would have been a little bit different, but we do yeah. get that at the end where you have three True. alternate endings. It's almost like clue in that way. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like so this you, is the one that follows in line with the book that he wrote. This is the one that makes the most sense. And then this is the, like the happy ending, you know, it's like, there's three different you know, versions yeah. of it. And I think it's interesting because you actually get, if you, if you had got a, just a one ending that they wrote and they were like, Nope, we're sticking with this. This is our, a nightmare on Elm street that people was like, that's the worst part of a nightmare on Elm street is the ending. And then it's it. like, well, if they would have gone with another one, maybe you would have been happier. But maybe, but instead of choosing, they use the the writer thing, and then it just ends with, nah, that's not a good ending. What else you got? Kind of a deal. I think <laughs> yeah. I've, I think I've seen that done before, but I do actually like it done here because you get different kind of things, and I love how you know st sticking with the comedy. I love how it ends on the final one. That is him just getting mowed down, and then and then uh, Adam Brody's like, they ice him. That's it, you right? Right. Get your get your tux. <laughs> We're making a movie, right. and yep. uh, I love I love that's the one he goes with. It's probably the dumbest one, but mm -hmm. <laughs> he goes with yeah. that one. And then I love how it really ends because yes. the, movie I love the, the movie does have like one actual ending. Yeah. Which but is him and Sterling K. Brown driving away, and then he he kind of meets this actor or looks at this actor who's wearing a slave costume and basically yeah. does like this little like, "Yep, I got you, I see you." Because that's that's honestly the crux of the movie is like, white people are still going to cast black actors as slaves and make them re go through that experience. And that's not to say yeah. we we all don't go through experiences like that. Like obviously there were actors who had to play Nazis in Zone of Interest, and there were these you know like it happens with everything, but it's still an idea of you're you're making people relive trauma for an entertainment essentially. Um, and yeah. and that's something to note too. I really do like that ending most. So I'm glad they ended it on that ending of all. You know, dude, because it's like it's like it's like it's the ending stays true to what the movie is. Like you talked about uh, mm -hmm. how it bridges the comedy and the drama so well. Yeah. That like that's exactly what that ending does is because they're getting in the, he's getting in the car with his brother, they're happy together, they're not fighting or anything, and they're driving away, and he's like, you know, you know, who cast you? They cast to be you, Tyler Perry, and that like g goes to a joke that they had earlier on when people right. thought he looked like Tyler Perry, and um, yeah, and which then, he does not at all, which is another commentary no. <laughs> on how people just assume, yeah. oh, you're a black guy, you're Tyler Perry, you know? Yeah. You know, everyone looks like Tyler Perry or something. Yeah, but 
the comedy happens right there and then it shifts right to the kind of gut punch where it's like you know oh yeah but that's that's the real life thing that's going on right there that's you know we're, we're like you said we're reliving the, yeah. the the slavery thing and um you know yeah so i think it really does cement the thing but we then we do get a little bit of a comedy with you get everything that you thought it might happen i don't know i kind of wanted the stag arlie speech that he gives to the the crowd right. and you know he he says you know why like the the thing in the movie sometimes i'm a sucker for speeches like right. that well because a lot why? of movies it's like where a character's living a lie essentially there's that one scene where it all comes out and everyone responds to it we don't really get that here we don't get that scene where he comes out and, and admits i am stag R. Lee, and everyone has this like huge moment it's not like like dear van hansen you know or the half of it or or cyrano or any of these films where like, right. there's a big reveal of like i was the one behind the pen all along um but like i i think that's kind of a cool thing but also like yeah it's it's like we almost wish we could have seen what the response was especially with yeah. Issa Rae's character what she would have said um but uh, maybe we do maybe maybe there's a part of her that does know when they talk at the boardroom over lunch maybe she's like I think he did write it I don't know I don't know maybe that's something to look for next time I don't think that's necessarily true but it could be a, a choice um yeah, yeah. It, it, I mean, it's interesting no matter how you like it or not like I still don't know if I love it or not but I still like like that aspect of it I think it's interesting to think about I think that's actually a, a great way to say it is the end is interesting and I think it can divide people. I think people can have great discussions about it and say like, you know, I would have liked to see this instead. But honestly, like, even though I said I wanted to see that speech, the movie explains why they didn't do that. Like, um, uh, Thelonious Monk is like, you know, what am I going to sit there and just like have the guy explain the whole thing. So honestly, I feel like the movie at that point takes on Monk's personality and is kind of like, no, yeah. I'm not going to give you that shit. I'm not going to give right. you what you want because F that, you know, this is my movie. I wrote this and I'm not going to mm -hmm. pander to you kind of yeah. a deal. So maybe that's, that's that. the that's movie true. just, you know, a little mean spirited towards you. <laughs> yeah. Um, one last thing I just want to mention before we move on. Uh, I, I just have to give a shout out to my girl, uh, Myra Lucretia Taylor. I know you liked my tweet, Chad. Um, she plays Lorraine, kind of the, the uh, housekeeper. Um, yeah. Her love story with, her, her love story with Maynard is just so sweet. It's just one it. of those things where, where it's like that that is just the most human stuff in the movie because she really doesn't have anything to do with the drama of the movie. I mean, she occasionally will be like, your mom's missing. Like she's a, fun, a function of that, but like she's not centralized in the drama, but it's just this added thing to kind of give this overall perspective of this family drama and like i said like the drama and comedy doesn't always meet too well but when it does it really does and i, I think she's such a good part of the whole the heart of the film so i, I just want to add because i yeah. i also love lorraine and maynard i think they're great i think you know when they're like you know everyone can come to the wedding why you know everyone where it's all love yeah. here kind of a deal i love like how they meet they're meet cute and it's like you know i haven't seen you in a dog's age and yeah. and then maynard's like love frank <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's great um and, but then I, but then I, I just i love uh the fact that um i love seeing um uh sterling k brown's character like coming out and he's so unapologetic about it he's just like he's like you know what you want to say something homophobe <laughs> kind of a deal on the phone and then like you know he has like lovers that he's he's with and everyone's accepting of them. And in fact, they're in the wedding in Speedos and stuff like that. Yeah. I just, I love that like dance sequence that they have and, and all that. that. So. Shot. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, there, there's some great stuff. Like I said, all these films for me are, are great. So, so hard to move on, but we must. Yeah, we must. We, we just <laughs> spent a whole half hour in and of itself on American fiction. But yeah. I mean, it did win a big Oscar. So we're going to we're going to mention it. Uh, it won, went one for five. It won the big one adapted screenplay. That was its big win. And Court Jefferson, an amazing speech. He's like, why make a hundred million dollar movie instead of ten? Uh, 10 10 million dollar movies or something yeah. like that which is just the coolest sentiment ever um anyway it was nominated for best picture best actor for jeffrey wright best supporting actor for sterling k brown and best original score speaking of ambiguity and endings and wondering um what what is the truth and what is the lie um let's talk about anatomy of a fall uh, let's fall into this one here chad another screenplay winner for our original screenplay chad tell us about anatomy of a fall yeah i wish i could have read it um in, in full uh anatomy of a fall I'm gonna learn <laughs> french buddy I do. It's, it's not I, hard. Do, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Do a lingo. Here I come. We, oui, we, oui, mademoiselle. 
Anatomy of a Fall, directed by Justine Trier, written by Justine Trier and Arthur Harari. A cinematography by Simon Bofils, Bofi, starring Sandra Holler, Swan or Loud, Milo Machado Graner, Antoine Reinartz, Samuel Thais, and Ginny Beth. Synopsis. A court attempts to discern whether a man's death was the result of a suicide or a homicide. Now, Chad, I'm going to give you an opportunity before the comments troll you. You forgot an actor. You forgot to list one of the main actors of this film who was on Messi. the Messi! Messi! There we go. Messi. I, knew you, I knew you meant to say it. I was giving you the opportunity. Uh, no, we, we have to talk about Messi because Messi yeah. fucking rocks. Um, no, I, Messi's not in the Wikipedia cast breakdown, which is a shame. Uh, so that's why. Yeah, it should have um, been but No, no, because no, as you're rattling it off, I'm like, wait, they didn't list Messi? Because I'm I read them alongside you in case you need help with the pronunciations. But um, yeah, I was like, why don't they have Messi written down? Um, but I mean, Anatomy of Fall, one of those movies that I think is one of the more talked about movies because it's so ambiguous. Um, but is it? And that's what we're here to talk about. Um, yeah. No, I, I I, think this one is one that I, for the first time when I watched it, I didn't necessarily know what I was getting from it. I didn't really know what to expect. And I, I watched it. I liked it. Um, it wasn't until the rewatch, though, where I really kind of understood what it was saying and liked what it was saying a lot more um, to where going into this, I wasn't necessarily too hyped to rewatch it because I was like, I think it's a little overrated. I think it's a little long. Um, I've seen other courtroom dramas. I've seen movies where it's like, is he innocent or guilty? And they don't tell you. Like, I've seen a lot like it. But then when you rewatch it, I feel like you get a lot more of the ins and outs of not just whether she did it or not, but also like just the context of the marriage and how complicated it is and how really at its core, this is about a family that is, you know, dealing with a, some, a, a child with a disability and having to navigate that and it being difficult to navigate as parents. And they're not being an objective love or hate and kind of some gray area because of this family drama that's going on and other people struggling to understand it. I think there's a lot to it that I'm sure we'll get into in a sec, but I like this a lot more on rewatch. So anyone who was saying, oh, Dylan's going to shit on anatomy of a fall. I'm not going to, um, I, I would never have shit on it, but like I was uh, prepared to watch this and be like, I don't get the hype, but now I get the hype. So and I'm excited to talk about it. Chad, what are your thoughts on this? one? Very interesting. Yeah. I, I actually really dug this for just from the, the get go. Mm -hmm. um, but it's one where, um, Oh, like you were, you were talking about with American fiction where it's like, you know, Movies that you watch the first time and you get the, the hype the first time and you're like, whoa, and then you watch it again just to see how it settles because sometimes mm -hmm. it settles low yeah. and then you're like, I don't like it as much. And sometimes it settles even higher and then sometimes it settles like just fine. I think this one is just fine because I did watch this a second time. Thankfully, they threw it on Hulu so I could I could watch uh, it uh, uh, without having to pay again. Right. Um but yeah, this one settled just fine. I really liked it. I like seeing like everything that you see outside of the courtroom factors into the courtroom. You know, you have the the dog factors in. You have their marriage, like you said. You have um, the uh, the song "Pimp" that I've been just kind of replaying a lot of the times. It's funny because Go what? No, I was just good. Go ahead. Go ahead. It's funny because um, I the first time I played it after watching the movie, it was like at night and we were like getting ready to go to sleep. And then uh, Carrie was like, uh, my wife Carrie was like, um, are you going to murder me? And then I was like, no, I'm the one playing pimp. You're going to murder me or yeah. not. Maybe not. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I laughed because I honestly think the reason I didn't love it the first time is because I was kind of annoyed by that song. I was like, Oh God, they keep playing it. But I think that's, that's the point. point. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah that's the point. <laughs> and I even nominated it at the Pickle Awards for best use of a pre-existing song because it is so important in the function of this movie. And you talked about with the last, um, with American Fiction, you were like, some of these films are just so funny. There are exceptions that aren't. And this film, I don't think is a funny film, but even this film has a joke that is so funny when like, the the one uh, prosecutor's like i mean have you read the lyrics for pimp it's so misogynistic and all this stuff and, and the interpreter's just like it was an instrumental version like uh... that, that that just cracks me up because it's just like it's so true it's like they're now trying to find a way to connect this song that has no lyrics at all a cover instrumental version to connect it to the actual motives of whether someone were or were not to murder someone i just think it's so funny and and that that joke is really great um there, there's 
I have a few jokes written down for the serious movies that I think are underrated um, that we'll get to. There's only one movie I couldn't find a joke for is Zone of Interest, and I'm not even going to try. Um, but every other movie, I think, has yeah. a good amount of humor or as <laughs> I mean. at least a humorous bit. Um, so, yeah, that, that was an underrated moment of, of humor, which, again, is a screenplay. Screenplay is great. Um, I have to ask, do you think she did it? Um, I don't. Okay. I don't, and the reason why I don't is because we get a lot of courtroom stuff. We get back and forth. We get, you know, seeing her, like, defend herself so much. I don't know. It, it, you could see it either way, and I think that's a testament a testament to Sandra Holler's performance mm. is because you're trying to read her a lot. But honestly, every time she says something, like, I believe her and I want her to win – Right. Um, I'm very rarely watching a movie where I'm like, I want you to lose. So I'm like on her right. side a lot of the times. But then also what when it doubles down is that her son questions if she did it too. And she's just kind of he's just like he does that experiment on the dog. Mm -hmm. and he's just trying to like figure out if certain things she says is possible or if he's remembering things correctly because he doesn't have like his eyesight anymore um and stuff but like he gives like that whole uh speech that i love it's probably my favorite part of the movie where he's talking mm -hmm. about his dad talking about your dog could die one day and Almost preparing maybe... it as if he is talking about himself yeah exactly mm -hmm. and and that whole thing that he brings up i think is what sways because i think it's maybe on the fence like the jury's on the fence and then they they're swayed after that to be like Okay, it probably was a suicide if you had that. And it just sounds so convincing. Like I'm it sounds like you actually went through that situation um with your dad. And so that really cemented it for me that I don't think she did it, but you know, I I do like the fact that it's a little yeah. ambiguous too. It's so funny because so many people out there are like so gung-ho about oh, it's very obvious what Justine Trier is trying to say. I'm like, if it's obvious, then she would have said it, you know? And yeah. I think that's one of those things where I watched it the first time and I was very, I, I think I was being a little egotistical and I was like, I think it's kind of obvious that she she did it. And then I rewatched it and I'm like, she didn't do it. And I think yeah. that's, the power, that's the power of this film. I think that's why I like it so much the second time is because the first time, I, I think the reason was that there was some clearly some fear that the kid had in this whole thing that I was worried that he almost curated this like story at the end to kind of just give him the peace of mind and to end it all. And to be like, listen, I'm just going to paint my dad as this, you know, mentally ill suicidal suicidal person. But then when I rewatched it, I was like, I think it's what you said best is Sandra Huller is so good about being so honest and so real and so convincing that I truly believe she's someone who's fighting for her life because she knows she's innocent. And I, when I rewatch it, I think her performance sold me on the fact that she didn't do it. And I think that's, what's so cool about this film is that I think every time I watch it, I'm going to, I'm going to lean a different way because it is ambiguous. Uh, and, and I think some people who are the opposite, who are saying, I think it's very obvious she didn't do it. I think they're wrong too. Cause I don't think they make it obvious, but that's what the beauty of the film is, is that it's not obvious. And I think for those people who are saying it's obvious that she did, or obvious that she didn't do it. Obviously, Justine Trier kind of made a mistake and, and at the Golden Globe said what she intended for it to be the truth. And I'm not going to say it here because I don't want to ruin it for anyone else out there. But I think it's one of those things where I really do think every time you watch it, depending on what you gather from certain deliveries of things and also the movies trying to make you feel a certain way, like you're obviously not supposed to like the prosecutors, you know, like Antoine Reynards was nominated for best villain at the Pickle Awards because he's a sniveling yeah. asshole in this and he's so good at it. He's such a good, he, him and Jason Clark, we'll talk about him in a bit, but like two of the best like prosecutor performances I've ever seen. Like they're yeah. so good about playing the dicks. And I think that's one of the things is like, I just think the movie Sandra Huller is so honest and so, and the thing is she's not like the sap who's like, so like overly apologetic. Like, Oh, I could not have done it. She's just still very bleak and very stern, but I, there's still an honesty there that I, I feel like if she did do it, she'd honestly be going through more leaps and hoops and stuff. But I think that's just so cool about this film is that I, I, I still don't know um, when at one point I was very convinced one way, one the other way. And I, th I think that's the power of this movie is really the ambiguity that maybe it's, it's, seen in other courtroom dramas where there's some ambiguity sure but like i think this does it better than a lot of other courtroom dramas in terms of actually delivering the ambiguity of it for sure yeah um you know i i really like everything you said um 
And I think like the ambiguity kind of does, and maybe maybe this is what uh, Justine was trying to do, but it kind of makes us jury members. Like you can yeah. sit there and you're a jury member just watching this and you know, you're know you trying to figure it out and you don't know at the end of the day. And you might have, when you're watching Anatomy of a Fall, you might have cast your vote. Like, I don't think she did it. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, maybe she did. And you said that she didn't or vice versa. The opposite could be true. Mm-hmm. Um, and you go home and you think about that case that you saw in Anatomy of a Fall or in real life that you were judging. And then you go, I hope I did the right thing. But, you know, you don't right. know because mm-hmm. no one knows you weren't there. So all you can do is try and like reconstruct this stuff. And uh, one lawyer uh, will make like a really compelling case. I don't think the asshole lawyer did. I think he, <laughs> no. was, he was trying so hard all the time to undermine everybody who wasn't on his side. Right. That I was just like, why would anybody trust you? Like every single right. time, like even the one time where uh, the, it was like the expert who's like, you know, uh, and by the way, you know, every time they would do like blood spatter uh, analysis, uh, my wife would go. And that's why they don't have a blood spatter. It's not uh, true science. It's not admissible in court and all that stuff. And I'm just like, OK. Um, yeah, you but, love it. The expert. That's great. <laughs> well, she's not an expert, but she she likes this stuff. Um, she's kind of like mm-hmm. Matt in that way. Matt's the kind of right. same, same deal. Um, but yeah. Um, you know, and then like she, you know, you'll hear the one guy saying it only could have been that she he, she was pushed off of the balcony, and then she's like, actually, that's very improbable. It's probably happened from him falling and hitting his head, and then the snow doing this, and then the one guy's like, well, that's your opinion. It's like, well, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's an expert opinion, dipshit. And I don't know. He's I don't such know. a dipshit. I love it. He's so good in this. He's so good. I don't know if it's he it really is. I don't know if it's um uh like the just the French court system, but this whole case made me so invested that I was mm-hmm. angry a lot of the time. Right. And then like because I was on Sandra Holler's side, and I love her lawyer um too, and like the relationship yeah. they form. As um, known on Twitter as hot lawyer, by the way. That's- there you go. They, they, they literally say the the asshole and the hot lawyer. <laughs> like, that's that how makes, they do it. Makes sense. <laughs> it makes sense. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I, I love uh, their side so much. So I'm so invested in the movie. Mm-hmm. Um, I did want to add, because you talked about um, the ambiguity of the movie and, like, Justin Trier even coming out and saying, this is what I thought it, it was. This is what I made the movie to represent. Um, and yet, you know, she's like, uh, for me... Even if she comes out and says, this is what I meant, I don't think it matters. Like, I don't think her stake in the movie, like she made such an ambiguous movie that so many people can question. I think everyone's right. She's right Right. in what she meant to do. Everyone else who guesses is right. And this is what David Lynch says. Yeah, yeah. I was was about to bring that up. Yeah. Once I make a movie and I put it out there, I'm not going to explain what it means because it ultimately doesn't matter anymore. Right. It, the viewer is as much a part of the filmmaking uh, process mm-hmm. and analyzing process as the filmmaker. It's not interesting if a, if a director comes out and goes, you guys are all wrong. She did it yeah. or she didn't do it or whatever. And, she and, if, she, and if Justin Trey wanted to make that known, she would have said it, you know, kind of like how Ridley Scott, when he did the last duel literally says the truth in front of the section, that is the objective truth. If you want to make it objective, you say it. And the fact that she doesn't means that it is not objective. There is a subjectivity to it. Even if her intention was one way or the other to say, yes, he, she did it or yes, she, or no, she didn't, you know? Um, so that, that's where I, I think the power comes from. And, and that's part of the screenplay. It's, it's what she decides to give away and how she decides to give it away. And even like, like the argument we see that's objective truth because we hear the actual recording of it. Whereas Milo Machado Greener's speech is not an objective truth because it's him recalling it in his own words. So even that is interesting because it's like this piece of evidence is actual evidence. We see it, we hear, or we at least hear it. This is fully, you know, interpreted from what he believed, which could also be false, which I also like too, because those are the two biggest reasons for and against her doing it is like they hear the violence through the tape but then they also hear this kid's testimony so um i I just love how they play around with that like i really did a full 180 on this film i didn't dislike it before but i just i think it was i was overall annoyed and that was letting the annoyance of the court case get to my my feelings toward the film i still think it's a little long i think the pacing at times 
Like there are yeah. some scenes that could have been shortened, but I really do like it. I, I like it a lot. Yeah, but it's one of those movies that's that's long, but then I'm like, what would you have cut out? Kind of a deal. Like everything yeah. so like all of the tertiary stuff that's in her life or their life lives um, actually factors into the case and is a very important, you know, so, you know, especially the, uh, the fight scene that they showed, like the video. And then I'm like, not since marriage story, have I seen a fight this intense? Yeah, in my opinion, that, that might be the scene of the year next to another scene we'll talk about in another movie. Like, that might be my scene of the year in terms of just, like, the overall power and the impact it has on the overall film, I think. I think that scene is just so good. I thought you were going to say besides something from May, December. <laughs> um, well, yeah, I did draft something from May, December. But even then, like, that monologue is so good as an acting exercise that Matt, Natalie Portman my monologue, but this scene is just, I don't know. It, it, it's so good. I, I think and in the that, context of the movie, this scene works even better than that does in that movie. I don't know. I love that movie. Sure. Though. If, because if I had to nominate like, another one, it'd be that one. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. May, December, I think is up there. Yeah. I did put it in my bed. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think because like the, the whole thing is so real, like it feels like, you know, a real um, situation that a married couple w would go through. And it's just like feels, I don't know. It's like, you know, kind of like someone who's so insecure and then like, you know, someone who's like, you know, you took everything from me and it's like, you know, you made choices. Like I can't, you can't blame me for all of your, your decisions and you know stuff like that. And then the fact that, you know, all of that, uh, the, the the blindness of the sun uh, right. factors in so much into it um, because it was actually an accident that was caused by, you could say, the neglect of the father. Um, and as a father, I'm sitting there thinking, I don't know if, if I could forgive someone if I placed care into their hands right and they ended up you know betraying that and something happened to my son yeah no uh, i agree it, it, it's it's affecting like that as well so yeah there's no, so much in this movie it's a, such a good movie well and, and the idea of an eyewitness being blind in and of itself is a cool interesting thing that we don't really see in a lot of movies very um, true you know and, and that's the thing is i think i i chalked it up to being kind of like other courtroom dramas but i think just being a french court system already makes it so different because the way they operate is so different the the actual setting and the production design is so different that i think yeah i, I think this is only going to grow in my estimation with more time i mean it won the palm door at con which is the biggest prize it could win that's what we saw with triangle of sadness last year so i think whatever wins this year is it has a good shot of getting in the oscars next year because i think that seems to be now a pattern but um yeah really just really strong film uh is there yeah. any, is there anything else or should we move on well i just say like yeah i love messy uh oh yeah <laughs> Our boy. Uh, that, that hey, don't scene, don't tip a best actor potential pick, but well, I'll just say, <laughs> I'll just say that one scene. Yeah, I saw more of it this time, but I still had to kind of skip over it yeah. a little bit because right. I was, I just can't really watch that. Mm -hmm. Um, even though I know an actor giving a performance. Yeah, well, that that's what's so great. Yeah, he's literally acting the dog. It's such so a hard scene to watch. I don't know, but I will say, I I just I'm a sucker for riveting courtroom dramas like a, a few good men and just a lot of these 12 angry men maybe we'll get to that at some point which isn't actually a courtroom case a courtroom yeah. uh, movie right it's, but it's, it's a jury yeah it, it's got a court yeah. adjacent it, but I'd it's say. still it's court adjacent exactly and it's still riveting because mm -hmm. of everything they're talking about and you have to try to piece it together in your mind right. what happened and yeah i think anatomy of a fall does it like perfectly and I just, I really love it. So there you yeah, go. So good. Yeah. Well, the Academy loved it because it, it won one award, uh, which it wouldn't normally be a lot, but when you're in a 10 film slate, that's still something. And the award it won was best original screenplay, which is big. So it went one for five. It also was nominated for best picture, best director for Justine Trier and best actress for Sandra Hewler, as well as best film editing. Now there's one piece of evidence that they actually cut from the movie, which is when they pull up a clip of Sandra Hewler. She's playing her acoustic guitar right before she, talks to her husband and she says i want to push you around 
but I will, but I will. And then she pushes her husband, but they omitted that because they wanted to keep the ambiguity. You know who else sang that song this year? Mr. Ryan Gosling in a movie, a little movie that no one's seen called Barbie. <laughs> Chad, tell us about this little hidden gem, this art house drama that was only played on like four screens nationwide, uh, Barbie. Very interesting segue. I loved it. Um, Barbie, <laughs> directed by Greta Gerwig, written by Greta Gerwig and Noah Bumbach. Cinematography by Rodrigo Prieto, music by Mark Ronson and Andrew Wyatt, starring lo a lot of people uh, named Barbie and Ken, um, starring Margot Robbie, Ryan Gosling, Issa Rae, Kate McKinnon, Dua Lipa, Simu Liu, Kingsley Benadir, John Cena, America Ferreira, Ariana Greenblatt, Ray Rhea Perlman, Helen Mirren, Will Ferrell, and Michael Sarah. Synopsis, an existential crisis leads Barbie and Ken to go on a journey of self-discovery. There you go. Did you watch the, um? I sent it to you, the David Ehrlich Countdown Top 25 video this year? I think I did, yes. So what I love that he does is he puts a song from a different movie in context of the other one. So he played Push during his Anatomy of a Fall bit, which is just the funniest, like, humor i i had seen on in any of his videos which is so funny it's it's them playing push sung by ron gosling as this guy's like falling out the window as they're doing the uh <laughs> anatomy of a fall test where they test the dummy anyway i just think that's great um but yeah i mean this is you know color purple didn't get in but this is a kind of like the big musical that got in this year but it's also a comedy yeah. but it's also just its own thing like barbie was kind of its own phenomenon yeah. that really cannot be put into one genre even though you could put it in a comedy or a musical genre like i feel like it was its own entity in a way that we don't normally see in any year. Usually the biggest films of the year are franchise films. They're part of the Avengers or they're Star Wars or they're Jurassic Park films. But this one is different. This is a an original take on an IP, but an IP that has not been adapted, at least live action um, yeah. ever. You know, the animated run was was quite a fundamental part of, you know, my sister's childhood and therefore mine because I was in the house when she was watching them. But, you know, like it was only really animated little princess movies like Barbie. This was a huge yeah. undertaking. And for someone who was Greta Gerwig, who had built herself up as a sustained director, a lot of people were worried. A lot of people were like, is she going to be able to pull this off? Not really knowing what the premise was. No one really knew what the premise was until they actually watched the movie because the trailers kept it pretty ambiguous, um, but it worked. And we're talking about it today as a best picture nominee. Not only that, but a nominee for eight Oscars, which if you had told me a year ago, would not have believed you thought maybe it could have gotten in for some design awards but i would never believe you if you told me barbie was going to be a best picture nominee and breaking the record for the most amount of critics choice award nominations ever like that i would not have believed you um but chad please tell us i mean you're wearing the shirt what do what you and you have the screenplay you have the blu-ray behind you i have the blu-ray behind me um we we like this film but but how do you feel about this film now having rewatched it and, and sat with it for so much time now considering it's been such a phenomenon for so long yeah. Um, well, I, well, I'll say first off that Barbie is one that I, I feel like I was really high on it the first watch. It dipped a little bit hmm. on maybe my second watch, and then it re rose again on like the third watch. I think I've seen it three times now. Uh, yeah. On the third watch, even higher than the first time. So I really like Barbie a lot. I didn't know exactly how to feel about it as a whole the first time, but I think it's because it is such a, um, an interesting movie, like you've been saying, and we've had this discussion before. We won't go down this rabbit hole, but it is one where you can put it in a, adapted screenplay because it is adapting so much. Yeah. Yet there's so much original about it too, where yeah. you could see, yeah, it's, it's adapting characters, but like, look at this fully fledged out story that they're building with those characters kind of a deal. Yeah. So, and I, I love that they do that. I love that they don't, it's one of those where it's hard to explain, but it's one of those where they're, it, it made so much money because they're catering to everyone. I feel like in this, like they're, they're trying to make it for everyone. And it's a movie where, a lot of stuff is shoved into your face and it's like, and I've seen some critics go, mm, it's a little on the nose. They're, yeah. they're throwing stuff at you. Like, here's the message. This is what yeah, it's very is. on the nose in that case. Yeah, it is. But it's, I don't think but, that's a bad thing. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I think it knows what it is. I think it mm -hmm. knows what it's doing. I know Greta Gerwig and Noah Baumbach are great writers. They know 
exactly what they're doing. They know that they're not being, you know, uh, they're not keeping the, the, the themes of the movie subtle. They're saying, these are the themes, just like Barbie and Ken. Ken has a big coming out, like, you know, like, I'm Ken. Yeah, yeah, kind of a deal. And the Barbies are like, we're Barbie. You know, and the movie is like, I'm Barbie. I'm here. I made a billion dollars because <laughs> it's so brash. It's so out there. Um, you know, and I love how it, 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 it brings the themes out for everyone to understand. It doesn't try to do this, you know, pretentious kind of like, oh, you didn't get what Barbie was about. No, it tells you what Barbie was about. And it makes it so that like little kids can understand the themes and go like, oh, that's that's feminism. Cool. That's yeah. a, a thing that I can understand. But then I feel like there are so many people that are like us where we're like, we like to, you know, watch movies and go, you know what? This is what it's doing. This is the theme in this movie. Yeah. We like and a little more nuance because because admittedly, there's not a lot of nuance in the overall messaging of Barbie, but that's not right. to say it's not important or not impactful in its own way. And a lot of people are saying like, oh, it's it's not for kids because the dialogue is still very heightened because it's Greta Gerwig and stuff. If it wasn't for kids, it wouldn't have made as much money as it did, people. Like yeah. there are ki kids went to the movies for this, men and women and all genders alike. Like it, this was not just for older women this was for all ages all oh, yeah. genders and i do think kids still enjoyed it even if they didn't necessarily know what the word existential meant they still <laughs> understand what's going on and even if they don't understand everything that's going on i still think there's enough pretty colors and fun moments and funny comedy that they don't necessarily have to necessarily leave going oh my god this is feminism they can just be like oh my god that was so funny and i think that's where it does function so well for so many people i think we are older and you know we have the eyes of film critics who who look for the nuances and there's another film in the slate that i think tackles the exact same themes in a more nuanced way but that doesn't necessarily make it a better or worse way than barbie just because it's a different approach it's like you know you can walk around the block you can skip around the block you can run around the block you can walk backwards you're still making the same walk that it, or doing the same lap as someone else it's just different um i don't know if that was a good metaphor but you know what i mean um yeah, yeah. Um, well, yeah, no, I, I, I think you're, you're on the money where you talk about it being for all ages. This is a movie that you can love when you're a really little kid and just, you know, really get into the dance sequences and like, you know, um, you know, just seeing Barbie and you have a Barbie and you love Barbie and, you know, seeing Ken and everyone is having these like very approachable, uh, performances like even will ferrell the ceo is like this silly guy yeah. you know so you can like get that as a little kid but then as you grow up you can grow up with barbie and yeah. you can see and like that's what barbie and ken are both doing is that they're growing they're go going from these concepts to something more something grown up and, and fuller and just like more real and i feel like you as a person can do that with barbie as you grow up or if you're already grown you can still get a lot out of this movie just like i did yeah um and and i do want to talk just about the style because i think another thing that people are underrating is like they're the conversation seems to be all about the the messaging and like was the america ferrera speech too on the nose was it a good speech was it a bad speech the patriarchy all these things the i am knuff you know the whole talk about gender and her finally getting a vagina at the end all this stuff but we're not talking about how just stunning it is. And I think just as a feat of filmmaking, this could have the worst script. And I still think it should be nominated for production design and costume design. It has a good script, but I really do think just technically, regardless of what the messaging is, this is just one of those great cinematic achievements because I feel like rarely we see big studio blockbusters like this feel so tangible. Like we see so much green screen and like with the volume and like all these things that are, are really revolutionary, but sometimes we forget just how cool the magic of a movie set can be. And surely there's some visual effects going on, but I think just the, even the stuff in the real world with like the, the big costumes that they wear, um, like when they're roller skating and they have those really vibrant costumes and then the actual Mattel office the production design. I just think the design of this thing is so underrated at this point, which I can't believe I'm saying because a lot of people originally were like, wow, it looks like Barbie land. It's so amazing. But I think the right. conversation has shifted so much to the messaging that people are losing sight of the fact that this is a very well thought out vision. And I think Greta Gerwig, a lot of people were, 
up in arms about her not getting the directing nomination. And I personally didn't put her in my five, but the more I think about it, that strong point for me isn't the writing, it's the direction because yeah. she's able to make this thing come to life in such a vibrant way. And really just every single set piece and, and piece of construction in this thing, every shade of pink, all the costumes that are adapted, you know, they're all existing costumes, but you have to literally sew that all together. Like you have to make something that is only this drawing come to life or these little toys come to life. And I think she does such a good job with that to where I just wanted to bring that up because I, I remember yeah. watching that video where she brought up all her influences, like, you know, all the Max Ophuls films and then the umbrellas of Cherbourg and singing in the rain, all these different homages mm -hmm. that are very clear in these films. And I know it's like, is a Warner Brothers Barbie movie versus all these like classic French new wave films. But I really do think the inspirations there specifically in the Max Ophuls and singing in the rain inspirations. I really love, cause I love those directors and those films. So I'm, I'm just, I, I always love just feasting on the visuals of this film. Um, to where every time they leave Barbie land, I want them to kind of get back as soon as possible. I think the most exciting stuff happens in Barbie land, but even then, like, like I said, the real world has some fun bits as well. Um, but yeah, I, I just think it's really, really well designed. So uh, I love it. Yeah, honestly, I, I, I agree with everything you said. And I think this is a very challenging movie. Like you'd mm -hmm. think like, you know, Oppenheimer's like the most challenging movie of, and, and it is a very challenging movie, I think. But like Barbie is challenging in a different way where it's like, you know, I don't want to say like lower, but it's almost like people are trying to go like, you know, I need to get like the deep messaging out of the the thing. And like, this is like the pretty, it's like almost like people are rolling their eyes at it. And it's like, look, this is a movie that is what it is. It's great. It is what it is though. And you have to get on the movie's level or you're not going to, you're not going to love it or you might not even like it. But it's one of those where it says, I'm not going to shift my, I'm staying right here in the middle for everyone to love. I am going to have deep themes, but they might be just like spelled out for you kind mm -hmm. of a deal because everyone wants to watch this movie. Um, and I love that it doesn't try to cater to everyone specific or, or anyone specifically it tries to cater to everyone. And I think that's, what's great about it. And I think that because for me, like the second time I watched it, I just went like, this whole Ken sequence goes on way too long. And it's just like, <laughs> I don't right. know if it would be a better movie if this wasn't here. And I'm trying to like edit it in my head. And then like I watch it the third time and I'm like, I'm just Ken. And I'm just like, right, you're rocking out with it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just like, you know what? Why am I being an asshole? I just watch the movie and love it. You don't have mm -hmm. to, you yeah. don't have to love this movie, but if someone does, there's probably they're probably rocking out to to that, and they're mm. loving Ryan Gosling sing push, and they're loving all mm. of the little jokes, you know, yeah. uh, that they make, and yeah, and even even in terms of the function and the plot too, like it, you need that song because if you don't, then Ken is is because in my opinion, Ken is almost near insufferable throughout um and he's supposed to be he's supposed to be this i mean he's a villain of the movie he really is he's the antagonistic opposing force of the film he's not a necessarily bad guy but he's you know definitely the antagonist to where i think you need that song to make him kind of have his own re realizations and awakenings on his own too and not necessarily have like someone hold his hand through it um you know and, and be like this is the beauty of manhood because then it would it would be kind of taking a different counter stance to what Barbie's going through in the movie, but it, it's just kind of him accepting himself as like, I'm enough on my own. And now I want to have my own journey. That's not attached to Barbie. And I think that's what this film does so well. And as much as people want to say like, this is a feminist film and it is, but I think it's important to note that feminism does not mean pro women as much as it means pro equality. And I think that's yeah. what this film gets so well is that it gives, you know, this other lens of Ken, you know, to be this other kind of outlook to where I think a lot of grown men can kind of see themselves in it, see the faults of what the patriarchy is and, and just the overall gender norms, and then also see what they can do about it in terms of change. And I think that's important. That's why that number is so impactful. It goes on for a long time, but it really kind of breaks down toxic masculinity in such an interesting way. Um, yeah. And then you also get that though, with the women perspective too. And the fact that literally the, what it all builds to is her becoming a woman. It is essentially an allegory for gender in and of itself. Like Barbie doesn't, 
I mean, she's a girl's toy, but she's not a woman yet until she makes the choice at the end. And that is her choice. And, and I've seen a lot of people compare it to like just trans allegory in general, too, because of that. Um, you know, the fact that she wants to be a woman in the end and she wants to make this choice because that's her identity. And I, I love that, too. I think it's so progressive. So and, and the montage, the Billie Eilish montage with all the women. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but th those are all actual crew people and actresses from the set that Greta Gerwig pulled their home videos from for that whole montage, um, oh, which I think okay. is beautiful as well so it's like all the women who worked on the film videos of them and their mothers and i think that's also so beautiful too so you have this really great story for the men in the film and then also the women in the film but also trying to find a way to connect them is important too but i like how it kind of has something for everybody like you said um which is so important because you know it, it doesn't say one is better than the other it doesn't even say there are two you know there's also there's allens too in this world um and yes is alan the being the only alan a good or bad thing i don't know um you know, maybe if they had a, included a, another Alan for Alan to have, you know, that would have been nicer. But um, but it is a funny device nonetheless. And I think Michael Sarah's is great. Um, but yeah, there's just so much in this film that you could probably spend another two hours talking about. Like it, it really is that nuanced and that deep. Yeah, honestly, like everything that you said about um, the feminism aspect with um, how it treats women, but also how it treats men. And it's because one of those things where yeah, you want to make a movie. This is one of my favorite parts of the movie, by the way. This is why I mm -hmm. loved it the first time. Yeah. And even though I had, like, questions the second time, it, it was never about the messaging. The messaging, I was always like, I actually really love what it's doing here. Because I love how it's, you know, it says all the things you need to say. And we're talking about the America Ferrera speech. Um, I, I love it. I think it highlights a lot of uh, things that, you know, women think about and, and are going through and stuff that I never think about. And yeah. that's kind of the thing is like challenges me because I'm like, that's how you guys feel. I didn't mm -hmm. even realize that. Yeah. And it's just like all boiled down into one thing. And I think it's brilliant. I think it's so well written, first of all. And then, and this is why she got the actress, uh, supporting actri actress nom. I think it's so well directed. So Greta Gerwig should have got a, a nom there, I think. Um, but it's also so well acted. And I love seeing her whole speech where she, some things she's, you know, kind of like quiet about. And then other times she's like getting a yelling, like, <laughs> we're expected to do this and um, stuff like that. And this, I, I just think it's so great. Um, but I can see why some people might, be like you know it's a little on the nose it's like sure but this is very important right. and i think you're not looking at the full thing like it's directed really well acted really well but i i didn't find ken insufferable but i see why people do and he's he's definitely the antagonist i can't yeah. say that from like a story uh for like a structured perspective yeah he's definitely the antagonist um but really like it's not he's the villain of the movie. It's what we do as a society and patriarchy. I mean, they say right. it a lot in the movie. Patriarchy mm -hmm. is the main villain. And it's like, look, women are not okay because they have to try so much harder to get to levels that, you know, men just kind of ease into sometimes, you know, just look at Taylor Swift's the man, you know, it's kind yeah. of like a, yeah. a thing about that. Um, so it's, it's a real life thing, but then what this movie does is doesn't stop there and it goes, but men are also not okay. And here's yeah. why. And it talks, like you said, it talks about toxic masculinity and it says like a lot of men or a lot of people, I should say, will look at that and they'll go toxic masculinity. And then they think it's something to do with demonizing men from like a feminist perspective and then you want to crap on feminism as like a whole because you think it's like all man haiti but really it's not at least not most i think feminists are not that way right. where it's like it actually really cares about men and it wants to see men get in touch with their emotions and like look into themselves and see that they're not they're they're not all that encompasses trying to impress a woman or you know show show her how to do something or or anything like that and we can be 
together, but like separate and also important and individuals. And we can like grow separate and together and just everything. And I just love how it treats Ken's story. Yeah. To where they're both all like kind of happy at the end. The one thing that I didn't love and that I still don't love, but I kind of get why they did this is that at the end of the movie, it goes to where they, they didn't give Ken's like enough, like power in the Mm -hmm. Barbie land. They they're like, Barbie's like, I've learned we need to actually um, pay attention to the Kins and like be caring for their problems because if if we don't see them, like you know, if they're not seen, then we're gonna have these issues uh, come up with you know them feeling like they need to take over or something like that. I do understand that they're like, well you know, we'll give Ken's as much power as women have in the real world kind of a deal. I get that. And I think that makes sense why they would write it that way. But also I'm like, yeah, but you're, you're trying to be like a very progressive movie. And I think the most progressive thing you could do is have it to where there's equality in Barbie land where it's not Mm -hmm. Barbie land and it's not Ken dumb or whatever it's called. Yeah. It's both. Yeah. That's a good point. Maybe that's the sequel. I don't know. No, yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe I, I, at this point, I wouldn't be surprised if they did it. I just don't know if yeah. Greta has another one that she wants to make. Um, and that's, that's something I'll touch on in a sec. Was is just the corporate angle of it. But I do, I do see what you mean. I, I think the whole like thing where they're like, oh, we let him have one chair of the Supreme Court type deal. Um, mm-hmm. I, I honestly took that as more of like a wink, wink dig at America itself, where it's like, oh, yeah, no, women, women can do this, women can do that, but we still haven't had a woman president type deal. Like, like maybe sure. um, more of just like a meta commentary, but I mean, you make a good point. Um, but yeah, I agree with everything you said about the just the feminist angle of it. Um, the one thing that I still haven't been able to like kind of get over with it is the Mattel aspect of it, just because mm-hmm. I know it's trying so hard to be original, original, original. And the reason I think it is an adapted screenplay is not necessarily because it is adapted from something, but because it really does use the Mattel brand so True. directly in its adaptation to where I honestly think they let Mattel get away with it a little easy. Like they, they make Mattel almost like kind of silly and goofy, but not necessarily anything too bad. And they like poke fun at themselves, but it's still Will Ferrell. So you still kind of love them. And you're like, oh, Mattel, like one of those things where I think it's hard when you're making a movie that is essentially, and I think we see this with a lot of films these this year. We had Flame and Hot, Air, Blackberry, all these films come out about products. Wonka True. even. Wonka is an actual chocolate brand. Um, and I think there's o- only so far you can go before it kind of gets into the self-advertisement realm. And, and yeah. at times I was like, it's, it's a little too too obvious like when they're throwing the clothes in the air and it freezes and it's like this is this thing and this is this outfit i'm like they're trying a little hard i think to like sell toys at the end of the day which i think is the whole point the movie greta gerwig wants to make the point is that it, it's you know that's not what barbie should be about it should be about this not that and i feel like they they kind of have their they try to have their cake and eat it too that's the one element where i'm still not 100 percent sold on but i mean if that's the biggest element is that the mattel movie is a little too mattel self-indulgent i mean it's the same thing with like you know saving mr banks in disney world it's like it still makes disney look like a good guy at the end of the day like it's one yeah. of those things where when you're producing you're self-producing like i really would have liked to see what like an independent studios version of a barbie movie would be but again you couldn't get the rights if that were the case but i really would yeah. like to see if they didn't have to incorporate the mattel of it all how much stronger it could even be on its own. But I, I think that's a very minor critique. And it's one of those things where it's kind of the inevitable. And given that they had to work with it, I think she did the best she could. They did the best they could, Noah and Greta, of navigating that. But it is still one of those elements where every time I watch, I'm just like, I don't know. <laughs> but um, it's still a little commercially at times. But obviously, it's a big Warner Brothers commercial blockbuster. And it, it obviously worked because people are buying Barbie Halloween costumes and Ken Halloween costumes and toys are flying off the shelves. So it, it did its job in that regard. Um, I just I'm a little cynical about the corporate aspect of a lot of these big blockbusters nowadays, but it, it is what it is. Um, but that's and like my honestly, only big criticism, really. And honestly, like, I think that's kind of we've already talked about this a little bit. Where and I'm not definitely not saying you're wrong. I I, yeah. I totally get where you're coming from. Actually, um, it is one of those things to where it is trying to have a cake, its cake and eat it too. But it is like we've talked about it from like the thematic perspective, where we're like, you know, people want it to be like up here, where it's like 
that messaging was so poignant and, you know, like we want to use the big words. And it's like, we're not doing that. We're down here and we're totally like, this is where we want to be is down here because it's up here. Not as good. It's not as Mm -hmm. inviting to everyone. Um, If it's just the zone of interest where you have to watch it and go like, I see what they're doing here um, Mm -hmm. kind of a deal. Um, But with uh, what you're talking about, like the branding and stuff, I totally get if if someone's like, you know, why do you have to be like a Mattel commercial, like a Barbie commercial? But then I can also see like why they like steered into it where it's like it is a it's like it's a Barbie movie for people who hate Barbie is like what the trailer or whatever said. And then like I kind of see that where it's like a condemnation of Barbie and it's also a celebration of Barbie. So it's like. Yeah, you know, we'll crap on commercialism a little, but like also, I mean, it's also talks about like how movies are art, but they're also products. Like we can't get away from that. So, yeah, yeah. yeah it's like it's the inevitable. Yeah, it's it's gotta be a right. It's hard. It's hard. It's hard to navigate. So yeah. I can see like where you're coming from. I can see where other people are coming from when they critic criticize other aspects of the movie. But I I kind of love how they. Uh, merge everything i will say not every joke works for me all the time i could see maybe in another time like a lot of the will ferrell jokes don't really work um for me but some of them do and i love how they have like the whole we're literally gonna put you in a box get in this box and i just love the whole aspect of the commentary of you know putting a person in a box to say what is a woman this is a woman and it's these things that we are gender roles that we subscribe to you and it's Mm -hmm. like you know you know the commentary of uh, barbie is this and only this and then you're like well that's not a what a woman is a woman's not perfect a man's not perfect no one's perfect Uh, uh, everyone has strengths they have flaws they're real freaking people and i love how barbie goes from that perfect concept to a full-fledged woman with flaws and cellulite and everything yeah, yeah. <laughs> so good uh, yeah um yeah that's barbie i mean there's so much you could talk about with barbie but it, it really yeah. is such a special entity and i'm glad it's represented here and it does win one oscar uh which is a good one original song for what was i made for it's also nominated for seven others uh for best picture best supporting actor for ryan gosling best supporting actress for america ferrera best adapted screenplay best original song for i'm just ken best production design and best costume design um so yeah billy eilish she won her first award for no time to die and then two years later she held over she was holding over to get her second oscar um you know what else was holding over uh you know paul giamatti's left eye or was it his right eye i don't know but chad tell us about the holdovers yeah the holdovers directed by alexander payne written by david hemmingson uh cinematography by Eagle Brilled, music by Mark Orton, starring Paul Giamatti, Dominic Sessa, Divine Joy Randolph, and Carrie Preston. Synopsis, a strict teacher is forced to chaperone kids at a private school over Christmas break when they have nowhere else to go. Yeah, I'm going to let you start because I know how you feel about this movie and I I want you to to open this one, uh, Chad. I, I yeah, called, I almost called you Ken. <laughs> I almost said, oh, right. this was Chad. Ken. Uh, now I'm calling you Chad again. All right, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I I absolutely adore the holdovers. I knew I would when I like saw the trailer and I heard it was a Christmas movie, and I was like, I love all. I think that I stuff. told you. I think I told you it was a Christmas movie too because I yes, left the theater. But Chad, Christmas fiend. Sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Right. Um. Yeah, and I I absolutely love this movie. I've seen it three times now actually nice. um i've really engaged with a lot of these movies um and the holdovers just really works for me um it's not doing what oppenheimer's doing it's not doing what barbie's doing it doesn't have like these like poignant messages that are like relevant for like the time i mean i guess unless you you talk about like mental health and and stuff like that but you know really it's just a cozy little it's kind of like coda where it's like a a cozy little movie that encapsulates like just a, a little story and it is that like little indie movie that could that people went oh i i love this this is great like everything's it's so funny 
it's dramatic when it wants to be. So it's doing the American fiction thing where it's blending that very well. You're seeing real characters that you can love and grieve with, laugh with and grieve with. Um, and it's just, I love the aesthetic of it. I love movies that really capture a time period. It's a period piece of the yeah. 1970s and teachers that existed then and would remind you of teachers that you probably had. And then kids that, you know, you probably know or have known and stuff, you know, and it just like, you know, I don't know. I just, it, it's very simple. There's like, three main actors and those are basically the actors you see throughout the whole movie with like you know some actors elsewhere but like i don't know like what they were what alexander payne um and david hemmingson uh were able to accomplish with with this i, I just think is really incredible and i just love yeah. how it's, it's a it's a cozy movie that I I'm going to watch every year because it's a Christmas movie. So. Right. And, and, and that's the thing is, is Christmas kind of offers a certain comfortability, but I think we talked a lot about this on a lot of the Christmas drafts, but a lot of Christmas movies come from a place of cynicism. And I'm not saying the movie is like a negative movie, but a lot of the movies that Alexander Payne himself does deals with the comfort and coziness through cynicism, what I think is really interesting because you would think coziness and cynicism doesn't align, you know, like how can yeah. one thing be cynical, but also so sweet and comfortable and endearing. And and the thing is all these characters are, are dealing with shit. Mary's depressed because her son died. Uh, D Dominic Sessa's character, Angus is depressed because he's not with his parents on Christmas. And then Paul Giamatti's character just doesn't really give a shit. He knows he's a, he's a kind of a, you know, a, a scrooge kind of on christmas and i think that's what works so well on a christmas movie is having characters who are at a point in their lives where all hope is kind of gone there's really not a lot of hope and, and mary has a little bit of it because of the religious aspect of the film but i really think these are three characters who are kind of like not really feeling christmas they don't want to feel christmas because they're all at a point in their life where they're kind of over it and they're dealing with their own shit but through each other they're able to kind of find that connection and find what that holiday and what just being together means to them and it's what he's done with a lot of his films i mean the descendants i mean it's a very cynical film it's about a man literally trying to find the guy who his wife his dying wife cheated on him with but it's still so comfortable and cozy and maybe it's the hawaiian atmosphere same as nebraska it's a pretty cynical film about aging and how like you get all the way to nebraska only for it to be a fake contest but there's still something comfortable about it. And I think that's the magic that he's able to bring to his films is this kind of comfortability, even when life is at its shittiest. And even when you're not able to go home on Christmas or you smell like fish because of a disease you have, or this person you actually might have a connection with invites you to a Christmas party only to make out with her boyfriend behind you. Like it's all these little moments. And I think that's what makes it so relatable is because yeah. it's not, it's, it's a cozy movie, but it's not a happy, cheery movie. It's very sad. It's very grim at times, especially with what Mary's going through. It's, it rips your heart out. But mm -hmm. I think that is when movies are at their most relatable. And, and you said, like, there's not really a message. I don't think there has to necessarily be a message. It could just be how do you or how are you able to connect your world with these characters? And maybe the message is just kind of existence you know like the message is that everyone goes through shit and the message is that you can find people to just surround yourself with to have that kind of sense of comfort it doesn't necessarily have to be about like changing the world necessarily but some movies are more personalized i mean there's a lot of films coming up that we'll talk about where you know the actual stakes of the film really only affect the people in the film it's it's not like the end of the world as some of these other films stakes are but because these stakes are so personal i honestly think it's even easier to engage in a film like this than something that is dealing with something so grand as genocide or uh, you know war you know i think that's that's what makes these movies so digestible and why this is such a crowd pleaser and why i know he keeps saying it's not cozy it's not comfortable you're getting it wrong you're getting it wrong but i think they can coexist and i, I think it's one of those things that we were talking about with David Lynch. It's like, let, let the audience decide, sir. Um, don't, don't, uh, you know, I'm not trying to let all my feelings toward Alexander Payne kind of creep into this review, but it's like, it's your movie. You made it. Now let us kind of take away what we want to take away from it. And it's one of those things where I think you and I both have taken away something so comforting and cozy and special from this film that maybe wasn't intended by the filmmaker, but because this filmmaker just makes films that resonate with people, this, these are the themes people are taking away from it. And if I were him, I would be very happy to see this. I'd be like, wow, this is a very interesting response to this movie that people are having that I really like. I like that this movie is serving this purpose for people because so many people feel alone during the holidays. And I think that's really what this is getting at is, is, 
no matter what circumstance you're in in your life, the holidays are a point of reflection or a point of, you know, kind of assessment and, and kind of trying to find those who will, you know, be there for you and, and remind yourself of the good you're able to surround yourself with. And some people that, that is hard to find um, as it is for these characters, but ultimately I think there is something for all of us to find around this time of year. And it's why Christmas movies themselves are so rewatchable and so lovable and why we talked about when it's a wonderful life. It's, it's a very similar thing. You're at your lowest point in the holidays, but it can also become your highest point based on the people you're with. I don't know. I've gone on a long time about this, but I, I don't know if you have anything to say about that, but um, yeah, I love well, it. It's great. Well, yeah. I mean, it's one of those things where we kind of had a, a similar conversation back in December when we talked about the right. apartment. And oh yeah. That too. That too. Yeah. Cause like we had a very similar thing where it's like people experience the holidays different, you know, there is cynicism in the holidays, but there's also bright, happy, fun stuff. And, you know, the, if you're down in the dumps, you might look at it and go, Ugh. but if you're happy, you might go, I love this stuff and kind of a deal. And yeah. And I think there's a lot you can experience with this movie. That's a little bit of both. Yeah. Um, you know, if I had to kind of boil down a theme, from the movie i would kind of kind of say like what it is about like uh like a like a sad person over the holidays who, who's maybe going through stuff and it's like well the holidays are not cheery for me because i'm going through something which everyone does especially yeah. around like around that time when you're summing up the year and you're like a lot of shitty stuff happened um but i think like the kind of the key key thing is is uh, don't give up because you have so many characters there's the three characters who <laughs> just want to give up because you have Mary Lamb who is just so heartbroken, but also pissed off because, you know, you have all of these, like, this is what the movie's saying a lot of the time. So you have all these like rich entitled assholes that just basically get a leg up in life because of who their parents are, they have money or they buy the school something and they're expected to just get a free ride and coast through life. Whereas one of the good ones, her son, who actually had to scrape together and somehow get into the school, somehow try to scrape enough money to get to college. And they might have to go to war and they can't avoid war, but you can still have that hope for college and then the hope smacks down and then yeah. now he's dead and then she loses all hope and she's like this i'm staying at the place that i i last spoke to him i last had a had a relationship with him and I, that's why i can't leave this place and that's why i'll just yeah. always live here maybe even die here which is very sad but also yeah. you know, kind of touching that you can have a connection like that with someone and then you have dominic sess's character uh, angus who you know, is giving up on kind of life in a way because, you know, you, you see his his dad is th the way he is and he feels like his parents have given up on his dad and then he doesn't want to give up on his dad, but then he's giving up on himself because he's like having that self-fulfilling prophecy where he's like, you know, the world is basically giving up on me, so I might as well give up on myself. I'm going to end up like my dad which is very scary to see something happen to your parent and realize genes happen or a thing. Mm -hmm. And then you're like, is that going to happen to me? Yeah. And my, you know, my mom doesn't care about me anymore. She thinks I'm probably going to end up like that. And, you know, and he's having so much inner turmoil. And then you have, uh, Paul, his name's Paul. In the yeah, movie. I love that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it must, must have been easy to stay in character, you know? <laughs> right. Um, you have Paul who uh, is, is just given up on life. Even if he doesn't realize it, he's given up on life because he had like an incident and then now he's a, a teacher in school. It's almost kind of like, well, he doesn't turn out like this. It's almost like Walter White where you're like, uh, just like a teacher. You're like, I'm, yeah. I failed. Not That'd that be an interesting movie. <laughs> <laughs> right? Him and Tom started to like, make drugs out of a van. <laughs> Merry Christmas. <laughs> Merry Christmas. <laughs> Up Not in smoke, that. down the chimney. Oh. God. <laughs> not that um not that being being a teacher means that you've given up or anything like that but this one teacher uh wants more out of life and all he does is just yeah. teach 
and he's not a, uh, he's good at it, but he's not good at it because he fails to engage people. Everyone yeah, hates well, and him. Kids don't like him. Yeah, yeah. He's I, I like wouldn't. Him. Yeah, he's a knowledgeable guy, but is he a good teacher? Is he a good leader? Not really. Yes, exactly. Not and a good like, role model. And like you said, he knows this and he's accepted this, but like he's accepted it in a way where it's defeat. It's not like he's embracing the. This is the best way to teach these kids. He might believe that, but then at the end of the day, when Angus kind of like makes him realize, like, look, you could actually be a good teacher. Just explain it to them on their level. Use some some uh, what, what is it? Candy cane. Use some some pornography or something that the kids would understand. I'm not saying show your students pornography, right. no. but I'm saying please do not do that. Please don't do that. <laughs> But watch the movie if you want to see that in context of the movie. Yeah, yeah. you'll You'll know know what I'm talking about. Um, But yeah, even Angus uh, teaches Paul that, you know, and Angus and Mary teach Paul, you know, like Mary gives him the the, the book to write his uh, his book in. And Angus gives him the idea to go write a book, go do something that you want to do. Don't just give up and just sit around and. You know, the line that I wrote down was, I could have been spending the rest of my vacation reading mystery novels. And I'm sitting there like, Paul, you asshole, you could do that anyways. And everybody yeah. probably would love that you're just reading mystery novels instead of yeah. making them study over Christmas. Um, yeah, anyway, sorry, I could talk about this movie so much. No, you know, and it's great. And it's clear the love that we both have for this movie. And I will admit... Yeah. This is one of those movies where I think the first time nothing can capture quite the magic of when I saw it. Because it was one of those things, you talk about the vibe and the aesthetic, and I think it's so yeah. important. I, I saw this on a theater, in a theater, on a very cold day. I was in the back row. It was it, There was a little bit of a draft coming in through the, the door, and it was a little chilly. But it just was the perfect marriage of everything going on and the old time aesthetic i was almost transported to the 70s in winter or whatever yeah. we're watching it at home it just it, it isn't quite as as the, the magic of, of that first time isn't quite as there for me but it is still a great experience because just the movie's so well written characters are so enjoyable but like nothing for me tops that first experience to where like there are some movies that i liked more on repeat this was not one of them but it doesn't mean i like this less than the other films it just means that nothing can top that first time um but i really just yeah that the aesthetics are so good um whitney seibold a critic we're both fans of uh described this best when talking about the production design of oppenheimer but i think it applies for this too you can like almost smell the eraser you almost can envision the smell of eraser shavings in those old classrooms like it's one of those films that just you can you can feel taste hear smell it's such a sensory experience because of how stylized it is. And I think that's one thing that's really underrated about this film is the style. It's not made for best editing. And I know a lot of people are like, what? But like, it really is so masterfully edited because there is so much comedy, like you said, and it has to toe that line between comedy and drama so well. And I think this does an even better job than American fiction at that in terms of like weaving in and out of it. I mean, there are scenes like the party scene where you're getting so much different comedy and drama layered throughout with like, you know, Angus is hooking up with this girl while Paul is, is, trying on this other woman only to realize she's with someone else only for divine joy randolph to be like completely a mess at the party after being you know in a very upbeat spirit her being probably the most positive going into the night like it's one of those things where that that scene that's my favorite scene in the movie just because it kind of just encompasses the whole arc of these characters in one kind of central setting um and and what i really like about this movie is that the characters don't really get what they want her mary doesn't get her son back paul loses his job and Angus doesn't get to reunite with his father. None of them get what they want, but they get what they need. And I think that's what's okay. important. Okay, I was, I was going to disagree with you. And no, because you... Mar- Mary doesn't get her son back. Paul doesn't have his job, and Angus doesn't no. have his father. Like, it's, no, 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 it's, no. they don't get what they set forth in the movie. Like, that's their objectives. The whole movie is is that, and they don't no, get no, no, it. No. You know? I, what I'm saying is I was going to disagree with you until you said, but they get what they need. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, they do. No, you're absolutely one hundred percent correct. It's that optimist first realist thing of like, you know, you're not always going to get what you wanted, but you'll get everything will turn out right in the end, kind of deal. Um, even if it's not necessarily as you imagined it, like, you know, because yeah. truth be told, it, that these characters end in in very interesting places. Like, if a character, if you told me like, oh, the main character loses his job at the end, it's such a great happy ending. You'd be like, right. what? <laughs> you know, but it is, and, you know, it's right. kind of like the, the poet society thing of like, there's some weird element of hope regardless you know yeah i mean i'm glad it didn't 
it feels very dead poet society but i'm glad it didn't have as dark of an ending as that movie does um but yeah just touching on a couple things that you said um is that uh you know yeah just the what the the editing of the movie and just the style um I love the style because um, it, it does really like you talk about like, you know, I, I totally get like the first time watching and the high of that and the setting was perfectly right and stuff. And I don't think it's like a theater versus home experience type of thing. I think it was just that first time and the, the conditions were perfect. Um, mm-hmm. And I think you can totally get that at home. And I think this might actually could be a better home movie because it's so cozy and you're, you're not going to be, I don't think for most people as cozy in a movie theater with around other people, uh, strangers as you are at home, like with your family and stuff, watching the holdovers. Um, Mm -hmm. but the vibe of the movie, I think is why I adore it so much because it has the other thing that I love in movies. It has like, just like really great needle drops and yeah, like, the music is so good in this. Yeah, start, starts playing like Cat Stevens, and I'm like, that's the mm-hmm. perfect choice for the vibe of this movie. And I'm which is like, another Alexander Payne train mark because the the music in all his movies, like the Descendants, with all those like ukulele Hawaiian themes too. Like, yeah. I mean, I I talked we talked to it on 2011. Like that is one of my favorite films. Period. Oh, yeah. Um, so I I was very excited for this because you know say what you will about him, but his movies are always stick with me. I love his movies, so I, I'm really happy that this is another good one and a hit of his because i know was it his last one that wasn't well acclaimed like downsizing was that him um i don't think that was well that was acclaimed. The, that might have been the last one yeah and yeah that so so i think that's one of those things where people were wondering and they're like well does he have it again especially with all the stuff he went through personally like is he is he are we just kind of over it but then they're like no no he has the juice still um and and it's yeah. also another writer which i think helps and it's a first screenplay which i think is wild uh this is a the, this Dude. guy's first screenplay so yeah that's yeah, really impressive it, yeah. it's like yeah it's like him like ari aster like i'm so impressed about people that like just come out of the gate with something amazing and like speaking of the screenplay i read i read most of this i didn't finish it but i was sitting there like there's some like just like great like jokes that um <laughs> There's just some like jokes that like unfurl that I just I didn't necessarily get like on first watch, but like reading the screenplay, I'm like, oh my god, like how they set that up. Like I love mm-hmm. the joke where he's talking to the biggest asshole in the movie who basically learns nothing. He's stupid. He's entitled. He insults Mary, so he is going to hell, uh, basically. Um, yeah, but don't fuck with Mary. Don't do not fuck with Mary. Picture this. No, this do not fuck with Mary. But uh, well, honestly, the attitude that that kid has, the entitled attitude, like I know she's sad, but she has a job to do. She should do it well, right? That whole thing. I've heard people say that in real life, stuff like that, and I'm like, yep, those people exist. Um, mm-hmm. But like setting up certain things, like where that kid is like, the reason why I'm holding over is because my family is renovating their house. And they decided to store all their tools in my room. And they had this whole fight. And at the very end, like him him and Angus have this whole fight. And it ends with them actually fighting. But the reason they end up fighting is (laughs) because Angus ends it with the only tool in your room is you. (laughs) Yeah. No, it's great. Yeah. Oh, that's so funny. The Um, the jokes in this movie. Dominic Sessa, the way he just like. Just like, like, yeah, of course it was a metaphor. What do you think you're? Uh, what, yeah. what do you think you're actually going to wash your hands? <laughs> which is also a first time performance, which is amazing. <laughs> so um, I, I can't believe it. Yeah, you know, like that's what's so amazing about this film too is like there's just such a genuine nature to it too. It's like not trying hard for the tears or for the laughs. I mean, it might be trying a little hard for the laughs. You know, the scene where he breaks his arm, but like I do think or sprains or dislocates whatever. But I, I do think because he's giving a first time performance and Paul Giamatti and Dave and Joy Randolph are just so genuine and honest. Like you just get such a genuine feel from it. Like there's really not a lot that feels fabricated or false. And like, except for his eye, um, which is fun. Right. But like, I, I do think it, it's just so honest, which is so important. Which, which one am I supposed to look into? I think it's that one, but then I think <laughs> it's wrong. Right. And, it's and every wrong. scene and every scene they would switch it. So it, it's so funny. It's this one. Um, Oh shoot! No, I had I had some. Oh yeah, <clears throat> like how we talked about Barbie and how Barbie were like a lot of this is on the nose, like, and then some of it's not. Like when you have like the deep references she has to like 
film and stuff. Mm-hmm. But like with the holdovers, I'm like reading the screenplay and then I'm like, what the hell did they just reference? And it's like Paul Paul's character referencing something that only like a stuck up teacher would know. Right. And then like very well and, researched. Yeah. And then the, I'm like the they reading. Yeah, and I'm like reading the screenplay and then Googling what the hell are they talking about? And then like it's it's funny because in the screenplay you'll have Paul uh reference something. It's almost it's it was the scene where he jumps on into the gym and hurts himself. Okay. He references something and then uh Angus speaks in Latin and then does the thing where he jumps into the gym and hurts himself. And in the screenplay, it's like I'm like reading it, and I'm like, oh, this this whole back and forth with them that I don't understand because I'm not a student of his. But Angus would totally understand um, because he is a student of his. Yeah. And it's like you know, uh, the the screenplay was like, and Paul ap- appreciates or respects, even though he hates what Angus is doing right now. He respects that he listened to him in class or whatever. And that, that reference, that back and forth that they had. And the movie just feels so lived in. And I think yeah. that's a very pro. And that's yeah. why it's so cozy, like we've been saying. That's why it's so comforting. And that's why we want to live in that world because it's so different from everything else yeah. that was been nominated and yeah. stuff. It's and just, it's the most familiar world, which is which is odd because usually you would think, oh, I want to live in the world of Pandora or of uh, you Barbie know, Land. Uh, well, Barbie Land, yeah, exactly. Like, no, but we want to live where these characters are because they're familiar <laughs> and comfortable, and um, it's just very cozy. Yeah, it's very cozy. I don't care what you say, Alexander Payne. It's very cozy. Um, but yeah, it, it's a really great <laughs> film. I, I'm glad you're. It's your. Or as far as I remember, your favorite of the year. We'll see. Um, we'll see. Um, <laughs> but uh, I am glad you enjoy it so much because I do too. Um, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about it later for sure. Um, Holdover is nominated for five awards, wins one for Best Supporting Actress for Dave Vine, Joy Randolph. Good win for her. Um, nominated for Best Picture, Best Actor for Paul Giamatti, Best Original Screenplay, and Best Film Editing. Um, yeah, no, this movie's really killer. Um, it, it's, <laughs> it's killer as a flower moon. It's hard to transition from like a, a wholesome uh, Christmas, uh, yeah, a Christmas movie to like genocide of. In, oh yeah indigenous people but yeah. um yeah it's a killer movie killers of flower moon let's just talk about it killers of flower moon yep it's a killer movie killers of the flower moon directed by martin scorsese written by martin scorsese and eric roth cinematography by rodrigo prieto music by robbie robertson starring Le- Le- leonardo dicaprio uh, sorry, I stumbled on that name for some reason. Robert De Niro, <laughs> Lily Gladstone. I didn't really. It was a joke. Jesse Plemons, oh. <laughs> Tantu Cardinal, John Lithgow, Lithgow, Brendan Fr- Fraser. Sorry, Fraser. Fraser. Car- Actually, you have Cara- to say it like this. Brendan Fraser. You got to say it like he does in the movie. <laughs> All he his line deliveries. There. He does I'm that. gonna speak now. <laughs> He does that in like bedazzled. That's kind of a thing he does sometimes. Is yeah. It? Um I need to watch more Brendan Fraser. I'm doing a bit and I'll I'll stop. Kara okay. Jade Myers, Jason Isbell, uh Tatanka Means, Sturgill Simpson, Jack White, and Martin Scorsese. Yeah. Is, is in this. Uh he's in it and he's I would argue one of the best parts of it. Um, not not to say the others aren't, but I mean that ending is I love it so much. But um, we, we can't talk about the ending without talking about the three out three hours and however many minutes yeah. comes before it. Um, you well, did I allude. Didn't, I didn't oh, say the synopsis yet. Oh yeah, let's talk about the synopsis. Yeah. That's also you're important. Not, <laughs> Sorry, you got so excited about Martin Scorsese. I know. I just I love him. <laughs> synopsis: The story of the Osage. I can't smile. While I say this: The story of the Osage murders, which occurred after oil was discovered on tribal land based on killers of the flower moon by David Grant. Yeah. Go ahead, Bill. Um, no, I was just <laughs> going to say, I, I know we've talked about him uh, pretty frequently on the show. We covered Wolf of Wall Street. We covered Hugo. We covered Raging Bull and we covered gangs in New York. I think that's the only four we've covered so far. There's going to be more. Um, obviously we're going to cover, Oh no, we covered Goodfellas as well. So this is a six film we're covering of his. Um, so by now we've kind oh, of yeah. established our overall opinions of him. And I think to our recurring listeners, we know that Chad is not as big a fan of him as I am, mm-hmm. but 
there have been films that you like more than I do, like Hugo, you like a lot more than me. Um, but then there are films that I like a lot more than you. Uh, so uh, of his, like Wolf of Wall Street. So I think it's very interesting yeah. watching this one because this is one where you did allude to there being one film in the slate that you don't love. And I figured it might've been this one just because of how you think about Martin Scorsese, but I might be wrong. Um, but I know a lot of people have been very, I mean, this is a very divisive one because of the obvious. It's a white man making a story about indigenous people. Um, and, you know, the, the central figurehead of the film being Leonardo DiCaprio more so than Lily Gladstone, even though she does get nominated and all this stuff. But, but that's why a lot of the controversy is stemming, um, yeah. which I have a rebuttal for, um, as I usually do. But mm. I think a lot of people are also complaining about the length and, and the idea that, oh, it's so long, it's so long, it's so long. But I, I don't know. I, I feel like it's only a little longer than Oppenheimer, only a little longer than Poor Things, oh, yeah. only a little longer than Anatomy of a Fall. Mm. Like those three movies are all three hours, uh, give or take. I mean, if, if you take a bathroom break for Poor Things, you're hitting three hours. You know, and it's Anatomy one of those is two and a half, I think. Two and but a yeah. half. But still, I mean, those are long. Two and a half is still yeah. a long movie. That's a oh, long time to sit. There's only really one movie here that you watch and it's like, oh, that was short. And that's like poor, uh, past lives, you know? So I really do think, you know, I, I, I see the arguments of length and stuff but it's also like it's martin scorsese and he does epics and you know i i just i i think there's a lot more than just the criticisms to talk about though we can talk about the criticisms but i want to turn it over to you first because i i had a suspicion this might be the one that you're not as high on but i might be wrong um so i'd love to know uh chad uh what do you think of killers of Moon? yeah you're wrong um I, i'm I actually, wrong oh shit i really like killers of the flower moon and you know um, i was so, i was reading into a tweet i, I posted a tweet of my, myself watching this movie with my dog and and <laughs> chad was like oh it's boring isn't it or something along the lines of that no, like, oh, I, you look I, bored is that an indication of the film i'm like wow he hates this movie okay so now i'm in a weird i, I was ready to just like come defend this movie um with all my uh, life. but now now I, I don't know maybe chad has to defend it to me um, because I still have problems with it, but I, I would love to know, Chad, what, what are your thoughts yeah, on this one then? I actually would like to know, know your problems, but it, it is one where it is so long that it's kind of hard to parse out stuff sometimes where you're just like that part that happened so long ago. What happened? Uh, no. <laughs> it's like, but no, I, I actually have normally a big criticism of like Martin Scorsese and the length of his films, the considerable length of his films where, um, you know, people, a lot, and it's not just me, but other people have been saying like, you know, with Thelma, uh, Sh Shoemaker. Yeah. Shoemaker, um, Schoonmakers, Shoemaker. Schoonmaker. Uh, sorry about pr the pronunciation, but, Thelma. um, Thelma. she's like, she's a big editor for not, not just his movies, but like most, a lot of his movies she does or all of them. Um, and then because they have such a great working relationship, it's kind of a marriage of the two, but then you look at it and you go, I know we'll have this conversation when we get to the Irishman year. Um, but I know so, there's a lot of people who go, you might say that the length of that one's perfect or, or works for the movie. And then other people will go, it's a tad long. You don't need this or this or this. <laughs> and maybe Thelma could have did a better job of cutting out a couple things. And then I, for me, I'm just sitting there like, why does every Martin Scorsese movie have to be like three and a half hours long? Like, I think that might actually make because people say that Martin Scorsese, like one of the greatest filmmaker living filmmakers. And then I'm just like, maybe in some respects, but then honestly, I feel like if you don't know how to pace your movie and cut it down to where it should be like, like if every movie you're making is over three hours long, it might just be an issue you have where you don't know how to rein yourself in. And a lot of people I think feel that way about killers of the flower moon. But for me, I think this time it actually works for the movie where I'm like, I look at the length and I'm like, you know what? Like this is like a long calculated con that these people are doing they're rooting themselves in they're marrying a lot of osage people and then they're like you know i'm gonna get you to trust me and then when i give you something to you know uh for medicine you're not even gonna question it you're just gonna take it and it might be poison um or you know i might get you to trust me and then i'm gonna shoot you in the head and i'm going to take all your money 
And it's just a long con for these people to just take all their money because they don't deserve it. They they don't deserve it because they're they're lesser and they're, you know, just not us kind of a deal. Mm -hmm. Like, why should they have the money when it belongs to us? That kind of like entitlements and racism that is yeah. embedded in this movie. And honestly, I think I love the the pacing of the movie because it's so slow, but I think that is exactly what happened to these people. Or these it was slow, gradual, yeah. Gradual long cons that happen to these people that once they figure out what's happening to them, like a systematic level or s systemic level, uh, by these people that they kind of trust in a way, um, it's too late. And I feel mm -hmm. like the pacing of the movie really sells that. If it would have been quick and yeah, 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 get it. You know, like this happens yeah. and that happens. I feel like it would have been a very different movie. And so, yeah, I don't know. I never yeah. thought I would be defending his runtime, but I am. I, 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 I think this is the biggest surprise I've had on the show. Not because like <laughs> you're a hater of him, but like, I feel like every time we talk about it, that comes up, you know, him, that comes up. And I feel like for it to be your main talking point of why you like this film is so amazing. But I agree. I, I think also there's a rep repetition to it that I think some people may say is too repetitive, but that's, the thing is it was a pattern and it's yeah. almost sad that they didn't pick up on this pattern and that they didn't realize who was doing it. And even if they knew who was doing it, they didn't really know how to stop it. It's, it's like watching, it's like watching a, a train crash, but it's, it's on slow-mo because it, it's almost delaying the inevitable so much to where you, the audience are tense and you're like, Oh my God, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? Oh my God. Like, I can't believe I'm seeing this. How are they not seeing this type deal? Yeah. I, I totally agree with you on that. I, I do think, um, the one element that I am in the minority of, I know that I don't love so much is honestly, I think Leonardo DiCaprio is great. He does a good job in this film, but part of me wonders how much better it would be if they sold the charm of him a little bit more, because I think the whole thing is that like Lily Gladstone is portrayed to be such a smart character, but from the very beginning, there's just something about Leonardo DiCaprio that comes across as a little sketchy his character. And I think Robert De Niro does such a better job about playing the cool, calm, collected, like everyone loves me. I'm shaking hands. I'm, I'm one for the people. He's so relatable. And so, um, endearing, which makes him all the scarier. Whereas I feel like from the beginning, Leo is just a little more like, um, he's a little bit more of a bumpkin. He's, he's, he's got a little bit more of a, not an edge to him, but it's a little bit more of like a, a pathetic nature to him where I think if they had made him more of like this kind of, almost like a Jordan Belfort where it's like, you're, you're almost, you know, kind of masked by this charm the way Robert De Niro is. I think it would have sold the idea of her falling in love with him and falling for him and being blinded by him. Whereas when I watched it the second time, especially I was like, how is she not picking up on this very early on? Like, cause I don't think we love Leo enough to understand why Lily Gladstone's character loves Leo enough in this movie to where I think there's less of a betrayal because of it, but it's also might be because we know Martin Scorsese does crime so well that we expect that he's going to have this villainous turn to where maybe he, he was charming and maybe I just was looking into it as, oh, he's obviously behind this. He's obviously evil. But then I see Robert De Niro doing it really well where he's like so charismatic. And I think it makes it even scarier when he is then kind of making all these deals behind the scenes. I think Robert De Niro, this is the best performance he's given since maybe Taxi Driver. I think he's so good in this. Um, so that, that's my only thing is I think because Leo's such a central figure, I think I would have liked to see more of that push and pull of the romance of us really as the audience being like, but they are so such a good couple. Whereas I never once was like, I am so on board with this romance. So it was never necessarily hard at the end when she does leave him. Um, but again, maybe that's not what Martin Scorsese wanted to tell. Maybe he didn't want you, the audience to like Leo at all. But I do think there's something to be said about the fact that she gets into this relationship and so much of it, the tension and the conflict is built on their love that I would have loved to see maybe something more in terms of a spark between the two of them to kind of understand why she does stick with it for so long and why she is blinded by him but maybe the whole thing is that she's not blinded by him and she knew all along she just didn't know how to go about it so i think there's a lot of avenues and i don't think this is necessarily a huge criticism it's just the one element of the film that i think could have been stronger is the romance because then it would have made all the backstabbing and betrayal hurt even more for the audience i think if we had been lulled into this false sense of security but again when you're playing with so many people's lives and such a rich very 
delicate part of history, maybe you don't want to make this false sense of security because you don't want to kind of play with people's emotions because it is such a raw and real thing. So I'm very conflicted, but I do think it is what you said about the pacing and it being this long brewing building tension. I, I think you nailed that, um, which is so important. And, and I think it's really underrated, especially when she's sick, because you can really feel the illness kind of take over as she's kind of succumbing to this and getting sicker and sicker. And when she sees the owl in her doorway and you're like, Oh my God, is she going to die? Like that stuff is so good because it, it's getting, it's, it's earned from the build and the runtime of it. But that was just my only real criticism is that I don't necessarily buy the romance as much, but I, I don't know. Maybe I'm just, maybe because I knew for all along that Leo was going to be part of it and, and, you know, kind of not that we should be rooting for him. Maybe I just was more reading into the behind the scenes of it, knowing what the premise of the movie was. I don't know. Um, but I do really like it. Like this isn't me saying the movie's bad, you know, because we both clearly like it a lot. So that, that, I mean, that's one of the things um, with film analysis and criticism is that like, sometimes you ask questions. I mean, you're supposed to ask questions about the movie. Like, does this work and like actually engage with the movie and just go, could it have been better if Leo's character was a little different? Would I have liked that movie any better? Maybe right. you, you see that movie in your mind and then you go, no, that's not actually better. But asking yeah, right. yeah. is yeah. the important thing. Maybe it is. I don't know. But I have heard people try and go like, what if this was more of like a like a thriller? Like it's shorter and it's like because it is a thriller, but if it's more of like it's shorter and it's more like more suspense thriller, like yeah, pace, like, pace, action thriller almost. Yeah, yeah, um, where you kind of have that thing to where like he's playing dumb or he's playing charming, and then later you see just how evil Leo really is. Honestly, I just don't. I don't think that's what the movie's trying to do. And I kind of looked at it from the perspective of like, he's just dumb and he's mm. just, he's dumb and he's going along with what he thinks he should go along with, but he also doesn't really always understand what's going on and what people are actually doing. And, um, and I don't, I, I, I think about it uh, like that. It's an interesting way to think about it. Like, do I buy the relationship between, leo and lily in the movie and it's almost kind of like well i don't think all relationships are all romances are kind of like that where it's like this meet cute rom-com right. type of thing where he charmed her in like mm -hmm. a bar or something like that and yeah. she's like oh my god we get, a, we get a little bit of that with him driving her a little bit like when he's yeah. driving her around but but again it, it doesn't feel like like i just feel like she's such a smart character that she would have picked up on it <laughs> sooner but maybe she has and that's the whole thing is that she just can't speak out because they have no power you know exactly and i would also i would also say that like it's kind of like that's kind of the thing is like we think like that like a, a smart person would be able to get at it like any situation but if like you're deeply embedded into like a, you know culture it's kind of like we know there's uh people who are osage or other uh, native american who were very smart Mm -hmm. but they were still entrenched in this like position that they were put into by other more menacing people. Right. And kind of like what I look into, like that relationship is almost like, this is just kind of like what we, what, what happens, what, what, what we do. And she kind of just like fell into this relationship with him and she settled and she's like, you know, he's a nice, handsome, you know, guy, you know, kind of a deal. And he obviously likes me. So, Sure, let's give it a try. And it worked out for her for a, a while, so she thought. And I kind of like Leo's character, though, because it's like, I don't like him as like a person, obviously, right, right. because of what he did. But I like how they did his character because he is kind of so, he's culpable in everything that's happening because of what he's doing and who he's involved with. But he's also very dumb and very, you know, just so aloof in a way uh that it's just like he can't help himself so it's it's one of those questions where you as the audience go does he know yeah that what he's giving her is poison or does he actually think it's insulin yeah. right. and then you go to the end of the movie where she actually like kind of asks him like that question like like do, do you know 
what what's going on or he at one point he like po- like do, he like does he drink the poison i don't remember and he's like he like tests it himself on himself and then i'm like is he is he questioning it there like does he right. know what's even going on he knows yeah. he's helping this person he knows they've killed people he's killed people he's had range for people to be killed so he's yeah. done terrible things but I don't even know if he knows he's hurting her because even in the end he like goes against Robert or Robert Downey Jr. He goes against Robert De Niro, right? Um, to say no, I'm gonna protect my family. So in some way he loves his family, right? But he's also harming his family and like his daughter yeah. dies and making his yeah. It's a very fascinating life. character. You said it best. Like yeah. you don't like his character. For what he does but you like the way it's written and what like the way it's carried out it's hard to say like the character but yeah i know i agree with you um no it's a very good point i think that's why this movie is so good and, and so rich and why it has to be so dense because there's a lot going on mm-hmm. um and it can't be as cut and dry and i think if it is more cut and dry it's not as impactful um and and that's why i think we both have differing views because it is so not ambiguous but there is so much layering to it yeah. that like i think we all are kind of great figuring point. out which layer where we've hit with our shovels as we dig below um but <laughs> yeah. i don't know <laughs> this is my metaphor what i want to talk about really quickly though is the whole like white gaze of it all because i do think uh-huh. that has been a big criticism and why i think that last scene is so perfect is because it literally is martin scorsese at his most vulnerable he never puts himself in his movies at least never speaking in them really he right. usually maybe a cameo or something but he's coming Back forward yeah. and literally coming forward and literally saying this story has not been told properly in terms of like in general, in history, we do not know about these murders. The murders are not mentioned, all this stuff. We need to basically keep this story alive and keep it spoken. And I think that's his own way of confronting the fact that so many people did say, why are you telling it? Because no one's told it. And I think that's the whole thing is he's not trying to say this is the right way to tell it. And this is the optimum way to get, receive this information, but it is a way to receive this information for other people to tell it better than I can. And I think that's such a bold take and such a really brave thing of him to do too because he doesn't have to end it that way he can end it with her leaving him and then they have that last wajaje song that gets nominated for the oscar which is very great and that's it but he has this whole little like reenactment thing at the end with jack white and with himself because i think he wants to make it known that he is merely just telling the story and that there's still so much more to it that he cannot share because he doesn't have that experience and that we have to also listen to the authentic voices who tell it and i think that's so awesome and and that is one of those things where he can say i'm proud of what i made and i stand by it and i should be able to tell this story but i also know there's other voices who can relate even more than i can and that things that i will never understand as a filmmaker and that is so bold and so brave so i just want to say like that is one of the best endings of his career because i really think it gets to the crux of all the criticisms but also his ethos as a filmmaker in telling these stories and not necessarily knowing if he's the right person but still having this desire and this love for the story to tell it to where it's like there is no right or wrong person to tell a story at all i mean maybe there's a rare exception here and there but i really think there are better people to tell it or more authentic voices, but I, I think anyone can tell a story as long as they have the passion for it. And it's about how you acknowledge your own place as a storyteller in it all. That is just so cool. And and that ending, I just, I love that ending so, so, so much. Um, do you like the end, the ending? Do you think it's a little weird? Do you, do you love it? Oh, it's very weird, but yeah, you know, I agree with <laughs> I everything it. you said. It's so weird, and I just had this thought. It's so weird in the way that it kind of feels like a Wes Anderson ending. Yeah. Where everyone's like, to, like instead of like t- showing the rest of Molly's life, we're like telling you how how Molly died and, and stuff like that. And it's like through like people like Jack White coming out and like saying it into a microphone and just acting and doing like little musical thing is like i'm like the ending of uh killers of the flower moon is the same as the wonderful story of henry sugar it's like the way yeah, it's told yeah. is very similar mm-hmm. um and very weird but also so important like you're saying because that is a big criticism that people had and it's like well when you get to the end of the movie do you not respect them like a little bit where you're just like you're actually like taking responsibility for saying that as great of a filmmaker as i am martin scorsese you know uh i there's other people that could probably tell this better because they have a lived experience they might have like stories 
like from their tribe or, or from their parents that I never heard because I'm a white filmmaker adapting a book, I believe, written by a white man about um, the, the Osage. Oh, my God. Sorry. The Osage uh, people. And it's like uh, one day, because right now we're not there. We're seeing Native American people um, start to come into filmmaking and actually get their voices out there. And we're seeing these projects happen, but we're not seeing enough of them. That's a big criticism is why does this white man have to tell the story? Like you said, because it needs to be told. And right now we're not at a place where an Osage person or a Native American person can make a movie like Killers of the Flower Moon, like mm -hmm. Martin Scorsese can. They they can, they just don't have the resources to make it. That's show. what I mean. Like you could, yeah, I mean. yeah. No, I know what you're trying to say. I'm just clarifying because it's Thank it's you. like one of those things where you can you can write a script, but like, is Hollywood going to greenlight a script from this person who is indigenous, or are they going to greenlight Martin? And I think that's his overall yeah. frustration about it too, and and why it is such yeah. a somber thing when he says their stories were never told or whatever. Like, like that's, it's almost like a, oh, you've got to be kidding me. Like why? You know, it's, it's, he's, he's questioning it. Like we're having these questions. He's having the questions too. Why is it, this not being told? It's almost, it's almost, it's so interesting because it's like the art reflecting real life where we look at like Barbie and we're like, I'm sorry. We look at Barbie <laughs> and we're like um, the feminism of Barbie. And it's such an important message look what happened to Margot Robbie and Greta Gerwig at the Oscars. And it's almost like people are like, did you understand the point of the movie? Right. And then it's Which, like, well, yeah. that's why the movie is so important. Right. And the Which they did, here, they did get nominated, just not in the categories people thought they would. So Correct. Correct. She correct. got Margot Robbie got a Producer, producing nom and Greta yeah. Gerwig for writing. But yeah, I know what you're saying. I know what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. And um, for Killers of the Flower Moon, it's like, He's 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 having his cake and is eating it too, where he's like, I'm making this movie as a white man to tell the story, but then I'm gonna point out that you know a different filmmaker could make it better, probably. And we've seen that happen in real life where you look at a lot of movies about slavery made by white filmmakers, and a lot of them are really good, but then you look at um Steve McQueen's 12 Years a Slave. And you're like, that might be the most realistic yeah. one I've seen because it's made by a black filmmaker. So they have a different perspective. And right. one day we'll get that movie that's so good. And it's made by a Native American uh, filmmaker and who has the resources to do it. And we're waiting on that progress to happen. Mm -hmm. but It's just we're not there yet, unfortunately. Yeah. I, I brought up a director when we were talking about Barbie in terms of the style, but Max Ophuls, who was actually, uh, I did a March Madness on my on the Facebook page for the Dill Pickle Movie Network. Go check it out. He was in the first round. He lost to Billy Wilder in the first round. So like he was going up against tough competition. But his whole thing was in the 50s, there weren't women directors and he wanted to tell stories about women in the respectful ways. Yeah. And he made the, the movie, the earrings of Madam day. And he made a bunch of other films, La Ronde, uh, like all these films that a lot of them were dealing with women point of views, which was very rare at the time. And I think it's one of those things where at the time there might've been women who were like, well, you're just a guy telling the story, but it opened the door for now Greta Gerwig decades later, later oh, yeah. to tell a Barbie story. Whereas I do think this is going to open the door for indigenous people to tell a story like this in the future. And maybe from a more indigenous perspective, because this is a very white perspective film still like Leo is oh, yeah. the lead. Le Lily was up for best actress, but I still think she's overall supporting character in Leo's story. He is the main narrative. Like it's centered around him. But I think that's also another point to talk about is the fact that he is offering his perspective and his perspective is the guilt, the, almost a white guilt of it all too, of him like kind of using his expertise as a crime filmmaker to kind of come to terms with the fact that like, there's some nasty people who, you know, and this is something I love about the Irishman, which we'll get to when we talk about 2019, but the idea that crime films back in the 90s when he was making them and he was so fresh and hot, it was exciting. It was all about the excitement of these quick cuts and Joe Pesci doing this funny monologue and like, oh, wow, he just got whacked in the back of the head. And nowadays it's like, fuck, man, this stuff is heavy. This is shitty and this sucks. And it's like one of those things where he's just changed his whole perspective as a filmmaker. It doesn't make the other films like Goodfellas wrong, but it's really interesting that he can take this kind of more mature lens of like, no, this crime, it sucks. It shouldn't be romanticized. And I, I just, I love it. I love it. He's great. <laughs> but I really like this film. I, I think it's really, really good. I do think it's really good. And despite 
the fact that you know um it, it is a, a film about native american people uh made by a white filmmaker i do think it, it still really does and from my limited perspective respect right. um uh native americans that like what they've gone through and oh, yeah. i think it like props them up like the you know the drum song that we saw at the oscars i love how we get a lot of the perspectives from uh the native americans i kind of want to see that movie and this is the movie that someone else can make where it is for like lily gladstone is the main 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 character and we start the movie with her instead of leo on the train or whatever and, and we get to see all the stuff happening from her perspective um right because we do get you know perspectives from uh people like the the one the death scene of her mother that's kind of like a where, where it's she's like ascended to another plane where mm -hmm. she sees like her dead relatives or something like that i'm like whoa there's like supernatural stuff in this movie did i get that right yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, no, I mean wow. there is. I mean the whole thing with the owl, like the the baby, yeah. basically the Grim Reaper, you know. And and right. as someone who has a f small minor fear of owls, especially in the night, and abruptly, <laughs> that, that, that that did did get to me. It almost reminds me of um you know the Elvis movies we've seen the past two years, where one is this glorification of the star of Elvis, and there are negative aspects of it, but it totally breezes over the fact that he manipulated a fourteen year old child into marrying yeah. him. Um, and now there's another film that comes out from a woman who is wanting to tell it from the female perspective where you can kind of see the monster of that relationship and yes there are good and bad things about both of those films but i think one is more authentic to the truth one is a great film the other is a great film but one is more authentic and i think that's just the thing is it can still be a great film and not necessarily have the full authenticity or it can have the authentic authenticity from just a different perspective and he can tell the authentic side of the crime from the old white man point of view which is also why i think robert de niro is so good in this film because he really yeah. Martin Martin Scorsese really gets that perspective too because he is so charming and he you know he's able to fool everyone essentially so uh yeah well totally. <laughs> yeah there's a lot to talk about but we're we're still trucking along we're halfway through which is crazy um Killers of the Moon we're gonna reach Killers uh, length I'm sure we are oh we're gonna, we're gonna reach <laughs> it all right unless we can get five five films done in a half hour oh, um, Killers of the Flower Moon uh 10 10 nominations not a single win unfortunately is nominated for best picture best director for Martin Scorsese best actress for Lily Gladstone supporting actor for Robert De Niro original score original song for Wajaje a song for my people production design cinematography costume design and film editing uh which makes it the runner up for the most Oscars lost uh next to the color purple and the turning point it is now the second most nominated film to not win an Oscar at 10 all right so next we talked about a master of, of direction. Now let's talk about a master of composition, a master of the score. Let's talk about Bradley Cooper. Chad, tell us about Maestro. <laughs> Maestro, directed by Bradley Cooper, written by Bradley Cooper and Josh Singer, cinematography by Matthew Libatique, music by Leonard Bernstein, starring Bradley Cooper, Carey Mulligan, Matt Balmer, Vincenzo Amato, Michael Yuri, Brian Klugman, Sarah Silverman, Zachary Booth, Miriam Shore, Maya Hawk, and Alexa Swinton. Synopsis, a story of the life of Leonard Bernstein and his wife, Felicia Montalegre. Montalegre, yeah, you got it. Yeah, um, sweet. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so this has been kind of the film that Having now heard your thoughts on Killers of the Flower Moon, I'm starting to like narrow it down of what's the one you you don't love. And I think I might think it might be this one only because I know this is the one that I think the general public has kind of not soured on, but a lot of a lot of negative stuff has been coming at Maestro. And I and I do think a lot of it stems from the idea that Bradley Cooper cannot win an Oscar or has not won an Oscar and yeah. he can't get it done. And a lot of well, people think he did uh, American Hustle, right? He didn't win. He didn't win, but he was nominated. Um, he lost to who, who was that year? 2013 was um, Jared Leto. Um, but mm. which, oh, yeah, if, yeah, if he should have beat him or not. Well, that's another conversation. Well, we had that conversation, but <laughs> it's it should have been the guy from Captain Phillips, but I digress. Um, <laughs> I think my, but it's very interesting because I think a lot of people are just annoyed at the fact that he did kind of go all out here. But 
I, I think it's interesting because it's only a second film that he is directing and making. So when everyone's like, oh, we're sick of Bradley trying so hard, it's like, this is only a second movie. Um, and I think a lot of the criticism is coming at the fact that he is almost so passionate that it's rubbing people the wrong way um, and not actually looking at the movie itself and being critical. Now, I'm not, not to say the movie should be praised or hated. That's up to you. Like if you're assessing the art, but to assess the person based on the amount of effort putting into it, like I saw a tweet going around about how like, oh, he's just trying so hard for that Oscar. But I'm like, at what point do you, like, why should you stop trying? And it's not like you're trying for an Oscar. You're just trying to put your best foot forward and hoping that you get at least some recognition for it. That doesn't even mean Oscars, but that people see the film, that people like the film. So I think there's something to be said about like, I mean, did Christopher Nolan not just do the same thing? You know, and he won, but like, he put him, his whole self out there. Greta Gerwig put her whole self out there. I think, I, I think it's admirable when a, when a director kind of goes a hundred percent into something, even if the product, you know, depending on how you feel about it. I, I just think those criticisms are so weird to me. Where it's like, oh, he's just trying so hard. He like spent ten hours a day watching c- composers. Ugh, pretentious. And I'm like, but like <laughs> that's I would listen if I got money paid to watch composers, you know, conduct an orchestra for ten hours a day in order to do it myself in a film. Like I would love that opportunity. So I, I don't know. I think it's just a weird criticism, but let's talk about the movie itself. Sorry. That was my just little like soapbox, like wanted to get that rant out of the way. Cause I see so much. And again, negative criticisms for this movie are fine, but I feel like they're almost misguided in what they're actually criticizing. They're criticizing the, you know, almost like the method acting of it yeah. rather than the actual product, you know, which good or bad, I, I think is not, has nothing to do with the amount of effort you put into something. I, I think it's just that he's making it known too how much you put into something. Cause admittedly, when you put so much work into something, you want to kind of let people know, you'll be like, listen, what I, what I did, like, this is what I did for this, you know, almost like not really bragging, but just sharing your insight. Cause also he probably wants to inspire filmmakers to come. And, and, you know, that's part of it is sharing your experiences and how you came to your vision, which I think is important. But anyway, Maestro, Chad, how do you feel about Maestro? <laughs> well, I mean, I kind of want to piggyback off of that thought yeah. first because I, I do think, uh, I do agree with you. And I think that like a lot of those types of criticisms are kind of silly because it's like, it's it's weirdly like being selective with like, um, uh, what do you, what'd you call it? Uh, uh, the acting. Like method? Method, thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Method acting. It's being right. weirdly selective, which people are, where I, I totally get it when it's like Jared Leto doing weird things to his coworkers. Yeah, when it gets criminal, that's when you, that's you know. That's weird. But, yeah, but watching someone wave their arms for 10 hours a day is not that, you know. But yeah, because you have like him doing that. You have like Jake Gyllenhaal and End of Watch just going on ride along with cops. And then you have Daniel Day-Lewis doing whatever the hell he does. Yeah, and yet, literally changed professions to make dresses after Phantom Thread. Like, yeah, and you, can, like, you praise him for Phantom Thread and There Will Be Blood and all the stuff that he does, but if Bradley Cooper does it, it's somehow weird now. Mm-hmm. You know, and I know because they've been shitting on that. They've been shitting on like the you know the the makeup with like the nose and stuff like that. And which I get least, that criticism because it's yeah, like a little you know, more. If, if it was you know it's it's kind of the blackface thing. But I I also think yeah. It, it, that that one's a little tougher but i do think you know how's that different than what brendan fraser did with the whale you know you wanted to make him look like that character you know like that's my opinion and some people like criticisms of that which i get but I, it's like when you're trying to replicate a real person who existed and the way they look like i get it like gabriel labelle wore clothes that steven spielberg wore as a kid you know like, yeah. like where does the line draw with that but i, I get that if you're offended by that that's fine that's your right yeah like i like i think like like I think it, like it, it makes sense if you're like I don't know about that. Like, what's his intention? Or you're appropriating my like my culture or something like that. Or mm-hmm. maybe like I kind of like from the perspective like you didn't need to go that hard. Yeah. You could have just acted like Leonard Bernstein, and we would have thought you were Leonard Bernstein in the movie. Like from your performance, not because you did something to your nose. Because he still does look but, like himself too. It, it it doesn't feel like you're like, oh, who is that actor? It's like it's still very much Bradley Cooper. It's just yeah. his nose is a little bigger. Yeah, so and I, like, I agree with you. and like it's one of those things also where you're just kind of like, you know, they're not saying like someone who has a bigger nose is lesser they're not making fun of someone or their looks or like this stereotypical jewish thing where you know this is a big stereotype and they're like haha look at that you know they're playing into it 
kind of a deal. No, it's just like they're trying to replicate the look. So, you know, what, yeah. whatever, but, you know, it, it is what it is. Um, mm-hmm. You asked how I feel about this film. Yeah. This is the film I don't really like. <sighs> okay. um, and I'm, no, but this is like one of the things where I don't hate it. Mm-hmm. I, I, I want to like it, but even when, look, when I decided that I was like, I don't know if I like this movie, it was after my first watch. And it was before it started to go a little downhill with the Oscar stuff. Right. When I watched it, didn't love it. I was like, am I wrong? Because a lot of people I knew were talking about the movie like they really, they were like, Maestro's so good. Mm-hmm. And I'm like watching it like, am I weird about this like because i just there's certain things in the movie that i'm like this feels very dated like you said that what is the movie like american fiction feels a little dated this one i'm like we're doing kind of weird tropes that we're kind of past now so this is the movie that i felt like and it's also for me and I'm very interested to hear, hear like your kind of defensive not that you need to defend it no it's fine and and it's not yeah I want to like it more. So that's why I'm all, cause like with like the crowd, that's one that I was on the fence about and you made me think about it in a whole new light. That's why I'm excited to hear your take of Maestro. I because might not from, sell this one as well as that, but I'll try. <laughs> because for me, I watched it and I was like, I don't know if what they're saying is, is, is better than what I'm thinking they're saying. And if it's what I'm thinking, like, it's just like, I just don't think, I don't know. And I just don't. And it's also one of those where for me, I didn't really enjoy watching it. And this is one I couldn't finish the second watch. Mm. I was like trying to get through it. And I was like, I don't like anything that's going on here. Like I like the big conducting sequences that he does. I think those are kind of cool, but like everything else, I'm just like, it feels to me like a mank like a trial of the Chicago seven, like, mm. uh, I don't know any of these movies that you can go. I see why some Academy members would glom onto that and go, that's something we like. Perfect. But then it's like, it's not that interesting or exciting or I don't know. I just didn't really care for it all that much. And I thought I was wrong, like wrong. <laughs> But I mean, you are I Chad. But, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Yeah. I'm kidding. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Tell me why no, you like more than I did. Well, I think part of it I'll also comes. From, yeah, part about. of it also comes from the love for Leonard Bernstein. I mean, I grew up obviously, you know, as a theater kid, loving Leonard Bernstein, like West Side Story being the obvious one. But also, like I did on the town in high school and in college. That is one of my favorite like gateways into classic musicals and movie musicals it was my introduction to gene kelly before i had even seen singing in the rain so i was big on on the town and this has three on the town needle drops which is amazing but i just love his music so i think there's also a fondness of that where i was very surprised when i watched this that it didn't take the conventional approach of going through his career and him writing these compositions. It wasn't like, and then he sat down and he wrote West Side Story. And then he sat down and he wrote On the Town. And then he sat down and wrote Candide, all these things. You have snippets of that. Like there's that scene in the beginning where he's like at the piano writing stuff down, but it's much more focused on him as the person and in his relationship, because that was his biggest thing was his love for his wife contradicting itself with his, sexuality and him wanting to be free and openly gay at a time when it was less accepted and at a point where he did love this woman but in a different way than a romantic love to where he genuinely cared about her and then obviously when she gets sick how that kind of changes and when that love really kind of personifies but what i liked so much about it was that it didn't go through the necessary biopic steps in the way it's presented too the fact that like there are these big musical kind of transition sweeping shots and the way they play with light and black and white and cinematography and all that. Like, I think there's a very conventional way to tell this that I think would have been a little bit more Oscar Beatty and kind of similar to stuff like Mank and Trial of Chicago seven, not to say that those are bad films. I like those films more than you did too. But I think this movie, I think because of how different it was in presenting a biopic, it reminded me a lot of like Lenny, the film we watched, the um, the Bob Fosse one. It, this, this yeah. did feel like it took a lot of inspiration from like Bob Fosse's works in, in the sense that like, 
it could have been very straightforward, but it wasn't. And I really appreciated that. And I think just hearing all those musical flourishes paired with different aspects of his life, um, like the Lonely Town Pas de Deux, which plays when he's first like meeting um, Carrie Mulligan's character, when she first shows up, they're playing Lonely Town, which is a beautiful, beautiful composition. But it, you know, for those who know the show and know the music, it's about this guy kind of wandering, not knowing where he wants to go with his life, not knowing if he'll ever find that love. And that's when she comes into the story. So I think having previous knowledge of the music helped me kind of tap into what he was saying, because a lot of the music was speaking for it. And especially when the, they do the West Side Story needle drop, which is the intro, is when he's driving up in the car with all those young yeah. boys and everyone's watching from the car. That. And it's kind of like that thing where it's like, yeah, and, and see, you love that part because also I, you know that music, so you know the context yeah. of that, where it's like <laughs> it's these guys and the gangs in the streets and it's him riding up in this car and, and it's almost like he's up to no good. And I think that's the thing is they pair the music so well based on the context of that music to show where he is in his life. And it's rarely about the music, which I think is so interesting. The music kind of acts as an underscoring for what is really important, which is his relationships, which I think is something that his kids, when I saw the screening in New York Film Festival, like his kids were so appreciative of because it was like they finally got to see their dad for who he was, not who the public perceived him to be, which was just this very brilliant man. He was a brilliant man, but it was also he was also a very complicated man. He had relationships, you know, he had multiple relationships with men and women alike. And he had this love for his wife that was hard to say because it was never more than just a kinship, even though he wanted it so badly to be, he was a closeted gay man who had to love this wife and provide for his wife, but also didn't, wasn't able to be his full true self, which I think is just so interesting um, because you would just expect it to kind of take the conventional approach. And you would also expect it to maybe like see them go their separate ways at the end. But the fact that he comes back to it because he ends up realizing that unconditional love doesn't have to be romantic and he's there for his wife. I mean, from the cancer diagnosis on that whole sequence with Carrie Mulligan, I think it's some of her best work and I, I love their, their moments together. It's, it's heartbreaking. Um, but you really get a sense of love, but in such a different way than any other Hollywood romance, because it's not romantic. It's it's more of an unconditional deep kinship than anything else. Um, but yeah, I, I also think technically it's it's really brilliant. Obviously, what I talked about the music, but also just the way he makes these grand sweeping camera angles. I mean, Star is Born was such an intense, intimate little film. Uh, and there were big moments, obviously. It grew as it went along. But a lot of the best stuff in Star is Born is just the very sizzling kind of hot little interactions between Lady Gaga and Bradley Cooper to where here it was just such a big swing that I really appreciate it because I saw this New York Film Festival actually in the hall where Bernstein first conducted, which was really cool, like in that actual hall, um, which you see him go into, which also kind of made it feel more spiritual in that way because I was watching a Bernstein movie in the place he first conducted um, and his family was there and Bradley was there. It was just a really cool moment, but you know, where was I going? <laughs> yeah. There's so much to talk about, but it, yeah, it's the big sweeping direction too, which is so cool. Cause it, it shows that he wants to be taken seriously as a real filmmaker and not just someone who made a really good, like star is born movie, you know, but he's able to show that he has other tools in his arsenal. Um, you know, and, and I do think the fact that it's not conventional makes some people a little, more hesitant and cold to it, but I'd rather take something that's a little bit more polarizing and unconventional than like a very straightforward biopic that I felt like trial of Chicago seven and Mank were more so than this. Um, and even Mank is, is a little more unconventional than conventional, but still like, I think there's so many conventional like Oscar Beatty biopics. And I think the fact that this is so far from that makes it a little hard to, for people to connect with. But for me, I think because I was already had a connection with Leonard Bernstein and I had a connection to his art, it was cooler to connect to him as a person and see all these interest, interest, interesting, I, I can't pronounce the word, intricacies, there we go, um, of his life that aren't just about his music. His music is really kind of second fiddle to everything else in this film, which I really like. So then when he does open up and he has these you know big musical moments, we're able to kind of see him at his most open to then see later when it's dichotomized against his closed off kind of more sheltered, more hidden, more closeted itself. But um, that's my spiel. <laughs> I don't think I swayed you given your face, but I do think um, I hope hopefully at least articulated why I think some people are really loving this film and why I do really love it. And so much so to where the first time I watched it, I was all swept up on the technicals. I was like, wow, that was a technical masterpiece. The story and the actual writing and the characters, I was like, eh, but rewatching it, I was like, wow, like I'm really amazed at what he did. And honestly, I, I still think I like Star is Born better, but I'm like, for two films in, for him to be delivering at this level, like I think he could be one of our 
one of the directors to keep an eye on. I think if he makes a third film as good as these two, I think he might get his Oscar. But I don't know. I, I'm very much in the minority, though, because I think a lot of people do sway more negative on it, which is a little weird considering how it got Best Picture nomination. But I think the public versus the Academy versus critics is just kind of very divided in terms of this film. So it's it's interesting to hear all the angles of it. But also, you know, it it it's not every film works for everybody. And for 10 films, for nine of them to stick is pretty awesome for you anyway. So it's like if one film doesn't quite reach the others, it's fine. You know, I'm, I'm not taking offense to it. I'm not Bradley Cooper. And Bradley Cooper is probably not watching this. And if you are, please come on our show. We'd love to have you. <laughs> Yeah. Um, okay. Well, Sorry, well, I talked okay, a while. I know. <laughs> no, that's okay. I'm just trying to figure out like how to like approach approach it. Um, I do like A Star Is Born more, obviously. Obviously, um, yeah. Maybe because it is more of a like a conventional story, but it is one of those things where I totally see where you're coming from. And if I were a bigger fan of Leonard Bernstein. And like in that world, knowing all the music, maybe I would have liked it more, just kind of seeing a lot of these nuances that you were saying, um, because I totally see where you're coming from with that. But almost like because I'm not like a, a super fan of Leonard Bernstein, I think most people aren't that like. If you're going to make one movie about Leonard Bernstein, why not? I'm not saying make it totally conventional, but why not tell us? like show us more about his life than just his sexuality and his relationship with his wife. Why not give us more of the music and give us more of the, you know, like this is how he did this and this is how he composed the thing. Like I would have liked seeing that story more because I do like, I'm not saying cause I Bohemian Rhapsody, I don't like it. Right, I was about to say, uh, then you get something like Bohemian Rhapsody. I'm a, I'm a Queen fan. Like a lot of people will go, I really like Bohemian Rhapsody, but I'm a Queen fan. And then I'm like, I don't like Bohemian Rhapsody because <laughs> I'm a Queen fan. Right. Well, <laughs> I, I think an example of a movie that's similar to Maestro that some people don't like for this reason is Rocket Man because Rocket Man was something where it wasn't. It was about him and his sexuality and his relationships, and his music was him singing throughout. Not because it was like, ne next I wrote Rocket Man, and next I wrote Tiny Dancer, and next I wrote uh, my song. Instead, it was, oh, I realize I'm in love with my best friend, and then Elton sang my song. And people hated that. People were like, or some people hated that. I, I liked it. I don't know how you feel about that film, but it was like, a lot of people were like, I wanted to see him write the song. I don't want to see him singing this song about his best friend. I feel like that's kind of what mm -hmm. this is. It's, it's like, instead of having him sit down and write West Side Story, it's instead, this is the part of the story where he's really treating his wife like shit and sneaking around and playing with the boys. And now we're going to kick in the da 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 Like, I, I think that's kind of where it's at, where like this is feels felt very similar to Rocket Man for me, where I think the music is acting as an emotional device to kind of say what the character wants to say without overtly saying it, rather than like, this is how he wrote this and this is how he wrote that. But I do think okay. if Rocket Man, though, is different because I think the songs, they have lyrics, so they're a little different. And I think it's still... Elton John, at least for modern audiences, is much more, you know, people know his songs a lot better. So yeah, they're able to say exactly. like, oh, I know this song, you know, it's harder with this because it's all musical compositions. But I still think they evoke the emotions he wants to evoke throughout the film. But anyway, I'll let you keep going. Sorry. Well, because we also get to see, I really like Rocket Man. Oh, okay. And so that's why, like, I, I, I totally see where you're coming from with the comparison. Um, and that's very interesting because then I got to go, well, is Dylan's not wrong. They they are very similar. No, and neither are you. Neither are you. Yeah. Well, no, I'm saying you're not wrong with that. What you were just saying about rock oh, okay. comparison, gotcha. because yeah. you're saying that they're connected in a certain way, like they they're made in a, in a specific way that that they were very similar. And I can't deny that because when you're talking about that, I saw all those connections you were making, and then I go, well, why do I like this one? I don't like this one, and I think it could be. Uh, one where I, I, I'm more of a fan of Elton John, less of a fan of Leonard Bernstein, not that I wouldn't like to be more of a fan of Leonard Bernstein, which is why I would have liked to learn. I guess I could read Wikipedia. I don't need a, a movie <laughs> to tell me about yeah. Leonard Bernstein, but you know, maybe I just wanted a different kind of movie. Um, but I do also respect like your point of view where I'm looking at it like, you know, we're, we're, I'm subverting that and I'm not giving us the conventional thing. But then also, I feel like it is still kind of giving us a little bit of a conventional thing where, 
I realize that they're not lying about Leonard Bernstein's life. I'm sure he did go through all this stuff and, and things like that. But as a story and a film, I'm like, I feel like I've seen the movie before where it's gay man knows he's gay, but like, you know, because of the time or whatever, uh, has another connection with a woman and then feels like he has to get married to the woman, but then he's still going to sow his wild oats and, and, you know, uh, experience that because, you know, obviously you can't just get rid of part of your sexuality. You, you know, you mm-hmm. all, we talk about some American fiction, you all are who you are, um, and stuff. And to see like, to me, it was more of like, we're okay here. We're seeing the, the man who is in a committed relationship with his wife go and he's going in the hallway to make out with this guy or talk like really, you know, too friendly with this guy or whatever. And we see the, the woman going like, and like, you know, I'm, I'm going to put his shoes outside or like, what are the stuff? And like, she's this scorned woman who is, oh, her husband is gay. And it's like, I'm just like, I've seen that. Like, I feel like we've progressed past this type of movie yeah. where I see this being made back in the day where, you know, people will go like, you know, yeah, it's kind of weird that he's like making out with all these guys. And he has a, I don't know. For me, I just couldn't connect with this type of movie that I feel like I've seen before that was made a long time ago. I'm like, why am I getting this in 2023? Even though it isn't lying about his life, but then I'm just, I think that's the tough part is it, it's truth. So it's like hard to, you know, that that is what happened. But it's also you know, I, I get what you mean. Like, is this even a story that people should be interested in? And, and that's and thing. I just I you might have been and I wasn't. And I can totally see so many other Dylans and so many other Chads out in, in the world going, I don't think this movie's good. Like even like Whitney Seibel, we mentioned him before. He's like. That was a bad movie, Maestro. And I was like, whoa, okay, he actually just said it was bad. I wasn't even going to go there because I didn't know how I felt about it. And then Mm -hmm. I see someone like you who might not go, this is one of the greatest movies I've ever seen. But you go, I see what they're they're doing, and I really like what they're doing. And I was surprised, and I really dug it. And Because you're coming from a different perspective where you've, you've gone through his music and you've, you've experienced mm-hmm. all that. And so you saw all the stuff he was doing and I, I wanted a different movie, I think. Yeah, that's fine. Um, and I, I do think I'm at that level of one, this is one of the greatest movies of this kind ever made, like in terms of okay. visual bio biopics. Cause I really just think it's such an interesting way to tell a story. And, and yeah, maybe those, some, some of those scenes are a little bit more conventional of like, Oh, you know, is, is, did he actually fool around with the guys in front of his wife's face and maybe he did though and that's the thing is like maybe that's just who he was because he even uh, one of the best scenes and 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 one of the funny lines i keep bringing up these funny lines in serious movies is when he's is when he's in the park with uh uh no uh, when he's runs into matt bomer and and his uh I guess it's his wife, maybe. Um, slept with both and, and, he, and yeah, he goes to the, the kid. And he's <laughs> like, I slept with both your parents. And it's one of those things where it's like, you should be like put off by it. But I think that's his thing is he was so charming and people did yeah. love him. And I think that shows why it's so hard for her to leave. And I think a reason why this movie works so well as it does too is because Carrie Mulligan is given as much of a leading presence as he is. She's the top billed actor in this. If you look at the cast breakdown, she's above him. And I think that's very intentional because this is as much her story about trying to hold on to this marriage than it is about him kind of going about his ways. And I think his, con- you, you mentioned like the conventionality of it. His side might be a little more conventional, but her side, I think we, we very rarely get the perspective of the person being cheated on. I feel like it's more or so about the guy doing it. Um, maybe, I don't know, but I can't really think of many examples right off the top of my head, but I think it's very interesting that she gets so much of the point of view. Um, and I do like how they resolve it where he does finally, and it's sad, but once she passes, he's finally, going to gay bars and like actually being free. And it's sad because he's this old man doing it. And it's like how much of his life passed him by, but at the same time, does he regret it or does he not? Because at the end of the day, he still loves his wife and he still loves his kids. It's just, he didn't love her in the way he loves these men, which is a more sexual romantic thing. So it's very interesting. I I just think it's, it's, it's very interesting. I I don't know. I, I I think we just both see different sides of it, but I, I think your perspective is totally valid as well because it is, it is definitely challenging in a way that is is unconventional, and I think that's why it's a little hard to be accessible. I I definitely don't don't think it's mo- one of the more accessible films for sure. I think it's definitely one of those films you have to kind of just be in the right mood and time and place for, you know. 
Yeah, and we'll get there, but I think it's like really interesting that I feel like this is more divisive than another movie that's very not accessible that we'll get to at the very end. Oh, very. very. Okay, I see what you mean. <laughs> yeah, um, but a very interesting conversation nonetheless. Maestro, though, goes over seven at the Oscars, uh, much to Chad's delight. Uh, he gets nominated for Best Picture, Best Actor for Bradley Cooper, Best Actress for Carrie Mulligan, Best Original Screenplay, Best Sound, Best Cinematography, Best Makeup and Hairstyling. And there's really no other way to segue, but we are about to talk about it. We're about to drop a bomb here three hours in, and we are about to talk about the three-hour film that won Best Picture which is Oppenheimer. Oh yeah, here we go. Oppenheimer, directed by Christopher Nolan, written by Christopher Nolan, cinematography by Hoyt Van Hoytema, music by Ludwig Göransson, starring Killian Murphy. Oh, it's a lot of people, dude. Killian <laughs> Murphy, Emily Blunt, Matt Damon, Robert Downey Jr., Florence Pugh, Josh Hartnett, Casey Affleck, Rami Malek, Kenneth Branagh, Benny Safdie, Jason Clark, Josh Peck, Dane DeHaan, Tony Goldwyn, David Krumholtz, Matthew Modine, Alex Wolf, Jack Quaid, Gary Oldman, and Alec Ehrenreich. <sighs> Synopsis: <laughs> The story of Oppenheimer's creation and fall, uh, Oppenheimer's creation of the atomic bomb and fall from grace, um, yeah. based based on American Prometheus by Kai Bird and Martin J. Sherwin. There you go. Uh, I'm going to start it off, Chad, because it's been no secret sure. just from the Pickle Awards and just everywhere else. Like, this is a film I've been championing since it came out. And I think it's one of those films that, despite being, we talked about Killers of the Flower Moon being long, you know, it, and it and it feels long, but it's purposeful. Here, and I don't know if you feel differently, but I feel like this is one of the best three-hour, like, paced movies I've ever seen. Because it's it's really kind of three acts. It's the first act is kind of setting up who our Oppenheimer is and the science of it. The second act is the bomb and the testing. Third act is the fallout with the politics and the communism and all that. But it still finds a way to be so intertwined throughout. And, and the, the editing from Jennifer Lame is just so, so good um, in really making this thing flow by. And you, you mentioned Ludwig Göransson, and I want to just mention that his score aids a lot in the pacing of this film in the fact that it really does dance along almost like it's one continuous scene almost like you lit the fuse and then it goes to the very end where the bomb is the credits like it really doesn't ever feel like it stops um and i think that's a real testament to christopher nolan who for years now has been playing with time and pacing and you know longer films shorter films and trying to figure out exactly how to edit his films in a unique way that has its own personality and character but also fitting the context of the movie itself like tenet was so all over the place with its editing reasonably so but it wasn't as accessible for audiences and dunkirk you know the editing and the time was so interesting and so influential there, but the script was nothing special for some people. And then you have stuff like the Batman or the dark Knight trilogy, which is so well loved and respected nowadays, but it doesn't play with time very much. It's just more kind of clear cut in terms of its storytelling. So I think it's just so interesting to see how each different strength he's shown in each one of his movies has now kind of culminated to where he can now kind of, this is almost like a greatest hits of Nolan and the fact that he can get great performances like he can for the dark Knight. He can do great writing like he can for the prestige. He has great editing like he did in Memento and Dunkirk. He has the style of something like Tenet visually. Um, and then he can play with like, you know, these different kind of character relationships that date back as far as following. Um, and I think that's just so interesting to see from a filmmaker that I think we had all thought we saw the best of already. And this might not be everyone's favorite of his, but I do think, in terms of just an achievement of his career, I think this is kind of the film that it's all been building to. And I think the film itself kind of mirrors that. And the fact that it is this guy who has just been so intrigued by fission and fusion his whole life and has these visions of just particles and science, you know, these scientific visions and, you know, quite literal sparks of brilliance to then finally culminate in something that has never been done before, never been seen before. But then how do you feel that fallout and i think that's something we haven't seen with nolan because we haven't seen a fallout yet for nolan tenet was the closest thing to it and because it was a pandemic he didn't have that big fall from grace because it was kind of one of those things where it's like oh tenet came out it came and went he has not had that moment yet where his career has come crashing down and it might not but i think that's kind of what's so interesting is that he's almost kind of reckoning with the idea of what happens when i make my greatest creation what's going to happen next and and am i going to be able to accomplish this greatness and brilliance and i think it's something that was true with like the dark knight everyone was saying it's the greatest superhero movie ever made it's the greatest movie ever made for some people's it changed the way the oscars are we have 10 nominees because of christopher nolan because of the dark knight how do you deal with that 
And he's been able to kind of keep up in himself or, or at least doing new interesting things. But there's going to come a time where you have to look at yourself and say, when when is this all going to come back to bite me? Is it going to come back to bite me? And the idea of how you marry yourself to one's art and your passions and your hobbies and how you let it consume you or how you try not to let it consume you, but how it consumes you anyway. And the way other people kind of spin your overall idea and thesis as a person to try to use against you. And, and I think there's just some really cool, interesting meta shit going on in that sense. But that's kind of my blanket, bl uh, blanket thoughts on Oppenheimer. I will let you talk because I know you've watched this a few times now because, um, you know, we both talked about it the first day we saw it. You saw it before me. I was very jealous. Um, and then, you know, we, uh, we've we watched it a few times since. I think I'm on five times now and you're at three, I think. Right. So, um, yeah, so Chad, tell me about the nine hours of Oppenheimer you've watched. <laughs> Three, if you don't count reading the screenplay. Okay, uh, so like maybe kind of almost four. watching it for. Or, yeah, you're you know, you're envisioning eight. it in your head still, probably it's as it. you're reading it. You know. Yeah. Oh, I mean, yeah, because well, um, I'll get to it in a second um, right. with the screenplay. Mm -hmm. um, when I watched this movie the first time, I knew it was a good movie. I was like, it's Christopher Nolan. He makes good movies. I mean, he's had hiccups with like Tenet and stuff like that, um, but. I knew it was a good movie. I knew it was like important and I knew all that stuff. In fact, in my like first like written review I did for it, I said Christopher Nolan's masterpiece Oppenheimer. But then afterwards, I'm just sitting there trying to engage with it more, trying to figure it out. And then, you know, I know like you fell in love with it, like right out of the gate. Yeah. You're like, holy shit. Yeah. So Look much so to where movie. I think I, I honestly downgraded Barbie because I did the Barbenheimer and I did Oppenheimer first to where I, I think I was so caught up and amazed and surprised at Oppenheimer that I didn't give Barbie a fair shot the first time I yeah. watched it because I was just like, this just isn't as good as what I just watched three hours ago um, for three hours. But now having time to sit with each of them and, and really kind of watch them on their own, I obviously feel differently, but um, I still like this more than Barbie, but you know what I mean. Uh, but continue. Yeah. Yeah. Um... <laughs> But what I found out after my third watch and also reading the screenplay is that I had no chance. I was a goner after the first time of just like fully engaging with this movie and understanding this movie. And if anyone's able to watch this movie one time and just go, I got it. And like, I understand all of the things that are happening in this movie, all of the uh, it's in black and white when it's from Robert Downey Jr.'s perspective, it's in color when it's from Killian Murphy's perspective. And like, that's because Robert Downey Jr. only sees the world in black and white. And, you know, just all this stuff, like all of these technical stuff that he's doing that I'm just mm -hmm. like, not really engaging with at all. I'm just like seeing like the conventional, uh, yeah. biopic going on. And then you see like the other kind of stuff, like the stuff you were engaging with in Maestro. That's a little bit higher level yeah, that you're like, right. I'm seeing some other stuff here, Chad. Um, <laughs> and so for me with Oppenheimer, it took me freaking three watches and reading the screenplay to go, okay, I'm seeing more what he's doing here to where now I'm not going to, I'm not at the level where I'm like, you know, I don't know if I think it's Christopher Nolan's best movie. And I don't know if it's like the greatest film of the past decade or <laughs> whatever some people think. Um, but it was lower in my rankings and it shot up a little bit because I think that it is a technical Marvel. I think it's okay. And then I wanted to say after reading the screenplay and then reading other screenplays, I love that American fiction one because I do think there's a COVID adapted thing. But then I, I look at, I read Oppenheimer and I was like, that's one of the greatest screenplays I've ever read. And I'm like, look, I'm, I'm reading through this thing and I'm like, cause it's all first, per, first person, right? Um, yeah. I mean, it's from or like, a lot of it. it's from like diff, two different perspectives from okay. Oppenheimer and, um, Robert Downey. Right. Um, but, uh, and they kind of, their shit kind of mirrors each other a little bit, but, um, uh, uh, Oppenheimer screenplay. What, what the hell was I talking about? Um, you liked American where, fictions and then you watched, you read Oppenheimer's. Yeah. I read the Oppenheimer screenplay and I was like, 
everything that's in the movie is on this. And I'm just like, it's just so like you're reading this thing and you're just like, how did Christopher Nolan have this in his head? It's almost like when you look at behind the scenes of how they made Shaun of the Dead and you see Edgar Wright and uh, Simon Pegg writing that movie and making that, trying to get that movie made, they're pitching it to people and they're like, okay, this is the movie of Shaun of the Dead. And people are kind of writing it off, but then they like, when normally I think when you pitch a movie, you'll have someone read like the screenplay or it might be a very short meeting where you kind of just explain the gist of the movie. But uh, Edgar Wright would show up to these uh, Shaun of the Dead uh, pitches and he would uh, have entire storyboards and he would walk them through all of the storyboards of this movie and people are like, what the f- is going on right now? And you can't get the entire picture from the screenplay necessarily. Yeah. But he ha- but the point is, Edgar Wright has the whole movie in his head. And he's going to shoot it exactly. And it's like, no, we need all these shots. Trust me. It's going to come together in the edit. It's going to be perfect. Um, and he has it in his head. I feel like Christopher Nolan just had this movie in his head. And how Christopher Nolan, because I read not all of American Prometheus, but I read some of it. Mm-hmm. And how Christopher Nolan could read American Prometheus, which is very dry and is very like mm-hmm. a textbook, and like be like, I'm gonna make a movie out of this, and it's gonna be <laughs> yeah. like very riveting, and you're gonna like, like it's not gonna be dry at all, and you're just gonna, you know, like you were talking about, like it's gonna feel like you know the pacing just like moves. It's a three hour, but it moves, and it's very Christopher Nolan and exciting in a lot of ways. Yeah but it hits the deep stuff and stuff. I don't know the way they they wrote the screenplay and it's like action voiceover starts here. Action starts here. And it's this thing. And then it's, if you're like going into like the edit in your mind and you're like, all right, they showed part of this scene earlier in the movie. And now they're showing that scene again, but they're showing you more of the scene later Mm -hmm. on. I was a goner watching this the first time, like going like, didn't we already see this one thing? Oh, they're showing right. it again, but more of it to show the context of now what you know. And, and it's just, it. what I'm saying is it's very well written. <laughs> yeah. I like it a lot more. So, and that's, I was trying, I, I wanted it to be a little bit of a surprise that I like this movie a ton more than I, I once did where when I was talking about, I was not mad that this won Best Picture, even though I, I may like one or more movies above it. I'm not sure. I don't want to spoil the thing. I am sure, but I, I don't want to spoil anything here. But um, I, I'm not mad at it. I'm like, okay, this yeah. movie is so good. Like, you get to that end scene, and it's like, you know, I, I you know, I believe we have, or whatever the final line is, and you get that like brilliant cinematography and him yeah. like iconic with the hat i think the freaking screenplay says iconic when it shows it it talks about oppenheimer and it's like him and his hat and a cigar or whatever iconic and uh, (laughs) like yeah okay i get it um Mm -hmm. there's more to talk about but i don't want to yeah no i mean no i i love that insight and honestly i only read the screenplay once a while ago and and i want to revisit it now because it is such an interesting film because yes, a lot of the writing does so much of the heavy lifting, but just he assembles the best team to pull it off too, which is, it was one thing like you can have a vision, but to actually see it come to life and to know that there were no CGI recreations of anything in this yet, he's able to pull off all those visions and all those explosions. I don't even know how safe it was, but it must've been because you know, (laughs) he filmed it, but knowing that he filmed everything on IMAX cameras and on millimeter, not digital. And he, he's famous for not recording any ADR audio. So he's taking whatever audio he can get from the set um, to just make it feel more lived in and authentic and real. I mean, he's just progressing film in a very interesting way that very few filmmakers are trying to do. Some filmmakers do it just naturally. um, But I feel like only a rare few filmmakers are actually going out of their way to try to like make new technologies and really try to like make the cinematic language different i mean james cameron comes to mind steven spielberg to a degree tom cruise. At least he used to tom cruise is another example him and christopher <laughs> mcquarrie like i think these types of people who are just like literally giving their all into this um and they're not yeah. you know really focused on anything else christopher nolan doesn't allow sitting on set like 
but it's a little crazy, but it's also one of those Weird things where guy. it's like, yeah. Yeah, it is. But at the same time, if he gets this quality out of it, then he's on to something. I mean, <laughs> people, are like, people are like, Christopher Nolan doesn't own a cell phone. So I have to go to his house. Yeah. To get weird, the <laughs> yeah. but but it's one of those things, that, and I think that's why a lot of people have said like his writing is so cold and his characters are so cold, and I think that's a criticism a lot. A lot of his films is it's very cold. You know, it's it's not, you know, they're not the most relatable or the most lovable characters. Not the holdovers. But <laughs> no, it's not the holdovers. But um, I think this film showed this vulnerability, kind of like how I talked about Martin Scorsese and Killers of the Flower Moon. I think it showed a real bravery and, and and vulnerability, like you said, to take something so dry as American Prometheus and bring so much life to these characters. I mean, you really buy the emotions. Like Emily Blunt's character is someone that I wasn't on board with the first time. I was like, she's fine. But then she got nominated. And I'm like, maybe I should look at this from an Oscars lens. And I think I like her a lot more because yeah. there are some real human emotions there in all her stuff. Like I, I was like, why is she crying all the time? But I'm like, no, she's crying. It is stuff you don't see in a lot of Christopher Nolan films. Yeah, go ahead, Jeff. I was just going to say, to piggyback off that, that's what I had to do with Robert Downey Jr. Because okay. you know me, I was like so yeah. negative on him. And I'm still not at the level, because I don't think he was far and above everyone else that was no. uh, nominated I, there. I would have picked see, De Niro over him it, personally on my ballot. But Yeah, and I, I see how it's kind of more, I don't want to, dismiss i don't want to downplay his achievement by saying oh it's in a legacy award kind of a deal because it is that i i believe but it's also i i can see it watching it now where i i'm more on a uh, not a, a strauss people but a straws i'm more of a straw <laughs> it's, a, it's a southern you got to say it in the southern mm -hmm. twang yeah. um i'm more on on his wavelength now and that whole side of the story because i didn't realize it was like two halves and stuff but yeah yeah well, i see also, what you're saying blunt yeah yeah but his character as well like the emotion he's not emotional and the fact that he doesn't cry or anything but so much of robert downey jr's character is built out of emotion and being pissed and jealous over yeah. something that never happened and i think that's so fun that they play with this idea of like what he said to albert because the whole time you're you're not sure until the very end and obviously when you rewatch it you know but he said nothing about Strauss, but when you're watching it the first time and you're watching it, you're like, what did he say to Albert? I want to know what started this heated rivalry. And it's pure jealousy. It has nothing to do with it. It's, it's his own ego, assuming that everything's about him and that everyone's talking yeah. about him. And it, and it works for him because Robert Downey Jr. Is such a charismatic guy and is very self-deprecating. Whereas Strauss is the opposite where he's very, you know, confident and pompous and and he has this kind of bite whenever he's talking about Oppenheimer that he just, everything gets very in his teeth and everything's just very, punchy and just everything just gets to him and he has these moments and and it's and it's interesting because like it's it's a little similar to tony stark at the beginning of avengers infinite uh, avengers endgame when he's talking to cap but i think he just does that so well because it's bitter but there's also like this part of you that wants to see him succeed because you don't want to see him fail because you don't know the full picture and then at the end it kind of comes into full you know full gear um but i think it's important that they don't give you this necessary right or wrong they never really quite tell you, kind of like Anatomy of a Fall, they never quite tell you how necessarily involved Oppenheimer was in everything and how much we should be either condemning him or praising him. And we don't know the truth of what he said to Albert, which is important because then by the end, we, the audience, can slowly kind of put it together for ourselves to where by the end, we are 100% on board that he really didn't do anything. Um, all he did was build this massive weapon of destruction, which is sad because what it led to is something very wow. catastrophic and, and dangerous and terrifying. And, and he lives with that guilt, but it's also like he didn't betray his country. He was, he was a loyal American. And, and I think that's something so important when Albert Einstein tells him, he's like, maybe if they, if they're turning your back, their back on you, maybe it's time for you to turn your back on them. And he's like, I won't do it. And it shows his character. And I know there are things about Oppenheimer that shouldn't be redeemed. Obviously, you know, there are elements to him as a person that, are controversial because of what he created and what he did. But I think the film does a good enough job humanizing him without fully necessarily making him a hero, but also making sure we know that he was given a raw deal by the people around him because he was simply just better than everyone. And it's sad, but it's true. You know, he was a brilliant guy. So much so to where like having Albert Einstein in the movie is so important too, because it shows this kind of person we all associate as the greatest scientist ever. And he's literally strolling through the park with this guy and it's kind of crazy it's one of those things where you're like you don't put together the fact that they lived in the same lifetime let alone knew each other let alone talked within one another let alone kind of acknowledge that oppenheimer was kind of past him 
Um, so I just think it's so interesting the way they let you know as an audience member the truth as it goes along. And even then, it's still subjective because, like you said, it's still from his perspective. So we don't truly fully know what's true and what's not. Um, but I, I like that. It's, it's kind of like the anatomy of a fall thing. Um, Chad, go ahead. Yeah, I, I just had to write some thoughts down because I was like, it's like you, you said a lot, which I love because it's it's always passion. Uh, um, and I know this is like your favorite movie. So it's it's so great to hear all of your your thoughts um, uh, come out. Um, and then I'm, I'm trying to uh, uh, parse some of it out uh, to, uh, to the Tony Stark. You said uh, kind of said it's a, it's a little bit like Tony Stark. Where, yeah, I think I now think of the line where um, he, he says to Cap, like, you know, I want to punch you in your perfect teeth or whatever. Mm-hmm. And the same thing is like what, you know, he wants to do to Oppenheimer because, you know, you're, you're you know, kind of like a, maybe I like respect you, but like, you know, I hate you. I don't know. Kind of a deal. But like with um, and then I said uh, hubris. I feel like that's the big thing that connects Oppenheimer and straws because um uh, Oppenheimer is like so confident in what his like his ability and like what he can do and like what he's supposed to do, but then people are like, "You're not, you're not seeing what's right in front of your face." Like mm-hmm. there, people aren't what you think. They don't think the way you think, and and then it goes to uh, something in American fiction where uh, the uh, his mom or whatever was like, you know geniuses can't connect with the world because they they see things on a different level and we're seeing all the time what oppenheimer is seeing like is he really seeing these wavelengths no he's not really seeing that shit actually happen maybe he maybe he did have a sixth sense i don't know (laughs) know. But, uh, but uh you know he he's seeing things on another level where he understands things that no one else really understands or it might take like a team of people to understand what he understands, um, even though he's bad in the lab and, and stuff. And I, I, I like that too. Um, yeah, my favorite line is is when Matt Damon's like, "They say you Oppenheimer can't even run a hamburger stand." He's like, "I can't, <laughs> but yeah. I can lead this mission." <laughs> I love that line, and that's where we we're talking earlier. Where like you you were like, "There's not a lot of humor in Oppenheimer." There's a lot if you like look at the some. Trailer. Like like I love There's the. I love the the moment with uh, Bernard from Santa Claus. What's his name? Uh, Crummel. Uh, Crummel. Where he's 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 in there and he's like, if you need someone to translate, I got you. And then he starts talking in Danish and he's like, whoa, whoa, whoa wait, what is he saying? Like, yeah, I love that. Um, yeah, he's just it's it's kind of the smart ass humor where you're like, ah, you got me. That's funny. Um, you know, which I really like because it's it's that added hubris like you were talking about that aids to some of the humor. So I, I and uh, uh, Benny Safdie putting on the sunscreen, like there's certain really funny moments of this film, which is For why sure. I also think it's so layered and complex because you get funny stuff, you get sad stuff. I mean, the stuff of Florence Pugh's character is heartbreaking, you know, because there yeah. is a genuine love there, but there's also that political element, which comes back in the third act. Like everything connects, which I think is so important what you kind of touched on. Like it all comes yeah. back later where you see a scene from a different perspective and it's like, oh, this is why this scene matters. And I think this is one of those things where every scene matters. Like every scene does have something to say. There's no element of it that I think is unnecessary in telling this overall picture. And so much so that people want more. They wanted to see the bombing. They wanted to see these things. But I think it's so important that we don't see the bombing because Oppenheimer didn't see it. All he did was make the bomb and then the U.S. rolled with it. He has to just live with the guilt of having not seen it and having not known. He only sees photos and he has to live with that guilt of like, I did this thing and now I, I can't even like, you know, comprehend it. And that scene where he's giving that speech in that auditorium is I think the best scene of the year, the best film of the best scene of Christopher Nolan's career, just all the, the noise kind of draining out. And then he just hears the stomping and then he sees the white flash and then he sees the burning bodies and he steps through that carcass. Like that scene, I think is one of the best scenes I've ever seen in anything. Yeah. um, And like uh, going to like the talking about, like, I didn't even realize people, we're saying that they wanted to see the bomb. It's almost like you want to see like you, the, the, the fascination with stuff. Like, you know, we'll talk about, we'll get there. We'll talk about the zone of interest and stuff where it's like so fucking dark, but eerily like fascinating where you're just like, mm-hmm. how is this fucking possible? Let me, let so, me correct myself real quick. It, it's not that they wanted to see the bomb. They wanted to see the Japanese response to it. But I, yeah. but I stand by the same reasons that I, I think, if you, that's a whole nother movie. I think the whole point is that yeah, he doesn't, he doesn't get, you don't get that perspective because it's all about the U S being greedy about it, you know? And I, and, and not, I didn't have that thought 
I didn't have that criticism. A criticism that I had other than like, I was like, I don't, I don't know if I like the straws stuff that I like more now, but there's another criticism that I had that I'm, I'm fine with where like reading through American Prometheus, because you can't adapt that whole, there's so much in that. You can't make a cohesive story out of all of that. But I was sitting there like, when you look at it from Oppenheimer's perspective, you can see why he would make these choices. But like looking at like Gene Tatlock's character, I'm like, in the book you're you're reading American Prometheus, you're like seeing like she's like way more than what they make her in this movie. And you're like, you, and they almost kind of like boil her down to like a near like kind of like prostitute almost where it's like you're just going to see her to have sex and stuff but then you can see like how much he cared for her and stuff like that so if you look at it from oppenheimer's perspective i could totally see it but at first i was kind of like is it like is it a valid criticism to be like they should have given more to gene tatlock to flesh her character out more but then i can see well, no, because it's from this is the total story that he's telling. There's not telling a Gene Tatlock story. He's telling is she's a fleeting thing in his, you know, thing. And it ties into the whole communism aspect yeah. and his ties to that and all yeah. that stuff. And, and, the, think, the less you sh- and the less you show of that, the more ambiguous it is as to how involved he was with it. True. You know. And um and I, I think a lot of that stuff also works for the movie as far as like, you know, being this like espionage thriller too, um, where you get into the, was he a communist kind of a thing and the rigged jury and you know, mm-hmm. this isn't, this isn't a trial. We're just, I gotta say you know, <laughs> right now along that line, I mean, yeah. Jason Clark, Jason Clark, if it weren't for Killian Murphy giving the performance he gives, I think Jason Clark is hands down my favorite performance of this thing. Because he is such a good slime ball, and yeah. he's so good at keeping. And again, the pacing, the pacing of that last act flies by because he is so insistent and he is so persistent, and he is just such a dick. And it's so good. The, the stuff between him and Emily Blunt in that one scene, I don't like your phrase. Is so good. I love it. I, I'm, there's so many scenes. I just that's the thing. If it comes on TV, like I don't know how I'm gonna. And I don't watch TV like that as much anymore unless I'm at my parents' house where I'll just turn on what's on. But like. It's one of those things where you can start it at any point. It's hard to turn it off or turn away from it. It is. You're right. No, you're right. You're absolutely right. Like I'll watch it to the end if I'm an hour in or if I'm two or if I'm 30, you know? Makes sense. Um, And speaking of uh, Emily Blunt's Kitty, speaking of her character, um, I have a love-hate relationship with her because I, I can see why she makes some of the choices, but there is a very, you know how I am with like, you know, animals and stuff. There's a scene in the movie that is, it doesn't ruin the movie for me at all, but it's one of those where I'm like, it's so hard to watch him come into the house and hear that child screaming for help, like, take care of me. And Mm -hmm. she's so like, all I do is take care of that kid. I can't handle it anymore. I get where she's coming from, but I also can't ever understand how anybody could just let their kid there's sleep training and stuff like that that you can do with your yeah. child. Yeah. But letting Which, them scream for like yeah. more than like 10 minutes. Mm-hmm. Which there, yeah. this is the forties too. So it's a different climate, yeah. but it's also, no, I know what you mean. And it's also to, I, I think highlight. And, and I think you need to, cause at the end of the day, this film is still trying to show that the country did Oppenheimer wrong, but they still need to try to find ways to make it seem like there are flaws in this guy. And I think that's part of it is the fact that he's at that, at that point, he's still, Best around Florence Pugh, you know? Um, so I, I think that's, or Gene. So I think that's an important element too and why it almost shows his neglect in a way and why he's struggling to form these human connections because he's so consumed by his art and his hobbies. I mean, it reminds me of a show I just wrapped, Sunday in the Park with George, where it's all about that, where it's like my art is so consuming that I can't have a real relationship. I can't because I'm just so consumed by my art. That is that is totally one of the most interesting like parts of the movie is Oppenheimer's character and just how complex he is because you 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 hit on it where it's like it's not wholly a defense of Oppenheimer. It's not wholly a condemnation of Oppenheimer. It's both. It's like this is a man who had a calling 
smartest man alive. Like I, I, Einstein has been. He he did his thing. He's the way of the, the past. Oppenheimer's the way of the future. I see world in a different way. We're going nuclear. We're going fission. We're going subatomic. We're going to the quantum realm, quantum mania, and um, <laughs> with Oppenheimer. And um, he's like, look, th this isn't going away. We can see now you split atoms. We know that a bomb can be made. We know we can do things with this knowledge. Someone's going to do it. Might as well be me. And if I can do it, we're America. We're going to be able to control this. We're going to be able to end all war and go like, now we have a, you better, you better watch out because <laughs> I, I got a big weapon now. So we're, we're going to hold on to that and you know, we have it. So there you go. And, but then you have <clears throat> scenes where he's talking with all these people and they're sitting there like very bluntly talking about which Japanese territories they're going to bomb. Oh my God. And, and you know, that was an improv line, right? Which so one? What the one guy who was like, "Oh, we vacationed there." Yeah, that was yep. the problem. Crazy. Yeah, because it wasn't in the screenplay. <laughs> um, yeah. But uh, yeah, when um, you said they're like, "We're not going to bomb bomb Kyoto because it's beautiful." I like Kyoto, um, and they're just Crazy. like casually doing that, and they're gambling with human life, and like you, you also see with like little lines things are revealed like you don't realize until like a little bit later that you know he's cheating with that one woman not gene tatlock the other woman and you realize through a line where it you know it's like you know did this one person know or whatever he's like he never found out and he kind of like does it in like a little cheeky way where he's like yeah, yeah he, he never found out like he doesn't apologize for it and it's like they did the same thing. We'll get to it. They did the same thing with Selma and Martin Luther King Jr. He wasn't a perfect guy, but look at what he did for civil rights. Right. And, you know, Oppenheimer wasn't a perfect guy, but like, I don't know, it's it's hard to defend making the nuclear bomb. Right. And you like the movie tells you like they kind of had to do it, but then you're in a country who would actually use it, and they go, "We have to use it right. twice." So they know what we're capable of. We know they know we'll keep doing it if they don't stand straight yeah. and stuff. And I wanted to highlight though because I'm getting oh, um, I had some connections. Two connections to Oppenheimer. Okay. One Oppenheimer to Hamilton because it, okay. Hamilton was a big look at this figure. Now look at him in a different light, in a different context, like mm -hmm. Alexander Hamilton versus uh, Oppenheimer um robert oppenheimer yeah um and they're both flawed because like look at what hamilton did he destroyed his whole life because of that and then oppenheimer i don't know it was more straws but oppenheimer uh was so uh he's so smart uh, this is the other connection oppenheimer to walter white in, in breaking bad whereas like yeah. he's so smart but he can't see the the stuff right in front of him that people yeah. are using him that, you know, he's not really in this inner circle. He's on the out there pushing him out because he's the scientist. And then like, and then, but then you have a, uh, a uh, straws who's in this other inner circle. Who's like, I'm not in your circle with the scientists and you're pushing me out. And like, no one's fucking pushing you out, dude. <laughs> so, I don't yeah. know. It's, no, it's very frustrating, but it's but it's it's true. It's it's honestly another form of like toxic masculinity in a way. Yep. You know, yeah. You know, so it's very interesting. And I think that's why a lot of people are like, well, Christopher Nolan doesn't write good women characters or stuff, but it's also I mean, we talked about it. Christopher Nolan is a guy who struggles to connect in general because he's yep. so consumed by his art. He doesn't have a cell phone, he doesn't let people sit. Like he's very out of touch sometimes. But I think that's kind of reflecting, and I think that's why this film is so good and so impactful is because he's bringing a lot of himself not necessarily to the truth and the facts but more so into the personality and the way of the philosophy of life in a way of oppenheimer you know yeah and uh that being said about like the writing the women characters and have a love-hate relationship with uh, kitty and i have the love relationship because um i love how 
love how blunt she is <laughs> at times. Uh-huh. And I, I just thought of that. I wasn't, yeah. I didn't write that like hours before the recording. Um, but um, like I said, I have issues with her character, but it's also like, I totally understand where she's coming from, but then the, some of her actions, but then later on, I love how she's, you know, like, I don't like how she's not caring to Oppenheimer when he loses a friend, but then I also understand, like, he was cheating on her kind of a deal, you know, so I could totally get why he's like, grow up, you know, you don't yeah. get to do something bad and then have people feel sorry for you kind of a deal, yeah, which is yeah. also maybe a theme for the entire movie. Um, yeah, yeah. That's but a good then point. I didn't even at, think of that. Yeah. Right? And then you look at, I just thought of it, and then you look at Kitty... <laughs> At the end, uh, I promise we're going to move on to another movie soon. But you look at Kitty. <laughs> I'm okay with this. <laughs> right? You look at Kitty at the end. Uh, like you mentioned the scene where, where she, she her scene, where she, it's her America Ferrera scene, where she's yeah. at the court t- and the, you know, the, uh, I love Macon Blair. I love that they included Macon Blair in yeah. this. Um, where he's like, we're not going to put her on the stand. She is not going to do well on the stand. And she does the best on the stand. And I just like, I love the part where she's kind of like acting like she's like the timid like woman that the wife of Oppenheimer who's just going to like, please just don't, you know. And then she like, uh, she like drops that whole facade and she's just like, she's like more of like a, like a asshole than he is in a way, but in a way that you you like her. Because you want to see her and Oppenheimer win. You don't want to see them win because they're attacking Oppenheimer and they're doing it in such a shitty, unfair way. And then but then you see her like rise up and stand up opposing force against against him. And I just I love that scene so much. Mm-hmm. Just where if anybody says Emily Blunt didn't deserve that Oscar nomination, I go, look at that fucking scene. Yeah. That's her Judd Hirsch scene. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> there you go there you go um yeah i mean there's just there's so much to say and, and like yeah. we've been talking for a while so i want to move on but it's like yeah it's something you can get so much from every viewing and i'm glad you watched it multiple times because they're for most of these episodes we watch every movie once because it's you know right. whatever we're doing that month but the luxury of doing these episodes and the reason these episodes are so long is because we've been kind of sitting with them for this one now for almost a whole year you know yep. it's it's you know we're two months out or three months out from when it came out so it's like one of those things where we're really out <laughs> yeah but like we've been kind of brewing and and also to watch them as spaciously as you did like for, from the first viewing when it came out to them watching it at home to then watching it one more time post oscars it really just kind of puts it in an interesting perspective where now listening to you i'm thinking about things that i want to go back and watch and see for myself now again <laughs> yeah. like and, and that's great too because i thought i had nailed every bit of it but you were right you're like you can't get it all on one watch i don't even think you can get it on three i don't think you can get it on five i think it's one of those movies you keep finding things about with every viewing and i i think it's one of those david lynch things that we keep talking about where i don't think nolan even knows necessarily what he wants to say but he's doing a damn good job of doing it so fucking finally tune that movie though is what nolan did um i one quick question before we move on yeah the meaning of the the apple let me let me let me give you one thing that i thought okay and here's what here's what i thought that i don't know if this is anything what nolan was trying to say but here's what i thought about is the david my david lynch thought of looking at this movie is like the apple where it's like poisoning the apple in the apple if you bite into it it's like the poisonous apple i'm almost sitting there like they're talking about fission and nuclear science like all this stuff it's like look this is opening up to a new whole new world something we've never seen before and it's just everything's changed now and i'm almost thinking about like the whole thematic imagery of the apple being like opening up the garden of eden to the rest of the world and like you ate the apple and now you you see everything that's like how Oppenheimer sees the world in a different way. I don't know. I thought about that. Like maybe yeah. it's kind of like a well, poet. Yeah, because one of our first t- uh, discussions about the movie when it first came out was the apple and like, like why, you know, they, that's the one scene that we, we kept trying to figure out. And, and yeah, I think that's a very interesting perspective on it because it does seem a little out of character that he would just want to like poison this apple and kill this guy. But it's also could kind of come back to his like fascination with science itself and just like, what if like this is 
you know, and kind of them being a parallel for the atomic bomb and the fact that like, yeah, he could create something that could kill someone on any scale. And, and anyone has the capability of doing something like this. It's just a matter of who who's going to follow through with it and whose hands is it going to end up in? And are you going to be able to resist the urge to use it? And I think that's the thing is he, he yeah. is able to get the apple thrown out. He's not able yeah. to get the bomb thrown out. Wormhole. And they take it in. Yeah, wormhole. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There you go. No, that's that's a really good thing. And because I because I, I, then I love I, I just want to say, because I didn't mention this, we're moving on. I'm sorry. But um, I love how it's it's very horror and it's very yeah, yeah. it's very horror because it has to be. And we didn't get the Japanese side of things. It's almost exactly like a movie we'll talk about soon where we don't really see much about like the Jewish perspective from a movie that we, we're going to talk about. Um, but you do feel the horror of it and what people must have went through despite not actually seeing it and seeing it from the different perspective. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I really love that. And I love how it, Oh, we didn't even fucking talk about Truman and that goddamn amazing. Yeah. Scene with Gary Gary Oldman. Oldman. Get and that, that cry was, baby out of here. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, Dylan, I feel like I have blood on my hands. Yeah. Get out of here. Cry baby. <laughs> I love how he waves the handkerchief. That's the thing with Nolan. <laughs> Nolan will never stunt cast in the fact that he will not cast the bigger celebrities in the bigger roles. He will cast the celebrities in the right roles. He yeah. cast Harry Styles in Dunkirk knowing nothing about Harry Styles' music career. <laughs> he just thought he was a good actor. And I think that's the thing is he's using actors in the right roles. Casey Affleck's in a scene. Matt Damon is in a lot of scenes. Yeah. You know, Gary Oldman's in one scene. You know, there are actors who are only in a scene or a few scenes, but they all are in the right roles, I think. Like, I really think all these characters are in the perfect roles for them. Even, like, someone, like, who I loved in Ghost, Tony Goldman, oh. as, like, kind of the, the center moderator of that trial. And, and then you have Megan Blair, like you said. And then David Crumholtz, who gives a lot of the good humor in the film. And then even, like, Florence Pugh. And, like, there's just so many great people in this ensemble that I think it deserved that SAG award just because there's so many, but they're all kind of yeah. perfectly cast. Agree. Get that cry baby out of here. I love it. Oh, so good. Anyway, 13 guy. nominations, seven <laughs> wins, seven wins, which is a lot. Best picture, best director for Christopher Nolan, best actor for Killian Murphy, best supporting actor for RDJ, best original score, cinematography, and film editing. It's nominated for supporting actress for Emily Blunt, adapted screenplay, sound, production design, makeup and hairstyling, and costumes. Um, did you notice who played uh, Albert Einstein, Chad? Do you remember where you might have seen him before? Tom Conti? That wasn't Albert Einstein? No, it, it oh. was not Albert Einstein. No, no. Um, was he, it, it, he was he was the guy who gets the haircut in Paddington too. The judge who then has to like, oh, send hilarious. Paddington to jail. That's him, Tom Conti. So in a past life, maybe yeah. Albert Einstein would have been an actor and got to play that role, but he did not. Um, but speaking of past lives, Chad, that wasn't even part of the segue. That's just something I forgot to say and forgot to mention. But now that I said it, I made sure to segue it uh past lives chat tell us about past lives Sorry. wow okay no. that was an unintentional segue i had a whole some different segue them, planned but that worked out well some of them are so organic and they work past lives directed <laughs> by celine song written by celine song Cin cinematography by shabir kirshner music by christopher bear and daniel rawson starring greta lee tou and john Magaro, other people, but the, it's mainly those three. It's those Synopsis. Three, yeah. Two childhood friends contemplate their relationship over 24 years as they grow apart, wondering what could have been. Could have been. Now, uh, we, we've been talking about this slate in general for a long time, but this is the film. This came out in Sundance in January of 2023. It has been 14 months since the world has seen past lives. Now, we didn't see it till the summer. Uh, Chad saw it a little later. Um, right. Did, did you see it in theaters or did you see it? No, after? later. OK, so everyone uh, or a lot of people saw it in January. I saw it in like June and then Chad saw it like later in the year Oscar season. So this movie has been around for a long time. And I think that honestly hurt its Oscar chances, because as more time went on, bigger films came out and flashier films came out that people kind of forgot about it. But it did pick up some awards or some nominations. The thing with Past Lives is it's such a small film, especially compared to some of these other ones that I feel like I have the least to say about it. But it's I also because I think what it inspires in terms of thought 
is what I am more interested. Like whenever I think about past lives, I think about my own life in the context of these concepts of like, um, you know, fate, what do they call it? Inyun or something like that, where it's like, Inyun, Inyun, Inyun where it's like, I, I'm thinking more about my own life in the perspective of Inyun and Ooh, fate yeah. and, and people kind of, then I am even engaging with the film itself. But the film itself is very good. I like it, but it's one of those things where I feel like every time I think about this film or talk about this film with others, like I get more into my own life. And I think that's what some of the best films do. And that's why I think is a real great strength of this film is it really makes me think about my relationships and my what ifs and my what could have been's but also understanding that I am where I am for a reason. And, and I'm not very religious, but like it's one of those things where I think there's some greater idea of fate or, or reasoning or some some idea of you you are where you're supposed to be that I don't know if you could tie it to a religious thing or not, but I feel like that's what this film really inspired in me was just thinking about all my relationships and like the idea of you graze a shoulder with someone in the middle of a street rushing to catch a train or whatever. And that itself is in you and because you were meant to touch shoulders with that person, like that kind of idea and that concept is what has really stuck with me about this film more so than the actual dynamics. Because I mean, we've seen films like this before where it's like an ex comes back into the picture but it's a little bit more interesting because it's not really an ex. It's more of like a, what could have been, it's a person from her past. And there's also that added in, uh, you know, immigrant barrier where it's like, she is an immigrant. Her husband is white and American. This guy is not, doesn't even speak English. And that leads to some really cool screenplay stuff, which is why I think the screenplay is great. And then also the idea that the husband is actually a good guy and not an antagonist, which is also something you don't see in films like this. So I think this does a lot of great things, but it's hard to talk about it at length because I think it just is one of those films that you really enjoy watching and then it just kind of opens your mind to so many other things. Um, and that's why I kind of find myself distracted watching it sometimes because I'm continuously spiraling and, and thinking about my life. Um, but sometimes the best films do that. So that's my spiel. <laughs> what are your thoughts on past lives, Chad? Yeah, I mean, I, I really like past lives. I, I do think it's a, a really good movie. Um, and it, yeah, it's a weird one. Like it, it feels like an outlier in a way from a lot of these other movies that are doing yeah. like very different things. But then also I think it's great in the slate because it offers a different kind of thing than yeah. what everything else is. And yeah, 100% um, agree. And then you like, but you look at, um, you talked about like it's it's path, like it's still got a best picture nomination, but it like it didn't like ride the way it didn't go the the full Monty, which we'll get to at some point, uh, but it didn't go uh, the the full way where um, didn't get acting nominations, didn't get well, directing. Was, yeah, yeah, I was gonna say it because recently we had movies do this small ish movies that are independent, that come out very early, ride the waves, end up winning Best Picture. Coda, Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. These two movies did that. And Port yep. Past Lives, you could see, is a very similar type of movie in, in those ways, where it's small. Yeah, like a festival hit, yeah. Festival hit, um, different, A24, um, but it didn't have the staying power that the others did. Mm -hmm. Although it still had saying power, because still got a, a best picture nomination, didn't fizzle out like a all of a strangers or you know <sighs> stuff like that that we would have also yeah. loved to have seen Spider Verse, yeah, get that you know that love. Um, but um, I really like Past Lives just because it, it feels like poetry mm -hmm. and it feels like it's just a very art artsy movie, but in a like a good way where like yeah, I not do, pretentiously, yeah, no. it just feels very organic, yeah. Or yeah, it it doesn't ever feel pretentious to me. It just feels like someone's trying to say something or like bring us like maybe something from their own lives and, and stuff. Like I actually don't know Celine Song's like story and like even mm -hmm. what like her nationality is or history, like her family's history, anything like that. But we do get a a, a Korean born person moving to America, becoming like a first generation, like Korean American. And yeah. then her life. So I just looked up. She is also a, can, a Korean Canadian. So she immigrated to Canada when she was young um, and then became a playwright. So I think this is actually fully um, not maybe a hundred percent autobiographical, but like pretty autobiographical. Yeah. yeah. And you get that feel too. It's the immigrant experience. Yeah. You get that feel too, where you can see her being, or yeah, her being the um, Nora, being the uh, Korean 
uh, American, and then she looks at her past, what could have been if she would have stayed in Korea, and she is fascinated by um, the man, the boy that she once loved, and you know has had these kind of you know relationships with. I mean, we kind of get a little bit. I get like a moonlight vibe from yeah, a it. Little bit. Yeah, because you're seeing or, three different chapters. Yeah. Yeah, or or a before trilogy kind of kind of thing, yeah. where it is that type of thing, or a, a boyhood in a way, even though it's just told very mm -hmm. differently. Yeah. Um, but you get that, and she's fascinated by his Koreanness and what that means. And now I'm Korean American, like I'm Korean, but in a different way now. Like I'm. I'm I have this du duality where I'm Korean but I'm also American and you know I have to figure out what that means and he's very Korean and they're both well, great. she's also she's also yeah. Canadian. She immigrates to Canada. She moves to New York okay, for school. True. So she's got three things going on because she's not only Korean, she's Canadian and now she's living that's in America. Right. So it's like three different things. No, but that's totally true cuz right. her husband's yeah. American so she's now also adopting that, you know. And then it's very interesting to Hear what he has to say, and it, it brings in this other perspective that it's not just a movie about like two Korean born people, but it brings in this white guy and he talks about that. And he's like, Look, I'm trying to connect with you, and I'm I'm trying to learn Korean. One of my di favorite foods dishes now is a Korean food, and the the guy, like her old uh friend is uh, impressed with him speaking Korean, mm -hmm. him loving this and being good at playing a Korean game yeah. and trying to meet her halfway and like experience her culture. But then he's like, this guy can connect with you in a way I can never can. It's like a whole other world yeah. that you guys connect with that. I don't live in that space. And then you have this guy coming here and he's like, you guys connect in a way that is totally different than I can ever know. For me, you're a person that leaves. And for him, you're a person that stays. And you're just, people are different. People are di connect different to different people in different ways in different periods of time. And it's just like, mm -hmm. I don't know. This movie's just doing something so yeah. poetic. Yeah, and it makes you think. Yeah. Yeah. And reading that screenplay, I'm getting a lot more out of the screenplay too. And, People have recently asked, I know you've been reading screenplays longer, but for me, you know, people who have asked kind of like, why would you read the screen? You watch the movie. It's like, well, you connect it in a different way. You'd listen to the score to engage with the movie a little bit more. Why not read the screenplay? You get like a little bit more right. of like what's going on in the characters' heads than just the acting performance where, you know, you got a little more context. But, and I engage with this movie a lot reading the screenplay and stuff too. And just like, and just the one thing I want to highlight, because I definitely want to let you talk a little bit more if you have anything more to say about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Um, but um, I really like the performances in the movie. I really like, yeah. especially uh, T.O.U. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. The, the guy, uh, the Korean man. He's my favorite too. Because, oh my God. <laughs> like, what, what did I, I wrote? <laughs> The buildup of the meeting of the two 23-year-old years later makes the meeting heavy when they actually meet up 23 years later, 24 years later. You can really tell these two love each other, especially him, the way he looks at her and the way that they just look at each other in silence and they just kind of stare mm -hmm. at each other sometimes and just sit there. Like on the train, yeah. they're not even talking. They're just like sitting there. Yeah. Um, but when they're video conferencing and like he's just like looking at her and just like, speechless almost like i i i wanted to connect with you i don't even know what to say sometimes yeah. i don't even know why i wanted to connect with you i just kind of i miss you yeah yeah it's this like thing from my past but i think about you Mm -hmm. Yeah, go well, ahead. That's another thing too. No, go you bring up so many good points. And again, like it's one of those things where every time I get into talking about it, it makes me steer into my own life. But it's like that idea of like I loved he he loved the younger version. He didn't yeah. necessarily love she this woman that she is more. now. Right, because she, she's so different and she speaks a different language altogether where she's more comfortable in that language where she forgets some of her Korean by the end of it. So it's like one of those yeah. things where it's like, or she's not forgetting, but she's not as fluent um and i think that's just a really interesting thing is like you might know someone but 
you know, time and distance really, you know, sometimes it makes the heart grow fonder, sometimes it doesn't. And, and that's just natural about life. And I think what I said earlier, like, I think it's so important that we like John Magaro's character, because if we didn't, I think it'd be a lot harder to stomach the ending. But I think because he's so lovable, because there really isn't a flaw with this guy. And he's even going through the effort to learn Korean for her. Like he is the perfect guy. And, and some people are saying like, oh, well, she should have ended up with TOU's character, but it, it's almost like the happy ending versus the right one. And it's like, no, but like, why, why should she leave this guy though? And it's one of those things where I, I, I don't think the movie even wants you to have that battle of who should she be with? Cause I think it's one of those things where it's like, no, we know who she should be with. She's with him. It's just more so like, exploring the what ifs and what could have been so that's so much more interesting um and that's why i think another movie maybe made by like the hollywood studio system would have done something oh, yeah. very similar to like you know her running away with this new guy this this old fling but they're not and i think it's important that they never really truly are a fling which helps it's more of like this we never got that chance it was right person wrong time type deal if they had actually dated or consummated something it'd be different but you know, it, it seems really nice, really sweet, um, very sad. I mean, it is very sad when they have to say goodbye because it is kind of that struggle of like, we could have been something, but we just didn't have the right time. It was just not the right. right circumstances. And now it's too late. But do I want it to be too late? Because I'm happy with where I'm at. And it's and it's stuff I, yeah. I think about all the time too with my own personal relationships. And I, I think that's the magic of this film. Even though I've seen other films about love triangles, even though I've seen other films about immigration that I think do the immigration thing a little bit stronger. Like I think this becomes more about the relationships than it does about her own relationship with her culture. But I, I think if you were to expand this into like a before trilogy thing where a whole film is devoted to her as a young girl, and it like ends with her immigrating. And then her, the second act is her adjusting to her new life as like a college girl in New York and reconnecting with him there and then meeting him. And then the last act is them getting together. The last film is the problem is when you're only doing like a 90 or so minute film, each third feels almost too brief to where I wish I could have sat with it longer to where mm -hmm. I almost, I, I rewatching this was like, wow, we still haven't met John Magaro's character and we're like almost done. Like, and it's one of those things where I just remembered it being a bigger presence than it actually was, which is a testament to his performance and all the performances that I remember them so fondly. But I was watching this, like this is going by way quicker than I would have remember from the theater. And maybe it's just, I think, because it's so short, I would have maybe liked if they had expanded each section longer and maybe let it breathe a little bit longer. But, you know, maybe it is the right amount of time. And, and I just was struggling because I don't know what I would do in that situation for any of them. I don't know how I would manage it if I was John Magaro. I don't know how I'd react. I don't know how I'd behave in front of that. I don't know how I would be if I was reconnecting with someone from my past the way he was. And I don't know how I'd manage being her dealing with both you know like I, it really is one of those things that makes you think about where you would be in this in this triangle and i think for everyone it's different and that's what makes it so interesting i i think the things this film inspires about the themes and the thoughts are much more interesting than the actual actions them, themselves but like i said the best films do that so um there's a good reason it, this got nominated i'm glad it did i'm glad it, it hang on it hung on yeah. all those all those months because i was worried at a point i was like are, are we gonna see this get snubbed you know yeah and I, yeah, and I, I think there, this is a movie that many, many people could connect with because we all have these types of, of what ifs um, where you look at your life and there are some times like Dylan, you're, you're living the, the, you're living the dream for some people where you're like, you know, uh, the struggling actor who's going to make it big. I'm sure you are. You're a very talented guy. Yeah, everyone wants to be a struggling actor. <laughs> No, it's you know, a lot. Of, no, you know I, I what I'm saying. I know. Whereas, I know. like, you see, like the kind of the Joey Tribbiani kind of kind of uh, thing, you know, where you're there, and you know, you're very, you're way smarter than Joey Tribbiani. Let, let's get let's give Dylan a little bit of credit here. But what I'm talking <laughs> about is when I go to New York, for the perspectives. When I go to New York and I visit it, I'm like, this city is so big. It's so cool. Wouldn't it be awesome to live here? That would be so cool. And I just think, no, but I think about like my life and I'm like, I'm probably never going to be the guy that lives in New York City. And then I'm like, but wouldn't it have been cool to have had that life? You're the guy that gets to do that. And you should, maybe there's a lot of pros to it. Like you get to see famous people sometimes. You get more opportunities with like acting and stuff like that. You get to go see movies that come out quicker sometimes because new york is a hot hub for that and things like that maybe there's some shitty things about living in new york that you hate that you're just like you know what 
it's not all it's it's cracked up to be. Some people I've heard say, you know, it's fun to visit New York. It's not that great to live there, but maybe it is. And I don't know. But like that's the kind of thing is like I have a different connection to New York than you do, a different experience, and maybe something that is cool, really cool to me. Where I'm like, I don't see this too often. You're like, yeah, yeah it every day. I don't even care about that. Yeah, yeah. Um, kind of a thing. It's kind of like this. And um, so yeah. So, but I wanted to go through uh, some of the things that you said. Um, he 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 is the perfect guy. Uh, Megara's character, but he's not because in like the screenplay too, it was kind of like where it was like um, jealousy. Um, there's a lot of like things where it's like he was kind of jealous about that, and like the subtext of the thing, and it's like well, it yeah, makes. Sense. But you have to be. I mean, if this is someone from her past who she's like reconnected. I mean, like I would be jealous. Well, no, I'm not. Like, I'm not saying that. You're saying is he's perfect and he's not i'm saying that like he is a very well written character like very fleshed yeah. out where it's like he's experiencing those jealousies but they have they have a really good relationship because they have a a talking about it and he's kind of like you're you're, you're not gonna run away with him are you she's like totally gonna run away with him yeah duh, duh, that's exactly what i'm gonna do and it's like that you, you can feel like yourself having that conversation mm -hmm. with your wife like flirting with uh what are you going to go cheat with that guy now? Like totally so hot. I'm going to go cheat with them kind of a deal. Um, and then there's, uh, I love, I can totally see where you're coming from. And I, that's why I made kind of the connection between the before trilogy where I could totally see it expanded. And that would be very interesting. And I would understand, like, I want, I kind of want to see that movie where it's expanded into three movies or maybe a mini series Mm -hmm. where it's stretched out a little bit more and you can kind of let it breathe or just like, like a that. two hour 15 or something just give us 15 extra minutes with each you know i don't know totally. it just felt too quick you know sometimes totally but then also i had the thought where i was like maybe it is kind of the point that it's brief because that's that's how these relationships end up feeling sometimes where True. in the moment they're so important but then time is fleeting and this movie is kind of fleeting and that's the passage Good of point. time. It's how the characters relate to each other. And at the end, you experience these things in such a small period of time where it's so important to you. And you're like this relationship, like I, I just saw them connect as children. And now I'm like, you guys need to be able to be together because you belong together. And I want to see that. But to them, you're like, no, my life is different now. I don't really connect with him mm -hmm. that much. He's like a yeah. Korean guy. I'm a yeah. Korean Canadian American. He's a Korean. And now I connect more with the American than I do the Korean side of myself. Mm -hmm. kind of deal. And then he comes and the reason he comes and you meet is so you can get that closure because this is a closure that you never got. And you said, I'm always going to meet up with this person. You finally do. And you realize you're going in different ways and there's a new Indian formed or something. And it's yeah. like, you know, well, yeah, the, the best Indian is, is the, the two guys. I think that that scene where like, he's like, it's Indian that we met each other too. It's like, I'm like that, that to me is the most interesting element is them getting to interact and, yeah. and kind of come to terms with it. Cause I think they both know that they are essential to this woman's overall life but they also know where she needs to be and what she needs. And I, I think that moment between the two of them is so good. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I really like that moment. Yeah, I love that scene of them connecting too, and it's like you know you're you're seeing me all emotional and stuff like that, and like it's so caring to each other. Where like another movie might have made had them be assholes to each other, or yeah, mean, and they're both just like, look, we're we both at one point loved this same person. But you and I have a connection too now, and it's different. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that part too. It yeah. is a very good movie, great movie, even I'd say. Very artistic movie that I'd love. And you know, I can ramble on about this movie apparently for a yeah. long time. Yeah. So. Well, there you go. Um, very good. Pa yeah, Past Lives, not only nominated for two Oscars, Best Picture and Best Original Screenplay. It doesn't win either. Um, that's quite a poor a poor thing that it doesn't win a single Oscar. Uh, speaking of, uh, a film that won a lot of Oscars, uh, Poor Things. Chad, we're almost there. Two more. We got this. We got it. We'll get it under five hours. We're on the Let's home stretch. It. All right. <laughs> um, poor Things. 
directed by Yorgos Lanthimos, written by Tony McNamara, cinematography by Robbie Ryan, music by Jerskin Fendrix, starring Emma Stone, Mark Ruffalo, Willem Dafoe, they have my mother, um, Rami Youssef, Christopher Abbott, Jared Carmichael, Catherine Hunter, uh, Vicky Pepperdine, and Margaret Qualley. Synopsis. Bella, ba- Bella Baxter is born of a brain <laughs> transplant and goes on a journey of self-discovery based on Poor Things by Alice Dare Gray, which also, also like American Prometheus, is a very different book than the movie oh, is a movie. It's very different. Yeah, have you read the book or no? I read the book via um, uh, Audible. And so I listened to it. So it's just engaged a different part of me. So I didn't engage with it on a different level. So I'd have to maybe read it again, but I didn't love the book. It was struck. It had a very different structure. Interesting. Yeah. I I really want to read the book because I actually of all the screenplays that were nominated. Actually, this was my favorite of the adapted screenplays. I think that's so interesting that that you love Oppenheimer. I love poor things, but it went to, um, American fiction, but uh, that right. category was just so stacked. But I think it's We're because the, lang- the language and the way she adopts the language throughout is the most interesting part for me because yes. I, I, I just, I love the the syntax they use in, in these films. And Yorgos Lanthimos' films have always been weird. They've always had offbeat weird weirdisms. And this film is very weird. It has its weird elements. I mean, the animals themselves are weird. But I, I, honestly, I, at first when you said there was one you didn't love, I, I thought it might have been this one because of the animal stuff and because of some triggers you have. But I do think, you know, knowing how much you love Emma Stone in this, I figured it wasn't that one. Um, so I don't know where it does rank for you. But um, I do think it is very weird, but there's just something so endearing about the journey she goes on in a way that is so similar to Barbie. And I know a lot of people are like, you shouldn't compare these two because this is more about sex and this is more about just like, finding oneself and stuff but like i'm like this is just also it's also for a different audience and i think if barbie were an r-rated film we would have also seen barbie fuck you know like i think it's just one of those things where no i think i think we would have gotten to that point because it (laughs) but it was a pg-13 movie not necessarily trying to preach those things but i think overall all seriousness uh, is is like i i think the themes are very similar it's about one trying to embrace their own womanhood and trying not to be sheltered in this case, by both parents and men and society and just kind of breaking stigmas and breaking down the barriers, even in a more grand sense, because you're getting into the conversations about sex and sexual freedoms. And, you know, I think the scene where she goes to work as a prostitute is such an important one because it shows that, you know, regardless of what whether you would choose to, she's making the choice. She's not having that dictated for her. And Mark Ruffalo, he's going to freeze to death outside. Fine. But she's going to do something about it. And not necessarily that everyone should or wants to or will do that. There may be other means, but she does. And I think that's important is just giving her agency. And I think that's the same thing yeah. with Barbie to where it's hard not to talk about these themes and, and talk about it so side by side where it's like she's in a box. In this sense, the box is Willem Dafoe's house. And then and, and even more so are the boxes, the body that she's in because she's kind of this body within a body and she's kind of trapped in a way and, and it's about her trying to break free and break break through and and see the world uh, the real world as it should be and then also running through the pitfalls of different men in society and this one i think in a similar way to barbie shows the dark side of men but also shows some of the warmer sides through rami yusuf which i think is very important and he's Defoe. such a sweetheart and willem defoe yes i mean yeah. there is the argument that like he did you know literally take a brain of a baby and put it in a woman but yeah. but that's but that's also the fantastical side of it that's where it's like you kind of have to forgive the implications of morality there and and you know just literally you know roll with it but i think willem defoe the only con is that he does shelter her he he kind of like you know doesn't allow her to to see the world which i think is a criticism like about sheltered parents and how you have to kind of just trust your children and let them fly at a point um but but that's the thing. It's like it, it takes every experience. It takes the male parent gaze, the male suitor gaze, and then the male, you know, kind of the more physically violent male of Christopher Abbott, and then the more just kind of like mm-hmm. weird, kind of possessive Mark Ruffalo. Like it kind of talks about <laughs> every aspect of man and patriarchy in an interesting way. To where I think this works so well as a tandem double feature to Barbie. But I'll let you talk because I know you at least like this one. I don't know if you love it, but um, I, I know you love Emma Stone in it. But uh, what are your thoughts on this one? I love it. Okay. Oh, interesting. Okay. I, I I really really love poor things. Which is so surprising, and, just knowing you. But I I 
I guess there's there's there, there's a couple things in it that I know you know me that you think that I might not like, but a lot of the things that that um, I might have issues with generally um, don't really bother me in this. I think a lot of it's done tastefully. I think mm -hmm. the reason why is because. There is a good purpose for like everything that's happening right, in the movie. Right. It, it aids does, the theming, yeah. Yeah, it does get very sexual. It is very weird. It has some like animal stuff in it that's hard to watch a little little bit, but it's also kind of funny to like see like little animals like spliced yeah. together, and that's just like kind of normal in the the world, at least Godric yeah. worlds. Um, yeah, I think this movie is incredible. I love the comparison you made between Poor Things and Barbie. Because I, I saw that very clearly where I was like, well, Barbie is a more conventional movie that's about feminism. It's about right. feminism. Which, you and know, it, if Barbie is a conventional film, that this must be like a really abstract one. But it's true because Barbie is not conventional at all. But in comparison to this, which is so wacky and zany and out there and bold and big, I think that's only a testament to how ambitious poor things is is that it makes barbie yeah. seem conventional in comparison yeah for sure well, yeah that, that yeah that's exactly what i'm saying is i'm saying that like it's like we talked about with barbie is that it's conventional i'm not saying it's fully conventional i'm saying it's conventional in comparison in in comparison but also in how it's telling its story about feminism where it's like it's telling it in a a way of you know making it accessible to all audiences and stuff like that and it's about feminism itself even though it is also telling a feminist story uh, of uh, barbie's arc and all that mm -hmm. but yeah. also in poor things in a less conventional less approachable less accept uh less accept uh, approachable way i guess mm -hmm. i'm saying um digestible way um, it's, it's a feminist story. It's a feminist movie. That's, it's not about feminism necessarily, but it does have all of those themes and you hit on all of that stuff that I, that I love about showing uh, her character go from, you know, by, by, but blood, all that mm -hmm. stuff that she does. It's awesome and hilarious to, being this eloquent Bella Baxter, you know, it's towards the end where she's fascinated by all of this stuff and just talking so eloquently about high art and philosophy and, you know, all of this stuff right. and being able to perform all of the, you know, science and, and stuff that her, fa her father Godric did. It's a very fucking weird movie. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's a, it's, it's a very weird movie. It's a movie that probably would put off a lot of people, um, and it has, yeah. And it has, and it's, it's just so like weird to me that people are turning it off and not getting the full themes of it that are so amazing. And yeah. that arc of Emma Stone, that's so amazing. It's like one of the greatest characters I've ever seen in Bella Baxter. Um, yeah, it's very fully realized. Yeah. They're turn Yes. And they're turning it off. Because they're like, what? You put a baby's brain in the mother? Like, what? This is so, that's problematic. Like, no. Exactly. No, but that's the thing is no. it's making a commentary about how yeah. men control women's lives. And, and that's, yes. I think, an important commentary to make, you know? Yes. But I'm also like saying like, you know, you're, you're like, it's problematic. It's right. like. It's, it's a it's, Frankenstein story. Yeah. You have to kind of take it as, a, as a, what it is, a fantasy. Yeah. In the world. Look, the movie's saying that it's fucking weird because right. when G Godric is telling Max about what he did, Max is like, what? You did what? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. The movie's saying it's weird. The movie's saying it's a problem. Mm -hmm. Um, I wanted to touch on Godric and all of the, the men yeah, aspects. Real, real quick, though, before that, just I, I also think the actual construction of the fantasy world is so integral in telling the audience you should not okay. take this all at face value. Like, this is a very fantastical film, and you have to... Yeah. 
you know, you kind of have to engage with a film based on what it gives you. You know, if, if the film gives you past lives, you're going to take it very authentically and honestly and relate it to real human experience. You get, get poor things where everything is very bold and colorful and, and these eye fish eye lenses and these, I will him default burping these huge bubbles of gas. Like you have to take that for what it's, what it's giving you. It's like that it's telling you that this is a little out there. This is a little different. And maybe if it were realistic in the fact that like, he was doing this to this pregnant woman who died and all this weird stuff. It would be, be weird. Yeah. But it's not because it's it's this is the fantastical world. Just as Frankenstein wouldn't work if you're trying to real, make it realistic either, you know, because it's it's kind of fucked up. But it but that's the premise, you know. Yeah, it's almost kind of like, you know, whoa, okay, that's gnarly. Where is this going? And then you get to see, like, I want I want to know more instead of that's messed up. I don't like it. The movie's saying it's messed up. You don't have to get on board if you don't want to. But honestly, right. if you turn poor things off because you didn't like that, I understand. But maybe try to go forward with that and just accept that for now so you can get more of the enriching stuff that the movie's actually about. Mm -hmm. um, uh, oh, when you mentioned the bubble thing that he with the bubble and then breast and stuff. I, I reading through the screenplay of four things. I thought it was so funny how he throughout the movie. Godric um, explains the, why he's so fucked up and the things that his father did to him and why he's very different in his personality, how he sees things kind of like Oppenheimer in a way where he just sees things differently. Like I look at my finger and I see all the epidermal epi, epidermological features in there. And you see, like, the fucked up things that his father did to him and Max going, like, Jesus Christ, what? <laughs> yeah. And he slowly starts saying more and more things throughout the movie that his father did to him, kind of in a casual manner. Like, and yeah, my father removed the glands that I needed to uh, process a lot of the things. That's why he does the bubble thing. And uh, it turns out you need those things. And it's, it's a joke. It's just like weird, but it's a joke. So yeah. the movie is flirting with horror and drama and comedy and all this stuff all at once and has like this feminist, like, you know, sexual, like, you know, undertones or overtones or whatever to it. And um, yeah, and I, I love because you do get problematic stuff with Godric where he's he's sheltering her. He chloroforms her. He's yeah her in the box but then when she explains it to him and she's like sure you can keep me here but i will hate you I'll i will you, yeah. you hate <laughs> and then he's like hate hate and then he's like okay i understand and then max tries to keep her and 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 say you can't go off with this man because he has he means terrible things for you mm -hmm. um and then, you know, uh, Godric basically explains to Max, like, look, I couldn't keep her here. She has free will. She yeah. has autonomy. She can go and learn these things. Maybe he's not the best person for her to go off with, but she's going to learn. She's our own person. She can learn these things for herself. And even like when he tried, Matt or uh, Wedderburn, Duncan Wedderburn, uh, starts to try and keep her caged in. It's like, you can only leave this apartment when I'm with you. And she's like, no, I'm going to go out and I'm going to learn this stuff on my own and experience these things for myself. The world's crazy. There's violence and stuff, but I'm fine. You know, I'll be fine. Yeah. And she doesn't need someone to shelter her, or show her how to watch the Godfather on a different <laughs> level. Like she can watch the Godfather for herself and figure it out for herself. Um, and she doesn't watch the Godfather movie. I'm talking about Barbie. Right, Barbie. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> but with the four things, uh, yeah, I love the arc. I love the comedy. I love Mark Ruffalo in the movie, even though he's a fucking problematic guy. He says a thing that I would hate if he actually were to do it, which happens in um, the lobster but he hmm. actually talks about it where he goes, I will kick your dog to death. Yeah. <laughs> when she approaches him with the dog, I love his blunt way of speaking. Mm -hmm. 
and just like you know what the fuck are you talking about you kind of right. a deal. he's such a horrible person but it's such a weird departure for mark ruffalo but it's so funny he's so funny in that role and i absolutely love his character i totally get why he got nominated because it's so funny and it's such a fully yeah. realized character Go ahead. yeah it's no I no i agree i mean you you said so much about it that and i'm glad you did because i honestly thought i was gonna have to prop you up on this a little bit more but you seem yeah. to be the, the yeah. no you you seem to be championing it really well which is great um you know we're we're almost 10 films in so i'm getting a little tired so i'm, I'm just listening and enjoying it and, and loving loving what you're saying no it's great i don't have much else to add except for the fact that you know i do have a few full yeah. faults but it's more so in just the fact that it is long and there are moments where yeah. i'm like you could speed it along like all the stuff on the boat it's important but i do think a lot of it could have been shortened um, I definitely think the Mark Ruffalo bit, as good as it is, it gets a little old after a bit because it's kind of, you know, he's he's doing the most one note thing in the fact that it's it's the same note, it's just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Whereas I think the other characters have a little bit more well roundedness to their personalities, but that's just his purpose in the in the movie. But I do think the boat sequence is where I, I start to yeah I, I start to lose a little bit of attention and a little bit of like you know, energy when I'm watching the boat stuff also, cause I don't love Gerard Carmichael's performance in this, but mm. eventually when they get back to land and, and, and when she has that moment where she sees the poor people and she's like, wants to give a, the money to the poor, that's great. Um, and then of course, yeah. when, you know, she goes and, and then starts her sex work into the ending, the final act, which surprised me. I didn't even think once that the whole, her being a different woman, would come back into the story, but it does. And then you see the other yeah. husband. That's just such a fun final act that like adds so, even more stakes to the film. Um, so I, it definitely wins me back. It's just the, the boat sequence just tends to go a little too long for me, but otherwise I think it's a perfect film for what it sets out to do and what it sets out to, you know, say, and the actual grand just presentation of it is so great. It's, it's spellbinding to watch like the production design, the costume design, the makeup, three very well-deserved awards because it's just so mesmerizing to look at. Um, and I'm glad it exists. I, I really think it's one of those films that I think is going to be referenced for years to come as like one of the great feminist pieces of our time, you know? I 100% agree. And um, yeah, and I love how uh, Bella Baxter approaches life um, and how she um, learns and how she um, ends up at the very end with the uh sort of at the very end with the guy from her past that comes back mm -hmm. to haunt her and you get to see why she would uh, we we talked about like suicide and stuff like that it, you know right. it's it's very touchy a uh, subject but she does you see what drove her to do something like that mm -hmm. and um i love how she's this fully realized character at the end that when you think that maybe someone in that situation would say, I'm not going to go with you or that situation say, I'm going to run away or whatever. And she doesn't do that. She confronts it and she's like, I'm going to go with you. Trust me, Max. I know what I'm doing. I'm going to go with you. I want to see what this is. I want to see like, kind of like my, my past life. Right. Um, and, uh, I want to uh, engage with that and figure this out and, and figure out the meaning behind it. And then she ends up like seeing what ho a horrible person that guy is. And then she, she defeats him not by running away, but by like pushing in. Yeah. Like the Chinese trap. You got to push mm -hmm. in to get to escape. To get out. Yeah. That's a good point. And yeah. I don't know. I just, I love that movie. Let's yeah, go on to the next fair. one. <laughs> All right, yeah. Four things nominated for 11 Oscars. Wins four. It's the second most of the day. Uh, with actress for Emma Stone, production design, makeup, and then costume design. It's nominated for picture, director, supporting actor for Mark Ruffalo, adapted screenplay, original score, cinematography, and film editing. I didn't mention director. Yorgos Um, All right. Uh, so now we're in the zone. We're getting to the last film, which is the zone of interest. Chad, we got a little bit time. I mean, we're on no time crunch, but if we're going to get this, uh, you know, under a crisp five hours let's let's do it let's talk about this film even though there's so much to talk about with this film but i can't wait to talk about it because it's so good but chad tell us about the zone of interest yeah the zone of interest directed by jonathan glazer written by jonathan glazer cinematography by lucas zal music by mike mika levi starring christian friedel sandra huller J johan karthaus and louis Noah Witte. Synopsis. 
Oh, just a, a simple drama about a family living their best lives, trying to build a home, but struggling with issues that life brings, you know, like your job being moved, but wanting to keep your family at their house they love, infidelity, mother-in-law visits, mother-in-law visits, gardening. Oh, except it's also about a German Nazi commandant and his wife building their dream home next to the Auschwitz concentration camp based on the zone of interest by Martin Amos. Sorry, I wanted yeah. to do a bit. <laughs> no, I mean, it's probably the last funny thing that'll ever happen with the zone of interest. And it wasn't even funny. It was just a very clever bit more so than it was funny. Thank but you. I loved your bit, uh, Chad. Um, but this film, Zone of Interest, is one of those mm -hmm. films that when I heard the premise, I said, okay, this is probably going to be great. It's just one of those premises that's really ingenious. And then you watch it and you're watching it and you're just like, not necessarily sure what you should think. You know, I don't yeah. think it's necessarily an entertaining film. I don't think it's a film where you're like, oh, I love that scene or I love this scene or, or wow, this is entertaining. But then it ends. And I feel like it's one of those things that with time, and I mean like months, it has washed over me. And of all the films, Oppenheimer included, this is the film I think about probably every day, most more than any other film. I'm because sorry, actually. Yeah, I mean, it, it sucks to that I think about yeah. it, but, but more so in terms of just like thinking about not just the subject matter, but the craft, you know, like okay. I did, at, at the Q&A at the New York Film Fest, Jonathan Glazer talked about the camera placement and how he didn't want any of the actors to see the cameras. He wanted it to feel like they were, so cool. you know, living in the space because he wanted the uncomfortability to come from the comfortability. He wanted them to feel so comfortable with their atmosphere that they felt at home to where if the audience feels at home, the more it drives home the subject that evil can live amongst everyday life. And, and that yes, the Nazis were not human for what they did. They were evil, but also they were human. And that's something you have to engage with in the fact somehow. that they, they somehow existed and had the same limbs and arteries as we did. And that's the scary part is that <coughs> history can repeat itself and mm -hmm. that Nazis did everything that normal families do. They just had different work, you know, that, that was obviously terrible. And I know some people have been saying, well, it's trying to make us empathize with Nazis, trying to make us, like, you know, relate to Nazis. And I think it is, yes, because it's trying to make it that much more harrowing. Because if you can see, oh, shit, this is something that feels familiar that drives home how scary it is. And I think, you know, obviously it does a good job in not making them, you know, forgiving them. That's the important no. thing. You're not forgiving them, but you, you have to essentially empathize and relate in order to understand how terrible it can be to be part of this, you know, kind of outsider looking in mentality, even in your everyday life, even not joined with the Holocaust, but like, just everyday life about being a bystander and seeing all this terrible stuff going on in the world and just saying, well, as long as it doesn't affect me, you know, or as long as, Oh, that's someone else's problem to deal with, but still living in it and being a constant yep. reminder. It's like people who don't engage to look at the news or people who don't vote because eh, it's not going to affect me either way. You know, I think that's what this film is trying to say. It's not trying to say you should care for these Nazis. You should feel for these Nazis because they're just like you. That's not what it's trying to say. It's saying you should fear for the future of humanity because the Nazis at one point or another, were just like you. And I think that is what is so important and where the, I think the tricky line to cross for this film is. And some people are taking away the wrong messaging. And I think that's a shame on them. But I think the people who are taking away the right messaging shouldn't necessarily feel like, wrong for seeing these similarities because that's the whole point Jonathan Glazer is trying to make is that they do at the end of the day live a very simple life that's why the mother-in-law is such an integral figure because she's the one who is the outsider coming in to be like you you live with this how do you stay up at how do you not stay up at night with all these noises we'll talk about the sound in a sec but I think the technical stuff also has just lingered on my mind so much with the sound and the way they're able to kind of create this atmosphere and this horror and, and the score that Mika Le Levi um, who should have been nominated their, their score is uh, terrific, but um, just all these little elements that are so, 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 so interesting and engaging, but in this such a terrifying way, especially when we talk about, well, it's a Holocaust, it, nothing like that will ever happen again. And then we see this year, you know, genocide happens and it, and it's, mm -hmm. and it's going to keep happening if we don't keep, you know, 
making these stances and, and making this art. And I think this is one of the more interesting ways to approach this subject matter that we've ever seen. Anyway, sorry, I need to go on that rant because I was just, it's a film no, that's been perfect. on my mind for so long and I haven't been able to just talk about it. Cause when I reviewed it originally for New York film fest, I was like, I didn't really enjoy it. I could respect what it's doing, but I don't really, you know, I, I wouldn't watch it again. And I yeah. kind of just dismissed it as that. I was like, it was really well done, but I didn't like it. But I'm like, this isn't a movie that you like or don't like. No, it's a movie that you challenges you and that you have to approach as its own thing. Like you're not going to approach this the same way you're approaching Barbie as, as nuanced as Barbie could be at times. You know, you're going to go to Barbie to be entertained. You want to have a good time. You want to leave saying, I like that movie. I don't think this is the type of movie that you go into it wanting to like leave saying, Oh, I like that. Or I didn't like that. I think it's much more complicated than that. If that makes sense. But I don't know. I want to hear your, your weighing in. Cause I know you're a horror guy and this is absolutely a horror film. So this was one of the scariest movies I've seen in 2023. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I, well, one, I, I want to quickly say one more thing about um, poor things is uh, the, the, cause I, I meant to mention this. Um, it, it, I think I love the Oppenheimer score. And I think that's so affecting. And I, I love watching the, the video of Ludwig talking about how he came up with the score and stuff yeah. like that. So great. But my favorite score is probably the poor things one because of how weird it is. Yeah, very, um, that, it fits the tone of that movie. Yeah. That being said, um, I, now, now I'm fully it segues in, us to this where, where this score also fits the tone of this movie. That's what remind that's what yeah. reminded me of it. Um, but yeah, it's also, yeah, that score. And I remember when I went to see this in the theater, I was messaging Dylan because I was like, is the projector broken? <laughs> and then Dylan was like, why are you texting me? You're in a movie theater. And then I was like, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm just trying to make sure that the film's not broken. No, it's okay. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's important. A salty to... bitch. <laughs> yeah, a little, but I need to uh, engage, engage with the movie fully. You're, 100% correct but once I figured out that the, the thing wasn't broken I was like really getting into like the artistry of the film I was really getting into the music of the film just like um, trying to feel like what Jonathan wanted me to feel um, and um, it got to the point where at the end of the movie that score when it was playing at the very end after seeing what I had just seen it wasn't just the score itself and how creepy the actual music is, but it was the the imagery and the thoughts of what people went through back in the, mm -hmm. that time, not even that fucking long ago, really. Because it's I, images that you have to conjure, too, because you don't see the images. That's the yep. whole thing. Because you know, yeah. even though you don't see them, you know. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's a very important part of the movie. Uh, but the score, when I was sitting in the theater, people start, started to leave instead of sitting through the credits um like some of us mm -hmm. film film uh people do just sit through the credits yeah, uh, yeah. I'll never I, wanted, I wanted to but i was not gonna be the last person at theater i was scared That's to fair. death during those credits i was like nope i'm i'm good I'm <laughs> yeah got a blast <laughs> um yeah. but as creeped out as i am a, a dude who's safe in a theater able to drive home to my family i'll hopefully never experience what people had to go through in those times and you know we we sit in luxury but like you said you know i say luxury but like you know you're doing yeah. well you're not but like you're you're sitting in a time where we've seen the darkest of humanity and like you said it's important to because the Nazis and the Nazi sympathizers and their families and stuff, they all, you know, zig heiled and they all hmm. were like complicit in this thing. And no one like spoke up and just became like a, a normal thing that, you know, they all uh, did this thing to people. And they all dehumanized these people to such a way that you could do, I don't know how the hell you could um, like convince yourself in your mind to do what they did to some of these people right. that I'm just like, if you could like get there, you know, you could easily as a person who is disgusted as you should be. 
by the Holocaust and everything that happened, everything that it represents, you could easily then dehumanize the Nazis and go, they're monsters. I'm like, yeah, they were, but they're also human beings, just like Dylan said. And it's important to engage with it on that level so that you can sometimes see yourself in that and be like, you know, if you're, if you have racist thoughts, if you have, you know, something where you laugh and at a stereotype of, you know, uh, Bradley Cooper and his big nose in Maestro, uh, these stereotypes, um, you know, you can easily, not easily, but you can at to some level start to pile these things up and start to dehumanize somebody into like a caricature. Mm-hmm. And, and then it just becomes something ugly and evil. And it's just, yeah, it, this is a very challenging movie. This is the yeah. least accessible film of all of them. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's most the divisive too. It's the most divisive as well. I mean, like all these films, yeah. honestly, all these films except for probably past lives are divisive to some extent. I mean, I don't see many people not liking Anatomy of a Fall or American Fiction either. But like Barbie's divisive, The Holdovers, Killers of the Flower Moon, Maestro, Oppenheimer, they all have their people who are poor things, really fans of it, but also people who really hate it. You know, like, but mm. this one is the most divided. I would yeah. say, um, just from perspective, perspective and perception, like it does seem like people who are either like. I get it. I'm an, in it. I got it. And other people are like, uh, uh-uh, not for me, not my thing. And totally there's fair. a difference. There's a difference between not my thing because it makes me uncomfortable and I don't want to watch it again because I hated it because it made me so feel so ugly inside versus I don't want to engage with it, which is another thing where it's kind of like what you're talking about. With poor things. Like if you turn this off, cause you're like, eh, I'm not feeling this after like a half hour. No, I think you really have to sit through it. And, and I was one of those people. The first time I watched it was like, could this have been like a short film? Could this have been shorter? Because it does get its point across very early. And it doesn't really do much to change that point of view. It's very much telling you what it's about and what you are supposed to get out of it. But I think because you were able to sit with it for nearly two hours and like really feel the uncomfortability festering inside you, I think that's why it needs to be a feature length film and why it's so important that you see every frame, you hear every sound, because Absolutely. the more you hear, the more it sticks with you and the more you you're haunted by it. And you know, I, I, I know people who've gone to this film multiple times because they love the craft of it, but it's it's tough. It's a tough watch. This is a film I never want to watch again, probably won't watch again unless I do an A24 binge. Um, but, you know, it's it's great. Like, I think it's a masterpiece. And I, I do think it's one of the most impressively technically realized films of the year. The fact that it won sound at the Oscars is such a cool win because the sound is really the main storyteller here because we don't see the violence. Even in Schindler's List, we see Ray finds his character doing some shitty things. Here, we don't see them doing many shitty things in terms of like murder. You know, we see her, Sandra Huller's a bitch, but we don't see them, you know, kill, but we know they are because we hear it. And that's what it is. And it's a complicit, you know, behavior. And, and I'm not, I, I'm calling her one because she is. You know, no, all, the, all the Nazis the way are you, bitches. You said it. She's yeah, a all the, all the All the Nazis are bitches. But especially, I mean, like, especially True. the way she's acting with, you know, her arrogance and, you know. But, yeah. but again, like, if this weren't a Nazi drama and this were about a family just living on, like, a farm and, like, I don't want to leave the house. Maybe there's a way we we do like those characters. And I think that's what's so important is, like, the sound and the atmosphere and the production design and the cinematography. It all kind of adds in making us understand what we're supposed to understand, even if it's not you know, it's not as over. It's it's very subtle, but that's important because I think if you were to see this guy go to work and kill all these people, it would defeat the whole purpose of making it seem both distant and comfortable at the same time. Not comfortable, I shouldn't say that, but like familiar. Like it needs to, you need to understand that they're being humanized so then you can also see how scary it is. And, and I don't Absolutely. know. I, and, and, and I'm not saying that Nazis should be forgiven or, you know, nope. far from that. But this humanization like i think there was a time where people were like you know nazis are animals they they are not like us or anything like this and they are animals but mm-hmm. they are still stemmed from the same human race as you and i and i think that's what's crazy about it and i think that's why this film is important and, and doesn't shy away from the fact that they had their own lives that you can either see and be fearful of or say no that's not like me and, and that's a good thing you know yeah, uh, what we can learn about this movie is otherizing is bad in all forms because you can otherize someone and say, they're not like me, they're Jewish, they have this 
thing about them. They're not even human. That's what Nazis would think. You can say the same thing about how you might think about a Nazi and say they're not even human. In some ways, they're very not human, but they also are, and you can easily become that. They're human. If, they're not humane. If that makes sense, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is like the anti Barbie. This is like <laughs> Barbie is so accessible. Shit, <laughs> the Oppenheimer is super accessible. Yeah, yeah. The zone of interest is not like you, no. you to an average film goer to try and get someone and not trying to talk down to anybody, but saying yeah, like, yeah. If, if you're not used to engaging with a film like the zone of interest, it's very tough um, to try to convince like an average person, like watch the zone of interest. It's a masterpiece. Like Dylan said, it's a masterpiece of its own kind. And then someone trying to watch this and go like, the fuck is going on in this movie like there's is there a story going on i don't even know what's going on this is horrible and yeah it is horrible but it's great um and you talk about like the idea of humanizing people but not defending them because then right. you look at the two aspects the two things one being the mother-in-law coming in and then the second one being uh Shit! What is his name? the The main guy, uh, Ru yeah. Ru Ru Rudolph, Ru whatever Rudolph, whatever his name is, uh, at the end of vomiting. Um, where so I see like the mother in law, and she's disgusted, and she leaves. And you can have a read of she's disgusted with what's going on here, and she's morally against it. No, she's not. She is fine with everything that's happened. She just doesn't want to see it. Because it is gross what they're doing right. to people. And she's like, ugh, I'm leaving. And it's like, okay. Yeah, it's not like, let's stop killing them. It's it's more like, get me away from this so I don't have to hear it, you know? Yep, absolutely. But it's important that you hear it. It's important that you remember. And this is why we, we keep getting World War II movies every year is because it was such a horrific thing. And we got two of them, and they're both – great for different reasons they both you know are important for different reasons um and then the other the other aspect uh that i that i love that i didn't understand the first time i watched it was him throwing up at the end and having that vision and then i'm like are they having this motherfucker end up like having second thoughts and going am i doing the wrong thing here it's not what they're doing. No. What they're doing in the movie, I think, and what I've like read up on too, is that he's having a vision of the future, like today, where they're cleaning the museum of the thing. You have the all of the different things where people are cleaning Jeez. all of the time, yeah. mm -hmm. and you have the thought that you have the theme of like ethnic cleansing, and the theme of like cleaning the cases after all of these poor fucking people were murdered in such horrific ways yeah. and just cleaning and cleansing and cleaning. And then you have him thinking about that museum and thinking about all of the work. I'm the best at my job. I'm doing such a great job and I'm going to end up being such an important person in this Reich of Nazism. And when I look into the future, they're not praising the beautiful work that I did here. Yeah. They're praising. They're not or praising. They're memory, they're remembering. Yeah. Remembering the victims that like, just like couldn't be here because of everything evil that was left to persist and just do things unstopped. Yeah. Yeah. Can't even talk. Yeah. And he throws uh, up because he's disgusted at that. He's, he's yeah he throws up because he wants to be remembered for the things and he sees a future where he's hated i mean he probably never he, he never had that it's a movie doing things in an artistic way right this it's so guy cool. it's such an interesting doing the same device, shit yeah. Yeah. over and over but jonathan glazer hel helps us engage in that way and i think it's a, a brilliant movie in that way and it's sickening yeah. But it's important. Important. Yeah. 
yeah. Uh, the Taste of Things was my personal favorite international feature of the year because it connected to me most. But in terms of just a cinematic achievement, this is hard to beat. In terms of like international yeah. feature winners, like rarely get this good and interesting. And you know, there may be some that are more enjoyable, obviously, like Parasite yeah. and all these other films. But like oh, yeah. this, this one though, I think is maybe the best of the international features to win. Like it's that good. It is so good. And the the other thing I want to say is I love how they have it from the Nazi perspective because you look at all the movies throughout the years. We've covered a lot on Picture This of World War II movies mm -hmm. and movies about the Holocaust and right. stuff that happens. And then you go, we've seen all the World War II movies. There's right. nothing you can do that's nuanced. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you, Jonathan Glazer. Yeah, well, it's, and and most films different. don't want to humanize these Nazi characters or make right. them really memorable presences because they don't want people to feel like they can relate to them, and they they don't want people to like idolize them. But that's not what this film's doing. Instead, it's doing the opposite. It's making you relate with them so much to where you're so off put. And then you want to make a difference. You want to say, oh, shit, I, I don't like how I felt after that. I don't like the fact that I have been through that situation or that situation or, you know, the, the one where they're, sw they're swimming and it's like the, the ashes of the, the bodies like that. that, that it just all, all this stuff that's just like so yeah. tinted but still familiar that it's like I think for Holocaust films, you either can't humanize them at all to where it's like very clearly you're not supposed to like them. You're not supposed to get them at all. Or it's this where you have to understand them to understand why it can't happen again. And Absolutely. why so many Jewish people have still advocated for films to continue telling these stories because it's a shame they haven't been fully, you know, it, it hasn't fully ended. It's just an ongoing yeah. cycle. And that's also part of the ending too, is the cycle of like, it's a museum, but what was it once? Um, and who's to say it's not ever going to be this again? You know, it's, it's awful, yeah. you know, but Absolutely. great film. Know your, know your enemy type <sighs> of thing. And one last thing I want to add before we end it, um, I I I I don't I can't say I love anything mm -hmm. because it's such a terrible movie, but important. Mm -hmm. um, it, but great. Um, You're very intrigued by. Maybe. Yes, um, I I'm intrigued by a lot of the perspective of the film, where it just has Auschwitz over there, and then the, you're just like over here in this zone, right? Zone of interest. And then over there's Auschwitz, um, and you're you're separated from all of the Jews over there. Um, but what I love is it's not completely devoid of hope because you have the section of the movie with the young girl planting mm -hmm. the fruit for yeah. prisoners to come out and and have and have a little bit of joy and you know something from the outside helping them say you know hope is not lost. And then she gets that little uh, song message mm -hmm. and she plays it on the piano and it's like the, we have not lost hope in here and we are still people and we're still, and you know, and all that stuff. And I just thought that was such a great thing to add to the movie. Yeah. yeah for yeah, hope. One last note, since we're ending on a hopeful note, uh, that was a real prop from or the Holocaust that John the Glazer used, the actual piece of music or whatever. Holy yeah. shit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Uh, apparently. So that's what I read and heard. So, um, yeah. Uh, just an incredible motion picture. It's it's nominated for only five, but it wins two. It wins Best International Feature and Best Sound, but it's nominated for Picture, Director for Jonathan Glazer and Adapted Screenplay. Also, Jonathan Glazer just hasn't made a ton of films, but every time he makes a film, it's it's really amazing. So I, I, I really suggest his other works, like Sexy Beast and what's the other one? Under the Skin, I think, is him. Um but that oh, one definitely definitely yeah. gets under the skin, right? I I, I want to. Oh yeah. That. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, Jonathan Glazer. Uh, yep, Under the Skin and Sexy Beast are his two other big ones. So uh, yeah. if you haven't seen Sexy Beast, is one of the greatest like British crime movies I've ever seen. Oh. Ben Kingsley gives one of my favorite performances in that, and then Under the Skin I haven't seen, but I've heard it's great. All right. We're almost at five hours because um, we did a few stops here and there that we added edit out. So we're we're gonna hit about five hours. But hey, this was, I mean, averaging about a half hour film. I mean, these films just require a ton of discussion. I mean, and it was such a pleasure talking to you, Chad, about all of it because there are. Dude. I think we've we've gathered ten great films to varying degrees. Um, you know, you and I might differ on some of them. You know, but not. You know, there's no film that we were all that either of us were like that's a piece of shit, you know? And I think that's why right. the conversations were so long. So it's time. <laughs> and it's, this is difficult. <laughs> um, I've agonized over this one for sure. Um, all right, Chad, 
it's going to rip the Band-Aid off. What is your number 10 film? Well, before I preface this, I the my last ranking that I did that I'm going to unveil here is the one that I went, this feels right. Mm-hmm. But that's me now. This could change at any time. There's some that are like cemented, but then I'm just like, I don't know how to rank these because they're all so great for different reasons. Mm-hmm. Except for my number 10, which I don't know if it'll change. Maybe one day. I don't know. Maybe if I learn more about Leonard, Leonard Bernstein, but I have Maestro at number 10. All right. At number 10, I actually have, and again, I like all these films. It's just the one right now here and there that I think is lesser than the rest, but I still love is American fiction. It's going to be my number 10. All right. Okay. So what is your number nine? Number nine. And remember, I really like you were yeah. just saying, yeah. remember, it's my nine, but I really love it. I really do actually really like this movie a lot. Killers of the Flower Moon, I put at nine. Okay. Uh, at number uh, nine, for me, I put Past Lives. Past Lives. Number eight, I put Past Lives. Okay. At number eight, I put Barbie. Okay. Number seven, I put The Zone of Interest. Okay. Uh, at number seven, I put Anatomy of a Fall. Okay. At number six, I put American Fiction. Okay. Sorry, I'm writing this on my phone, which is different than normal. At six, I put, this is where I put Killers of the Flower Moon. All right, so we got our top fives ready to go. Chad, what is your number five? Number five, I put Anatomy of a Fall. All right. My number five, this is where I put Maestro, number five. Wow. All right. What is your number four? Number four, Oppenheimer. Okay. My number four is Poor Things. All right. What is your number three? My number three is Barbie. Number three is Barbie. Wow. It's high. Uh, number three for me is The Holdovers. What is your number two? Number two, Poor Things. Poor Things. And my number two is the zone of interest. Wow. Which means, which means oh, are you surprised at my number one? <laughs> um, no, 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 no. Like, the, like the, the zone, I didn't really know where to put. And then I'm like, mm-hmm. that's cool that you put it at number two. Like, yeah. whoa, okay. Cool. Uh, which means your number one, Chad, is? The holdovers. Cool. And my number one is Oppenheimer, which means by this math, it looks like at my number three and your number one, the holdovers will be our rep for best picture of 2024 or 2023. There we go. All right. Yeah, <laughs> we got to get into our acting prizes. We still have more to go. Uh, Chad, you're up for actress first, correct? So I'll start with actor. Um, and it should be no surprise. I didn't talk about it much when we talked about the film because I think it's the best performance of the year of any gender, of any role, Lee's supporting. It is Killian Murphy for Oppenheimer for me, just because I think everything he does is so kind of, we talked about with the hubris, but also like the fact that he does let his emotions out very slowly and surely at times, but he has this kind of facade and like the moments you were talking about with like the womanizer comments where he's like, well, he didn't, he never knew like all those things. Like it's, it's these little kind of little tinges of his character that are so intriguing to see, even though he kind of keeps it behind a mask, but when he does unleash it, and especially when he has that scene, which is my favorite scene of the year, which is where he's giving that speech and everything kind of, kind of goes blurry around him and he has that face. I mean, it's, it's a face that sticks with you. And, and I think that final moment also sticks with me. Um, so I'm, I'm really such a huge fan of, of his performance in that for sure. So that's my pick for best actor as no, no one should be surprised, but yeah. Billy Murphy. It, it is a very, very good performance. I love him in that movie. Um, I'm, I'm going to go with my actor now, right? Yeah. Uh, my actor. I, 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 <laughs> I'm so sad that I have to pick here um, because, because I have I have a couple. Um, really? I am not going to go with the one that you think I'm going to go with. Okay. I'm going to go with another one that's very similar. After a rewatch, I was like, you know what? I'm going to go with this one. I'm going to go with Dominic Sessa. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I didn't think you were. I knew you were going with that film. I, I did not think you were going to go with him. I thought you were going with the other, but. Great pick. I, thought, I love that. I thought I was too. I, I really wanted to go Giamatti. And then I was sitting there. I was like, yeah, yeah we got to talk about sideways at some point. So maybe, you know, we'll honor him there. 
I don't know, maybe not, but um, I wanted to give it to him here. But honestly, I was like, you know what? I really love Dominic Sessa in that movie. I yeah. think he rules. I think he like hits on the comedy. He hits on the, um, he hits on the drama. Like you really feel for him. He's a struggling kid, but he's so funny and so quick witted, and he really takes that screenplay and a lot of the stuff that's written and really delivers everything so well. Like all the jokes are so funny from him. He he has that little asshole vibe to him, like. You know how Mary Lamb says, you know, he's a little asshole, but don't let, you know, don't, <laughs> don't ruin, ruin the party for him kind of, kind of a yeah. deal and, um, uh, and stuff. But he also has that other vibe to him where he, you see why he's an asshole. He's struggling and he's really trying to thing. I love how, how Paul Giamatti then towards the end of the movie is like this kid, he's brilliant. I don't know if he's a genius, but he's brilliant. He's he's got a lot going for him, um, and he really sells that. And it's so impressive that it's his first performance ever in a movie, and you're just like, holy shit! Why didn't he get an Oscar nomination? <laughs> so it's I wanted to go G- Giamatti, but we can only pick one. I know it's tough, uh, and I also want to bring up Robert De Niro, who I really do think gives the performance of his past three or four decades with with killers of the farm i think he's great yeah. and then um i know you had mentioned in the private chat uh you wanted to highlight someone from barbie as well or is that oh person? thank you so yeah. much yes yeah, of course um in barbie uh i love margot robbie and i love uh, ryan gosling uh, just acting in general from all these movies is so great really you read a lee and just all these people mm-hmm. just so good that you're just like how do you even narrow it down but in Barbie, my favorite performance is from uh, Kingsley Benadir. Okay. He's, my, he's probably my favorite Ken. Bob Marley, just, yeah. Just looking at it. Yeah, he's Bob Marley too. And he's... Uh, 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 Bravik in Secret Invasion. Malcolm and Malcolm X. X. Yeah, Malcolm yeah X. He's, he's been around. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he's so... Because he's a very serious actor a lot of the times. But he's so funny in Barbie where he's just like... Um, he has like the whole thing where he has the binoculars looking over there. He's like, you know, he like looks at the Barbie yeah. and it's just like very intentional. It's just like, he's the one that explains the Godfather, but then it's at the end, he has that thing that like kind of like Shakespearean way of talking where it's like, we didn't know who we were. And I'm just, <laughs> he's just so funny in the movie. All right. Sorry. I, no, I just really wanted to talk about yeah. him and I, Got okay. yeah, yeah, I wanted to give you that that platform. Thank uh you. okay, so who is gonna be your best actress? And I'm not actually hundred percent sure where you're gonna go here. I have an idea, but I'm curious because I think the one you don't pick is the one I will. So don't worry. Okay. Well, <laughs> the one that I was always gonna pick, it's what you said Killian Murphy's the best performance of the year. I think he's very good and he's up there for sure. But I think this is the best performance of the year from my perspective, and it's who I'm picking, Emma Stone. Oh, okay. Not not who I thought you were going to go with. Okay, cool. So freaking wanted to win. Yeah, I want. I was thinking about picking one from the movie that I love so much, The Holdovers. But I'm picking Emma Stone from Poor Things uh, because, um, and that's not a slight on you, Killian Murphy or anything like that. You know, I just wanted to say I think this one's the best performance of the year because I love Poor Things so much. I love that arc. And I, I, like I, I was saying when we were talking about poor things, I think Bella Baxter is just one of the greatest characters put on, on mm-hmm. film or whatever. And I just love that arc, her going from the ba ba, you know, and just the learning kind of like a baby toddler, like you have a baby brain in your head, um, going to this fully realized, like, you know, feminist, like, you know, full, uh, uh agency and just smart and phil- philosophical and all this stuff i don't know she just goes through all the motions she does it so well as sad as i was uh as i was to not see lily gladstone get her moment i was so happy for emma stone because right. i think this was her best performance she's ever given in my opinion and i think it was the best of the year or just up there there's so many great performances yeah. but i love her uh- 
I'm going to take the one I thought you were going to take. I'm taking Davine Joy Randolph. I, I think that performance is the heart and soul of that movie, even though Dominic Sessa is my favorite performance in that movie. So we kind of covered all the bases. Um, but this is my favorite actress, actor, and supporting actress of the year. And then my favorite supporting okay. actor, Charles Charles Melton, is not uh, eligible. So, uh, yeah. you know, three of these four are my favorites of the year. So I'm very happy. And Dominic Sessa, you know, is incredible. So I'm, I'm very happy with these four. I mean, we've said all we need to say about these, but Davine is just so lovely and and everything she she does is is just rips your heart out it's great and i know that's matt's favorite performance of the year so shout out to you matt um so all right fair. one last time let's i want to pick her yeah but yeah i'm glad you did. No, you're good no you see i i and if you had picked her i would have picked emma stone so there we go good. um <laughs> and uh yeah so there we go let's recap one last time Chad's Best Actor, Dominic Sessa. My Best Actor, Killian Murphy. Chad's Best Actress, Emma Stone. My Best Actress, Davine Joy Randolph. And our best film of 2023 is The Holdovers. So here we go. We have now officially put 2023 to bed where it can rest for some time. I think we need a little break of these movies because we've been talking about these now for about five hours. But um, in general, for for way longer. I mean, we've been talking about these movies as, as long as January from last year when Past Lives was a thing that we were like, oh, we should check this out uh, and just talk about early reactions to then seeing these movies and all that. So thank you, 2023. You were a kind one. This is our longest episode, but it's, I think, because these films warrant a lot of discussion. Now, for our next month. Our next month is, um, you're not going to see, okay, so our April episode will be seen on the first weekend of May, just based on how that works. We are going to be watching the films in April and recording in April, but you will see it as part of our live subathon in May, which is the weekend of May 3rd. I believe it's on May 4th and 5th or whatever. Um, I don't know what time period of the time of the day it'll be, but um, we're going to continue our year of classics, this time with more of a modern classic year. Um, this is the farthest we'll go for classics. Like We won't go later than this, but this is a classic year. There are a lot of films that could be considered modern classics amongst the slate, and we're going to be joined by our guest, who is Chad's amazing wife, Carrie, who was going to join us to talk about the films of 1982 on the subathon um, for reasons, which they'll share once we get to the show. Um, but the films up for a best picture that year are E.T. the Extraterrestrial, Gandhi, Missing, Tootsie, and The Verdict. So there you go. I got another courtroom drama in there. We got another comedy. We got a Spielberg. We got a, a war epic and uh, Missing, which I don't know much about. So <laughs> that's the fifth one. But that's it. 1982 next month. Chad, how you feeling? This was our longest episode ever. Might not ever get longer than this because even next year, I feel like the films will be a little shorter and maybe not warrant mm -hmm. as much discussion but who knows maybe it will be nice. i know we're both pretty tired but how are you, how are you feeling that's what i was gonna say i'm feeling tired but i'm <laughs> yeah. feeling accomplished like mm -hmm. i was so looking forward to this episode because like you were saying like we've been engaged with these movies for so long every time we do a big oscars uh like this like last year you know picture this i get so excited i'm like i'll talk about all these movies i've been talking about for a year and now we get to talk about them, and we kind of hold a, hold a lot of our thoughts over. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. When, we're, when we're, you know, we know we're going to do a picture of this, and we don't really let it out with each other, even though like we knew like our our number ones right. basically, and yeah. some of our thoughts. But like there was still some surprises, especially for yeah. you and me, uh, and like with my <laughs> thoughts, and yeah. to be able to finally like get it all out there. Is so cathartic and amazing, and I feel like we've engaged with these movies so well together. I was so excited. I think we had some great discussions, and yeah. I'm very excited about 1982. Very excited to have Carrie on again because she was so great in the 1999 episode. Check yeah. that out. Um, and also, I'm very interested to watch Gandhi because now you've seen it. I think you like it. Unfortunately. Oh, Very. no, I don't. <laughs> well, I didn't, but now I, I'm, I'm going to give it a fresh lens. I haven't seen it since high school. so Interesting. I'm very interested to watch that one because it beat E.T. Yeah. And I was just like, okay, let's – okay, Gandhi, what you got? You know, kind of a deal. So I, I'm interested <laughs> to check that out and the rest of the films. <sighs> to see basic again so, yeah. um, is in one. So oh, – uh, I'm I'm very excited for 1982. Bring it on. Yeah, there we go. Start now though. Gandhi's 191 minutes, so get that get that going because you'll want breaks. Um, no, this is the first time I've ever gone in um, to a slate knowing we were going to go five hours, but not caring because I was like, you know what? 
the last time we did this, we hit like three hours and 20 with everything everywhere. And then the year before we hit three. So I knew it would get longer. I thought we would get maybe four hours, but five hours, especially considering Oppenheimer, poor things, killers of the flower moon and anatomy of a fall are all more than two and a half hours long. I knew we'd get there, but that's okay. Uh, because it was a great discussion. I'm just so tired. I'm not able to show my appreciation, but I am very appreciative of you, Chad, as always. And you can follow yeah. us down there. We're not going to go through all the spiel, um, but thank you so much. And we'll see you next month. Uh, really in May, but we're almost in April as is uh, for the subathon. Make sure to stay tuned for that um, as we bring you 1982 with Chad and Carrie and maybe another guest who might pop in. Who knows? Um, it's themed around him. We'll, we'll get there when we get there. But thank you all so much. This is 2023. This is Chad. This is Dylan signing out. Yeah.